Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, Cabbage Head Fanfix. Back with amazing fanfiction. This is the second part of, What if Deku had solo leveling quirk? This is the fanfic, Shadow Monarch Hero, Deku. By the author, Shadow Sovereign. You can find the link in pinned comment. Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Izu, you can't give me crap about waking up late for school if you do the same a hypocrite. Sakura rubbed her eyes blurrily as she knocked once on his door before entering, her face turning bright red. I I I Z U K U. A head of long, messy, straight black hair pulled itself up from the pillow. Wow what's going on? MMM Miss Yeyarazu. What are you doing in bed with my brother? Bed. Yeyarazu slurred as she turned to her other side. Izuku tangled in the covers and working his way out. Ay, ay, ay. No 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 wait. It's not what you think. She looked down at her body, relieved to see that she was still fully clothed. W we were just cc cuddling. She muttered, too embarrassed to say it loud and proud. Pulling off the covers, she went to step out of bed, realizing with a shock that she was only wearing panties. Her school uniform bottom must have slipped off in the night. She always was a wild sleeper after all. Of course, this did nothing to help the misunderstanding and Sakura's face became a deeper shade of red right alongside Yagarazu's. She had always been bugging her brother to get a girlfriend, or at least someone to confide in, like a best friend, and everyone knew that Bakugo didn't count, but she hadn't expected things to progress this fast. I'll just leave you two alone, Sakura blurted out, slamming the door shut behind her. Ugh, sorry, Izuku said, finally coming to and recognizing the situation, I'll make sure she doesn't get the wrong idea. As so, we didn't actually, you know, right, what, and 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 no, I'd never, I mean, not without, um, we should get going. Don't want to be late. Yeyarazu wanted to shove her cherry red face into a dark hole and never bring it out. But she also couldn't deny the comfort she had felt resting in Izuku's arms the previous night. I want to do that again. She admitted to herself as Izuku hopped out of bed, doing his best not to look at Yeyarazu's bottom half. Izuku smiled as he walked out of his bedroom, moving to track down his sister. Maybe Sekiro was right all along. I needed someone to comfort me. I don't want to be selfish but I want last night to happen again. By the time Izuku and Yeyarazu reached school, a good amount of the awkwardness between them had faded. It probably helped that Sakura was surprisingly understanding and apologized for the rude awakening after the situation was explained. But this didn't mean that their morning was going to be calm from there on out. Izuku's eyebrows shot up as he realized there were at least two dozen students he had never met before crowding around 1A's door. What the? I think those are classes 1B and 1 degrees Celsius. What are they doing here? A voice appeared just to the right of Izuku. They're scouting the competition of course. Todoroki answered. Our class was the one to handle a villain attack after all. Or at least what the news stations are calling a gate break. Yeyarazu nodded. I kinda forgot in all the chaos. But I'm curious as to why the monitoring division is keeping it so hush-hush. It's because of that Kirajiri villain. He could create gates out of nothing. Imagine if that knowledge got out to the public. No warning. No week-long grace period before it opened. Just a gate that could pour villains into your living room. Hey you. A steely voice sounded, causing Izuku's focus to track back to the crowd. You're the one that beat the zero pointer aren't you? As much as he didn't want to, Izuku couldn't help but make comparisons between this guy and Kirishima. His hair was a silvery white and his face held no real similarities to Kirishima's. But the way he carried himself and the mana coming off of him seemed way too familiar. That's right. We're here with a declaration of war. Hey, my classmate Monoma is relaying the same info to the rest of your class so I needed to do the same over here. Izuku held his hands up in a peaceful gesture. Okay, could you be a bit quieter though? The other classes are starting to get annoyed. Looking around, this new kid was indeed seeing quite a few glares from the senior students as they attempted to chat with their friends in the hall. Oh, well I'm still here to declare war. He was only quieter for one word. Izuku bemoaned. Just because you survived a villain attack doesn't mean you're special 1A. Mark my words, 1B is gonna be at the top of this sports festival. Hey, where are you going? This is a worthless conversation, Todoroki said, his monotone way of speaking having a greater effect than most would have anticipated. Well, I'm Tetsu 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 Tetsu, he shouted, turning back to where Izuku and Yeyarazu had been standing, surprised to see that they were gone as well, even after the bell had rung. It took Aizawa's deep red gaze and the threat of expulsion to clear the crowd. The festival is only a few days away, so I'm going to be going over most of the rules right now. Aizawa tapped on his mobile device, bringing up a display on the board behind him. First, no armor and no weapons are allowed unless given for the event. Skills and quirks that can summon weapons, like Yeirazu's creation quirk, or Midoriya's ability to summon that armor are allowed. Izuku sighed quietly. It's not like I can do that anymore though. 
Maybe I should try going back into the Heavenly Palace to get some items. He narrowed his eyes. No, Bakugo and Todoroki won't be using anything either. I'll just have to make do with my current stats and my army. There are three events that will take place, each decided at random by a spinning wheel. These games will slowly weed out the contestants. So do your best to not lose in the first or second event, otherwise, the scouts might not deem you important enough. Most contestants that make it to the third event get at least one scout watching them. Your costumes won't be allowed since why? Aizawa seemed to trail off as Izuku got lost in his own world once more. He felt like he was daydreaming more and more often, but despite that, he never missed any information from the teachers, maybe the system is compensating. But what was really on Izuku's mind was far more mysterious. Yayorazu's mention of Kirajiri had reinvigorated Izuku's curiosity. What did 13 know? Yep, 682, this is the apartment, Tsukachi told himself, tucking away the piece of paper into his suit pocket. He was here as the head of the monitoring division, but despite his official power, he was here illegally. He had not gotten permission to investigate 13's home, as his higher-ups in the association decided that it was not necessary and told him to forget about the incident. But something in the back of his mind refused to let him forget. Maybe it was Izuku's concern over what 13 knew. Maybe it was All Might's severe reaction to the two villains. Or maybe, maybe I just need to know for myself. Taking a quick look around him, Tsukachi wrapped his hand around the doorknob and twisted, using his rank strength to easily break in. Moving inside, he noted that the place was nothing special. One floor, one bedroom, one bathroom, one kitchen. Even today, teachers and rescue-type heroes get paid too little. A picture of 13, without her suit on caught his eyes and he looked over, surprised to see her crouching down to take a picture with a student. She almost never took that thing off in the presence of others. That student must have been pretty special. She had bob-cut black hair, deep dark eyes, and a blinding smile. All things considered, she was quite beautiful and Tsukachi felt a pang of remorse that more people didn't get to see her like that. Sorry for invading your home 13, but I just have to know. It took only 15 minutes. 15 minutes to realize that there was nothing special in any of her small rooms. There weren't any hidden boxes in her closet. No hidden voice recordings under her bed, nothing besides clothes in her drawers. He tore through the bedroom three times before finally giving up and stumbling back out to the kitchen. He sighed and grabbed a cup from the cupboard, filling it with water from the fridge's dispenser. I guess it kinda makes sense. If it was a secret dangerous enough to get killed over, you wouldn't keep any trace of it in your home of all places. Maybe I should just as thought was cut off as a rattling sound came from the fridge he was leaning against. Those vibrations came from the top half. She doesn't. Have someone stuffed in her freezer does she? He thought it an impossibility. But despite that, Tsukachi readied himself, charging mana up through his body before tearing off the freezer door completely with his strength. What he saw was, absolutely nothing. It was a completely normal freezer, frozen food, ice cream, nothing out of the ordinary. But what I felt was not ordinary. It wasn't just the fridge making noise. His eyes settled down on the ice cream, remembering a time when his sister would store her emergency stash of cash in an empty and washed out ice cream container. He picked it up, feeling something much heavier than ice cream rattling around inside. Tsukachi tore off the top and pulled out the object, a golden orb about the size of a baseball. It was carved intricately with patterns of ants. Around the equator of the orb was a smooth bit, with words filling the gaps. He traced his finger over them, reading aloud. The weakest fragment of brilliant light, Polra. Tsukachi. What? Who was that? Calm down Tsukachi. Polra will never accept someone in your state. TH13. Are you? Alive? In a sense. But no, I am dead. Her voice was ethereally and hard to make out. This is just a small part of my soul, trapped here to make sure Polra received her host. Polra. Host. What the hell are you talking about? Tsukachi tried to drop the orb, but it was like his hand was frozen in place. Am I going crazy? You are just as sane as you were when you woke up this morning. Polra and I are assessing your memories. If you are acceptable, if I'm acceptable then what? Then you will be one of the grateful humans to inherit a fragment of his brilliant light. This new voice made Tsukacha's knees buckle and he fell to the floor. What? Are you? The voice ignored him. You are strong, yet weak in a world of gods. You know your place in the food chain. Yet you still attempt to interfere and keep the peace. You follow orders, but are also willing to refuse them when they break your morals. Your quirk is weak yet effective outside of battle. Your mana is calm and compressed. You are, acceptable. I don't understand. Sorry Tsukachi. Thirteen interrupted, but you will soon. Before he could say anything else, a white light began escaping from the carvings in the sphere, eclipsing his vision, and filling his mind with a presence unlike anything he had ever felt before. Now, we become one. 
It was the first day of the sports festival and all of the UA classes were proceeding to the waiting rooms dressed in their PE uniforms. Sneaking through the crowd, Yeyurazu snatched Midoriya's hand, allowing the rest of the classes to move past them and leaving the two alone in the hallway. What's wrong? Izuku looked at her downcast eyes concerned. We've gotten closer these past few weeks but, for now, we need to forget about that. I'm not sure I understand. If we want to win this, or at the very least make sure we're noticed, then we need to make sure that we don't hold anything back against each other. I don't think we should try to help one another, or even teaming up if the events allow it. Izuku nodded slowly. I understand not helping each other in solo events, but why not team up? Well, it's just that I feel like I've depended on you too many times already. I just want to see what I can do with a different team. Izuku smiled and gave her hand a squeeze. Okay. Are really? Izuku tilted his head, of course. It's good practice in a safe environment after all. Gates certainly don't let you test out team compositions. He tried not to chuckle when he saw her gratefulness. I feel like I'm better when you're with me, he said, allowing himself to be vague in order to avoid an overly cheesy line. But that doesn't mean I get to be selfish and keep you by my side 24-7. Part of Yeyarazu screamed at her to say, no, I want you to do that. I want you to be that selfish. But of course, she stuck with a simple nod of her head and said, then let's do our best to win. Though Izuku was wearing his perfectly tailored PE uniform, he felt naked without his gauntlets as he walked out into the center of the UA Sports Festival arena. The grassy fields may have looked like a place to partake in friendly sports, but everyone there knew it was nothing less than a battlefield. What do you think the first event's gonna be? Hantasiro whispered over to Shoji as they walked across the field. Hundreds, if not thousands of eyes trained down on them. From what Mr. Aizawa told us, the first events are always designed to eliminate bigger chunks of the student base. Two years ago it was a race with a certain number of available positions. Everyone who placed after number 100 was eliminated. You all know Class 1 from their daring escapades with villains at the USJ, but don't let their shining airtime blind you to their competitors. Classes B, C, and D all have some excellent talent this year. For all of you fans waiting for E, F, and G in the general studies, well make sure you stick around till tomorrow, as those super studious students compete then. Izuku's eyes traced over classes C and D he already knew that B had some decent amounts of competition, but he sensed barely anything comparable from the other classes. Are they here just to increase the number of participants? Shoji said that two years ago was a race with a hundred spots, which means that over a hundred people participated. Were the classes more numerous then, or did the other classes just have more power than this year? From the outside he seemed calm and anyone who would have read his thoughts would only detect these observations. But in reality, it was just to distract him from the insane amount of people watching him. Upon reaching the wooden stage by one of the walls of the field, the 80 or so students lined up in nice neat rows, forming a nice symmetrical pattern. Of course, the boys in the arrangement felt like breaking formation when they saw the referee for the coming event. The R-rated hero, Midnight. Her erotic costume was enough to enthrall the entire stadium, giving her their perfect attention as she called out, now that everyone is here, representing the students as Bakugo, from 1A. Izuku almost instantly felt a chill run down his spine, knowing how things were about to go down. Back you go. Him, of all people, can't we have Yeyarazu or Ida do it? Hell, I'd even take mine to saying it over him. At least then we'd get some pity laughs instead of insults. Pity laughs. What's that mean lightning dolt? The class's banter faded away as Bakugo reached the microphone, feedback echoing for just a moment. I pledge that I'm going to win, no matter what. Izuku simply sighed and shook his head as the boos and jeers began flying in the direction of Bakugo and Wane. Chaos was erupting as with anything that involved Bakugo. Ada was doing his best to reprimand the explosive teen, but he only seemed to make matters worse by drawing even more declarations out of Bakugo. I love this liveliness, Midnight cried, but instead of words, let's throw that hate and indignity into the first event. Her whip cracked as she pointed it at the board behind her that began spinning a wheel of possibilities. The first event is Battle Royale. All students will participate in a no-holds-barred fight against one another. If you are knocked unconscious or thrown out of the bounds Cementos is currently creating, then you are out. The hero was already in the process of sending waves of liquid-like cement to create a perfectly circular diameter of concrete, leaving the grassy field uncovered so that they may fall on soft terrain. Cementos will also be responsible for collecting any down students so that you don't have to worry about avoiding the bodies. Could she please word that differently? A couple dozen students thought simultaneously. Now, take your place on the platform and get ready to fight like your life depends on it, as there are only 40 spots. The area was more like the entire circumference of the arena, with small gaps on the ends to get thrown off of. It was enough to house the 80 students without any of them being even remotely near each other. 
Izuku was stationed closer to the center of the diameter, so he wasn't at a huge risk of being thrown out right off the bat. Ready. Midnight called out. Fight. The declaration was sudden, but apparently not unexpected. It took only a few moments before Izuku's sense stat went off and he leaned backwards, just narrowly avoiding Ida, whose kick passed straight over him. Igris. The knight wasted no time coming to his lead aid and he snatched Ida's leg by the calf, flinging him towards the edge of the circle. It wasn't enough to eliminate him however, as it seemed that Igris had sensed Izuku's intent to hold back. After all, Igris probably could have killed a majority of the people currently fighting without even breaking a sweat. Riding himself, Izuku attempted to take stock of the situation, but it seemed like 1B was not ready to give him that. When it has a summoner huh? A blonde boy with a demented smile asked as he rushed Izuku alongside Tetsu Tetsu, a boy with blades coming out of his arms, and another boy with an almost werewolf-like appearance. Well it doesn't matter how strong that summon is, it can't hold all of us back before we knock you out. Igris drew his shadow blade and rushed Kamakiri, the one with the blades. Meanwhile, the other three were left to Izuku himself. The blonde, Monoma, slapped the back of his beastly friend, Jiroda and his body became just as hairy and monstrous. Come here you extra. A shout sounded as an explosion eclipsed Monoma. It was, obviously, Bakugo. And as he faced off with Monoma, he looked back to Izuku. You better make it to the finals, Deku. I want to show the world who's really the strongest between us. Izuku basically ignored him, as Jiroda and Tetsu Tetsu, whose skin was now a gleaming silver, were bearing down on him. Each reared back their fist, ready to hit Izuku from both sides. He could have thrown them off balance with Dominator's touch, or even used his stealth to vanish, but instead, he chose to simply meet their attacks head on. His hands were held out, open-palmed and ready to catch their punches. Of course, even at Izuku's strength, these attacks would be pretty heavy, so he activated his new skill, something he had acquired specifically from the Namu at the USJ. Skill, Shock Absorption has activated. All physical attacks will be reduced by 99% for 5 seconds. Cost, 500 mana. Can only be used every 60 seconds. It was an overpowered skill by most definitions of the word. But with its time limit, mana cost, and cooldown, it was a very particular tool. This was Izuku's first time trying it out and he was not even slightly disappointed. As the heavy attacks from his two opponents crashed into his palms, he felt virtually nothing. Smokey, keep the beast busy. Jiroda's eyes widened for just a moment before being smacked aside by a massive paw, leaving Tetsu Tetsu as the only threat. By that point, the buff skill had worn off, so before he could throw another metallic punch, Izuku's hand clenched around his fist and using Dominator's touch as leverage. He heaved Tetsu Tetsu into the air, intending to throw him out of boundaries in much the same way Igris had done to Unfortunately, he had not expected his classmate to have such intense weight behind him and while he went soaring a decent distance for what was essentially a metal man, he crashed down many many meters short of the goal. Another five or so students had apparently gotten the same idea as 1B and decided to take out the stronger students as a team, but unlike 1B, they didn't even stand a chance. These must be the ones from C and D they seem too slow. Deciding that it wasn't worth the exhaustive effort, Izuku sighed and raised a clawed hand, come forth. The students didn't even know what hit them as the army of darkness washed over them, carrying the five to the edge of the arena and unceremoniously throwing them out. All right, Izuku said, grinning, let's get to the main event. Mukiu's eyes narrowed as she watched Izuku Midori bat aside enemy after enemy with ease. He'd gotten stronger, not to mention his shadow summons, so he was rewakened. Was Tsukachi wrong, or just covering for him? Hey, Kayu, Dabai growled out from behind her, causing her to jump and spin around. Lots of talent this year, huh? She scowled at him for a moment before noticing the woman beside him. She appeared to be in her early twenties and her hair was pure white, with a few specks of crimson throughout. Oh excuse me, she bowed to the woman, introducing herself. She may have been a total rage monster whenever facing Dabai, but she was not averse to composing herself for others. The woman chuckled. There's no need to apologize, knowing Taoya, he's probably done something to annoy you. Oh, I'm Fayumi Todoroki by the way. It's nice to meet you. Ah oh, come on sis, why do you have to follow me around like some sort of supervisor? I just wanted to have some fun. I followed you because I knew you'd try to bug someone. Dabai rolled his eyes sarcastically. This isn't just someone, this is Kayu, he declared, as if that cleared up everything. I told you to stop calling me that. Ryukyu nearly shouted, a slight blush forming on her face. Wait, Kayu, Fayumi asked, are you? Ryukyu, oh my god. I didn't even realize. Taoya always calls you by your hero name, so I had no idea of your full name. I, it's quite alright. He didn't refer to me as Kayo for the whole time we were dating, did he? It was almost exclusively that. Does it have any meaning? Or is it just a shortening of your hero name? Rukiu nodded furiously. It is definitely just a shorter version. Dabai cut her off. Oh, it has a meaning alright. 
Dabai I swear to god I will eviscerate you right here and now. Fayumi took a step back as her brother laughed. She could feel the real bloodlust between them. What the hell Taoya? You told me you guys broke up under good circumstances. Ryukyu here is a noisy one. Dabai. I call her Kaya because the only noise she could make in bed was. Dabai's voice went up a note as he went. Kaya. Ryukyu wanted to feel indescribable rage. She wanted to tear him limb from limb. But the only thing she could do was look down. Her face completely red with shame as she remembered their few nights of passion. In fact, she was so distraught that she didn't even notice Fayumi smacking her brother over and over on the shoulder as she berated him. Of course, she could only do it for so long before her hands began to hurt, as the S rank was closer to a brick wall than a human. Kayu, Dabai began, shrugging off his sister, Today I'm just here for Shoto. I don't want to ruin his big day on TV by killing that pest. Ryukyu recovered for just a moment as Izuku was brought up, so you're going to leave him alone. PFFD, he scoffed, as if. He's obviously been rewakened, which only reinforces my belief that he is responsible for Natsuo's death. Fayumi now tugged somewhat childishly on Dabai's sleeve. Taoya, we talked about this. I don't care if the kid killed him in self-defense. He was our brother. Fayumi stomped her foot. Obviously I know that. But he didn't try to become a hero like you, or like what Shoto is doing. He took after dad. I don't need to tell you why that's a bad thing. He might not need to know, but I'd like to hear this Fayumi. Endeavor growled as he emerged from a nearby stairwell, his body flaring with fire. Gently, Dabai moved Fayumi behind him. Don't act coy Enji, you know what we mean. Endeavor growled. It looks like the time you spent in America was wasted. You still have no respect for your elders. I could never respect someone like you. If you held more respect for me, you might not have received those burns. Dabai's face contorted into a visage that resembled his father's expression to a horrible degree. I'm proud of these burns. They're a reminder. I did what you refused to do, even as number two. He scoffed. Of course, you don't even deserve that position, much less number one. Why you? Endeavor's arms began to glow, lighting up with a powerful blaze. Dabai mirrored him, his burned and scarred arms bursting into blue flames. I'd run Fayumi. What? Endeavor appeared in Dabai's face, faster than Fayumi could even register her brother's threat. Their father obviously had no care for his daughter's safety as he was clearly willing to unleash a fiery blast with her just a few feet away. Enough. Endeavor and Dabai were shoved back by impacts to their chest and were shocked to see sharp appendages at their throats. Ryukyu had intervened just in time pushing them apart and threatening them with her claws and her trident-tipped tail that she manifested. Dabai smiled as her tail wiggled at his throat, the tip centimeters away from piercing his skin. I'd forgotten how cute your tail was, Kayo. This time, Ryukyu was able to ignore his remarks with her typical calm and collected personality. Endeavor, as a fellow member of the top 10, I won't report this, I know you do try to do good, but make no mistake, if you threaten your son, or put your daughter in harm's way ever again, I will not hesitate to bring you down. Endeavor scowled, but HMPH'd and turned his back to the group. I did what I did so that Shoto could be the best hero in the world. That's what respect gets you, boy. No friends, no family, no life outside of your sick desire. Dabai spit back. Endeavor simply squared his shoulders and stormed back from the way he came, only sparing a detestable glance at the battlefield when he noticed Shoto was only using his ice powers. Once he was finally gone, Ryukyu relaxed, her tail disappearing back under her dress and merging back into her body. Ah, uh, Dabai deadpanned, you do care. Rukiu sighed, I always cared. You were the one to break it off after all. She turned around and rested a hand on his shoulder. If you really want to fix what you broke, then give up this weird persona you've adopted. The old Taoya would never hunt down a kid like this. It was the first sincere thing she'd said to him since he had left her, likely because this was the first time she'd seen the old Dabai in ages. She couldn't stand to talk to him as he was, but when he had put himself between Endeavor and Fayumi, pulling all the attention to himself, it felt like she was looking into the past, a time when he was more heroic than she could ever be. Now, forget about this whole thing and just go cheer your brother on. Ryukyu wasn't sure if she had gotten through to him as she strutted away, but his lack of sass seemed to be a good enough indication. It wasn't perfect. In fact, it had nearly ended up pretty terrible. But it was a start and that was enough to put a smile on the dragon girl's face. Fifty students remain. Midnight shouted, signifying to Izuku that he just needed to survive the deaths of ten more students. Igris had already tossed out Kamakiri, but Smokey was having a surprising amount of trouble with Jiroda. Meanwhile, Hayao was simply doing his best to make sure Izuku was protected from any of Todoroki's wide-scale ice attacks. Originally, Izuku had perceived Todoroki as a near-unbeatable threat. And that was true, at least, on his own it was. But the heterochromatic boy appeared to only be using his right side. Hayao could easily circumvent these attacks with his own cryokinesis. But Izuku feared for the moment Todoroki decided to let his fire powers out. 
By that point, his only defense would be to use Tank, a shadow he wanted to keep secret for as long as possible considering its origins. Izuku wasn't sure how much recovery time was given between events. So instead of going all out to disqualify as many participants as possible, he retained his strength by letting his shadows take over, standing the middle of the field. His honor guard encircled him in a near impenetrable formation. Only someone like Bakugo or Shoto using his fire powers would likely be able to reach him. Occasionally, Igris would have to cut away some sort of vines that burrowed under the field to reach Izuku, but all things considered, it served as a great opportunity to observe everyone. He knew a good deal about his class, but seeing the way they fought against larger groups was paramount to his own strategies, especially that of Bakugo and Shoto. Izuku was pretty stubborn when it came to doing things his way, but he knew that as he was, he couldn't take on his S-rank classmates alone. It was time to cast aside any delusions that he could. Now, they would no longer fight Izuku Midoriya. They would fight the Shadow Monarch. Round 2 you won a bastard. The sound of explosions instantly made Izuku believe that Bakugo had changed his mind and was coming for him, but the shout dispelled this thought. Looking up he saw Monoma flying through the air, explosions coming out of his palms. Huh, it's like I thought. He copies the powers of those he touches. Izuku smiled, magicians. Monoma's cocky smile vanished as dozens of massive fireballs filled his view. He held out his hand, using the explosion quirk to vault over them, right into Igris's path. Without the proper time or speed, Monoma was virtually helpless in front of the shadow who slammed his fists down onto the student's back. As Monoma rocketed towards the ground, he saw that the Smokey had used his massive size and strength to launch Igris into the air. I've been watching that quirk for years. Monoma felt an invisible force punch his gut, stopping him midair for just a moment before he accelerated once more. A newbie like you isn't gonna beat me with it. He braced for a devastating uppercut as he fell towards Izuku, disorientated and bruised, but the moment never came. A loud air horn filled sounded and Izuku allowed Monoma to crash to the ground on his own, making a Monoma-sized crater. Igris landed next to his liege moments later, disappearing into his shadow alongside the rest of the army. And that's all for round one folks. Midnight shouted, 40 contestants have been eliminated, the other 40 will move on. Cracking her whip at the screen with the spinning wheel, for our next bout, we will have the team battles. Izuku didn't even have to look around to notice people rushing to either him, Shoto, or Bakugo. Students like Shoji, Mina, Kamakiri, and another girl from 1B, Satsuna, gathered around him. Hold your horses, everyone. Let's wait until the game is revealed before you start Midnight Froze. In fact, just about everyone in the arena froze. It was a familiar feeling, maybe too familiar. Izuku was the first to realize what it was. It's Kirigir the air around him warped and the surrounding students were sucked inside a rapidly expanding gate alongside him. Midnight was knocked off her pedestal by the intense forces and the nearby students were sent soaring back their backs slamming into the arena walls. Thankfully, Cementos and Shoto were there to catch anyone who was tumbling just a little too fast. What is this? Kaminari screamed out. It's that gate villain. Yeyorazu shouted back as the wind pressure began dying down. She rushed forwards, intending to dive into the gate after Izuku and the others, but she crashed into a rock-solid wall of red energy. Again, Damai growled as he strutted onto the field. I swear, that kid just can't escape these red gates. He shook his head. Kayu, old man. All might, get down here. We're busting this thing open. I don't take orders from you boy. Endeavor shouted as the flames on his back cut off, dropping him to the ground, right alongside Ryukyu, who glided down on her wings, and All Might, who simply appeared next to them all without any warning. You brats better clear out. Dab I warned, otherwise you might get squashed by the pressure. As Midnight herded all the students away and Cementos physically dragged Bakugo back, the 4S ranks got ready. We're not seriously going to hit this with all our strength are we? Ryukyu asked, concerned for the well-being of the crowd. Unless you want to be charged for the murder of... What? A couple hundred people? Then yeah, hold back. But we still gotta try something. Though, now you're so concerned over this Midoriya. It wouldn't be back. I don't care about that kid. But I saw at least seven others get sucked in. None of them were above B rank. Who is this Izuku Midoriya? All Might asked as he began putting off significantly less mana than usual. I saw him at the entrance exam and during the USJ, but I was too distracted to get a full image of his mana. He's just a stronger brat. Dab I spat. Now can we actually coordinate this? While the 4S ranks positioned themselves around the red gate, Cementos was busy throwing barriers up around the stadium, shielding those who still decided to remain and witness the force of some of the world's strongest heroes. Ready? All Might shouted, now. Izuku groaned as he rubbed a sore spot on his head and sat up. What the hell? I've never felt a gate as turbulent as that before. It was like I was being slammed around in a small tunnel. Everyone okay? He asked groggily, to which he received no response. He sat bolt upright and looked around. Hello. 
Izuku leapt to his feet as footsteps began to echo in the dark and dank caverns. The footsteps were not human and he knew that at the very least that Mina and Shoji were in here with him. Igris, Izuku called upon his knight, wanna go meet our hosts? Igris nodded and dashed forwards, disappearing in the cavernous tunnel, Izuku strolling leisurely behind him. But knowing red gates, Izuku shouldn't have acted so calm. Moments later, Igris came flying back down the tunnel at head height, forcing Izuku to duck under his ravaged body. Huh. Izuku straightened up, seeing that the enemies stomping down the tunnel were none other than high orcs. They were highly intelligent villains, equipped with bodies that could flatten buildings. The lead orc looked like it was about to open its mouth, so Izuku reacted accordingly. Skill, Sprint LV. 3 has activated. The villain's eyes caught up just in time to see Izuku slash through his neck with the angel's demonic wing. Looks like you guys will provide plenty of experience, Izuku said, letting the sword rest against his shoulder as he retreated back to Igris and gave him a hand up. I'm not a huge fan of these types of swords, but since I'm missing my good old gauntlets, it'll have to do. The orcs growled as Igris stood, the energy radiating from him now on an entirely different level. Izuku smiled, looks like you've finally reached level 30, Igris. Rank up, elite knight grade. A silent roar escaped Igris as his body spasmed for a few moments and his mana grew exponentially. Well, now that we're ready, how about we call the others? The orc's eyes grew even wider as Hayo, Smoky, Tank, and at least 50 other shadows appeared behind the sword-wielding Izuku. I don't see any gate around here, so I guess I'll just have to fight my way through this place. Skill, Bloodlust has activated. All of the enemy's stats will decrease by 50%. The beast took a momentary step back. But like the monsters they were, they only had one desire, to kill all humans. With a fervent and anxious roar they charged forwards, intending to fulfill their purpose. Too bad for them. They'd never meet their life's goal. Uraraka, Shoji, Setsuna, Minta, Mina, Kamakiri, and Tora were the unlucky seven to be pulled into the red gate with Izuku. They were even unluckier to be separated from him upon being spit out from the portal. Minta was the first up, pounding on the solid energy like a mime trapped inside an invisible box. Help us, hey squirt, Kamakiri shouted, it's a red gate. I know, so then stop freaking out. How can I not freak out? Shoji rested a hand on Minta's shoulder. We only survived this by calming down and focusing on the path ahead of us. Minta trembled a few moments longer, but the severe glare in Kamakiri and Shoji's eyes somehow managed to calm him down. Speaking about the path ahead of us, Satsuna pointed forwards, the dark tunnel in front of them alight with the red glow of several pairs of eyes. Dungeon jackals, Uraraka exclaimed. Shoji, Kamakiri, and Mina were the first to leap into battle. In reality, only Mina and Kamakiri could be classified as combat types among their group, but Shoji had the strength to back up his insane senses. Come on, Toru called out, turning herself invisible and running to help her classmates. Dungeon jackals are only C rank. It sounded like an absolute blessing. It would be a struggle for 7 B ranks to beat what was presumably a B rank dungeon, but with Minta's super strong support quirk and the rest of them working together, they could handle it no problem. Their spirits continued to lift as the villain numbers were steadily thin. The dog-like villains were fast, but predictable and within no time, they were all dead. Phew, I was worried this dungeon might have been harder, but if it's just C-rank. Then, Satsuna trailed off, her eyes unable to comprehend the sight. Before anyone even had the chance to notice, four dozen high orcs had appeared in the tunnel's path. They stood with an ugly menace, their guttural language being passed back and forth as they stared down the humans. And no way. This many orcs, those jackals, they weren't the real threat, they were just pets. Shoji held back Kamakiri, who looked like he was about to break and charge them, will only die. There are ranks, who dot 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 mans dot 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 one of the orcs growled, his mouth twisted into an unnatural shape as he forced out the unfamiliar syllables. I am, Kargelgin, I wish to, meet with you. Humans, what? Shoji had heard of plenty of talking villains before, but he'd never heard of ones that wanted to parlay. Are you the one who created the Red Gate, Kargalgan? No, those you speak of. They are the others. The true monarchs of our realms. Monarchs, enough. Come with my men. Or die. Shoji, you can't seriously be considering this. Suddenly, it seemed that Shoji had become their leader. If we fight them here and win then we can wait out the Red Gate's timer. You are. Seven. You are. Weak. My men. Fifty. Strong. Die by my men's hands. Or follow them. Shoji sighed heavily. Knowing that there was nothing else he could do, we'll follow. As they began trailing behind the massive and imposing orc forces, another clash was happening far deeper in the dungeon, and at the center of its clash was a single teenager whose level was climbing at a rapid pace. W what is this? Kamakiri asked in shock as the tunnel opened to what could only be described as a throne room. Thousands of high orcs filled the room wall to wall, leaving only a single strip of walkable space in the center of the room wide enough to fit the length of a semi-truck. 
This, this amount of orcs. They'd destroy all of UA and the surrounding area before even the S ranks could stop them. Welcome humans. The orc at the head of the chamber, presumably Kargelgan growled, noticing their tense forms and anticipating an attack. He gave a toothy grin, his tusks and bony armor accenting his evil aura like a fine wine alongside a steak. Tell me something. Do you fear me? A massive burst of magical energy escaped him, slamming against the teens like a shockwave. All of them fell to their knees, unable to even comprehend such power. They had felt the stores of mana in S ranks before, but that was controlled, simmering beneath the surface like a still pond. This force, it was just evil. Why? Why'd you bring us here? Your warriors could have killed us easily. Entertainment. The orc leaned on his arm lazily. I cannot remember how long we've been stuck here, but I do know that we will be free soon. Regardless, a leader must provide for his men. We will kill you one by one. Until the portal releases its hold on us, Shoji peeled his gaze off the floor to see that one of Kargalgan's guards, who all wore intricately designed bone or pelt armor, had stomped up to him. He'll be the first to claim one of your lives. Okay, Shoji muttered under his breath, just loud enough for his classmates to hear. If we hit him all at once, with Minder restraining him, we can win. His breathing sped up as he leapt to his feet and launched himself at the bodyguard. Now, gravitation magic. Shoji expected himself to either fly into the air or get slammed into the ground. But neither happened and he continued forwards only to get slapped aside by the orc like he was a fly. It felt too heavy, like someone had smacked him in the face with a 20-ton sledgehammer. Groaning and pushing himself back onto his hands and knees, Shoji saw the true target of the gravity magic. The other six classmates were on the ground, trembling as the orc's magic forced them further down. I said we'd do it one by one. I will not allow you humans to try and survive through ignoble trickery. The bodyguard raised his two massive cutlasses, aiming to cut Shoji in two, or at least, that's what it looked like. Instead, the swords cut straight down just as Shoji stood, severing his two arms at the same time. H. Shoji collapsed to his knees for a third time as the pain overwhelmed his senses. It's a shame you humans aren't stronger. Your screams are so much more enjoyable when you actually put up a challenge for my men. Kargelgan sighed and raised a downturned thumb. Looks like one's already down. Don't worry, we'll make your comrades last longer. The orc placed one of his swords against Shoji's neck, earning a deafening cry of applause from the crowd, overshadowing the students' cries of despair. Damn, Ryukyu shook her sore fist. A dozen punches to roughly the same area from the 4S ranks had done virtually nothing. Hem. All Might held a hand to his chin before pulling out his phone. Looks like I have no choice but to rely on him. Dab eyes and Endeavor's arms were still ablaze with the most powerful flames on earth. Abusive relationship or not. Dab eye was still his father's son and his father would never give up on a task as simple as this. Are you giving up? Number 1. Endeavor jeered. All Might nodded. Yes. There is only one person I know who can break the seal on a red gate. And judging by our progress, or lack thereof, they aren't among us. It's quite alright. A smooth voice said emerging from one of the arena's nearby hallways. Now there are two people you know who can do it, Toshi. Turning around, Dabai scoffed. Get out of our way, little man. And a rank like you can't handle out impacts at this range. Sukachi ignored Dabai and continued strolling up to the red gate. Hands in his pockets and face as calm as could be. Taking a second look at him, All Might began to notice something. His aura was calmer than before. And he seemed bigger than before, like he had grown overnight. Step aside, he said to the three still slamming their fists into the gate, creating a crater of rubble around them. Like I'd listened to some monitoring division bastard. Endeavor spat, his desire to open the gate only fueling his flames further. Ryukyu, on the other hand, did listen and laid a hand on Dabai's shoulder. Come on, we're not doing anything. And he's going to. All Might was the one to answer, yes, he will. The sheer awe in his voice was enough to catch even Endeavor by surprise and all of them looked up to the number one hero. The supposed strongest hero in the world was looking over at Tsukachi like he was a d- He had finally realized what the others could not. Dabai and Endeavor reluctantly stepped back, allowing Tsukachi full line of sight of the red gate. One hand lazily extracted itself from its pocket, raising into the air and pointing its digits at the gate. His eyes squinted and strings of white light shot out from his hand, latching onto the invisible grid that barred dimension. Within seconds, the energy cracked and shattered, removing the red color from the gate. Ryukyu hesitantly thrust her hand at the portal, finding that it passed through without incident. How? The four turned around, intending to grill Tsukachi for answers, but he was already gone. What? Just happened. All Might sighed in relief. The second ruler has been born. Shoji knew that it would happen any second now. The blade was perfectly positioned to slit his throat. He was faint, blood loss and fear dragging him further towards unconsciousness, but he was determined to not fall asleep. 
It could be considered an odd sentiment, but he wanted to be awake and look his death in the eyes. But the sword never moved. Even as Shoji trembled and fell over, the last of his strength gone, the sword remained in place. In fact, the entire orc was frozen and Kargelgan called out to him in confusion, Kill him. Sorry your highness. A voice deadpanned as the back of the room was thrown into chaos. Bodies thrown every which way, revealing Izuku and his army. But my shadows will have to be your entertainment for now. Kill the others, Kargalgan commanded, pointing at Shoji and the other six. Izuku was at the back of the room. He shouldn't have been able to come to their aid in time and yet, as another six orcs appeared to stab their weapons through the students, they froze just like the bodyguard. The means were revealed as Izuku raised his sword into the air, another three dozen feathers shedding off of it and racing to stab into the nearest orc. Skill, paralyzing storm has activated. Up to five dozen feathers can be shed from the sword's outer layer and be sent to paralyze enemies for a short time. Tank, Izuku shouted, pointing at his classmates, go get them. The Namu's beak-like mouth bobbed in acknowledgement as it used its asinine strength to leap over the entire army of orcs and land next to Shoji just as the orc broke out of the paralysis. Of course, he didn't have any chance to react and was delivered in powerful uppercut, sending him flying up into the ceiling, lodging into it like a chandelier. It only took Tank a few more moments to tear the other nearby orcs into pieces. He attempted to peel the students off the floor, but other than Shoji, Kargalgan's magic kept them pinned in place. Izuku quickly took note of this and heaved up a spear that was twice as long as he was tall. Before entering this gate, it might have been hard to accurately throw, but Izuku had just waded through an army of orcs to get to this chamber. His level had risen dramatically. He had forgotten that his stat growth was just linear when it came to his level. Unlike the stats given by his armor, the stats given by his level increased his power exponentially. That explains why I feel stronger than I did with my armor. Taking solace in this knowledge, Izuku felt confident that he wouldn't miss and he hauled his arm forwards, launching the spear like a ballistic missile at Kargalk, him of protection. At the same time a massive blue mana shield appeared in front of the orc, his gravity magic wore off, finally allowing Tank to scoop up all seven students, some with squeals of fright, into his massive arms and leap back to the horde of shadow soldiers. It doesn't matter how strong you or your shadows are, we outnumber you 200 to 1. Maybe. But then again, Izuku shouted back, Arise. Kargalgan and the few remaining students that were still conscious, despite their fear, looked on in shock as bright red and black shadows began pulling themselves from the corpses of the high orcs. You shouldn't look down on us. It could end up being your downfall. After all, we've all leveled up quite a bit. Izuku crouched down, his sword hanging just behind him ready to slash, kill them all. It was disgustingly easy. While some of his lesser shadow infantry struggled even fighting one high orc, Igris, Hayo, Tank, Smokey, the rest of the bears, and the magicians tore through droves of the villains with ease. And as the battle continued, things would only grow easier as Izuku and his army continued to level up and claim more orc shadows for themselves. Izuku was slower to catch up to his shadow's kill rate since he was still getting acquainted with his new sword. But his higher level and more powerful stats also meant that he was no slouch. Izuku had always shied away from blades. He'd been too afraid of the skill they required as an E-rank. He didn't have the strength to swing them fast enough to outpace the fancier sword skills others had built up, the speed to dodge and maneuver around his enemies, or the perception to anticipate his opponent's next move. But now, he had more than enough power to see why others wielded them. He still preferred his gauntlets. But Izuku couldn't deny the satisfaction he felt as the sword carved an orc in half. Him of blazing fire. Tank. Skill. Defender has activated. All ranged attacks will be drawn to the user for 10 seconds. The massive AoE fire blast that Kargulgan spat out compressed into a single bead of heat that slammed into Tank, practically destroying his entire body. You act so arrogant with such useless puppets. Useless? Izuku shook his head. Acting as if he was disappointed in the High Orc's observational skills, my puppet is just fine. Izuku's mana slowly ticked down as Tank reformed from essentially nothing and gave a high-pitched growl aimed at Kargulgan. As long as I have mana, you cannot win. You'll run out of mana before you can kill all of my men. Is that so? Izuku asked, reaching his hand into his inventory and pulling out a mana potion from the store. Well, I suppose we'll see about that. Until then, I'll have my men play with yours. With a smirk still plastered on his face, Izuku activated stealth and disappeared from the world. As Izuku went to take on the boss, Hayo, Igris, and Tank were facing off with the three remaining bodyguards of Kargalg. Hayo froze two of them as Tank and Igris bore down on the third, pummeling him into the earth. They repeated the process with the other two by unfreezing one and killing it. It wasn't an honorable way to fight, but who cared about honor when villains were trying to murder you? Don't ignore me. 
Izuku shouted, slamming his fist into Kargulgan's knee, shattering it as he bounced around. Using his agility and strength to his advantage, you have no time to worry for your guards. They'll be dead soon anyways. R-A-A-R-G-H. So will you. Him of petrification. Sorry. But it looks like we're a bad matchup. Izuku's massive sword slashed straight through the orc's elbow like it wasn't even there. Why? Why didn't my magic work? Skill, longevity has activated. All diseases, poisons and status effects are healed, and sleeping will explosively increase regeneration ability. Izuku offered no solace and only continued his assault, causing Kargalgan to roar in rage. Him of giants, him of strength and him of rage, him of combustion. The villain grew to at least four times his size as the rest of his buffs took effect and his fire attack engulfed the entire area he and Izuku were fighting in. Are you still taking me lightly? I wouldn't consider you any more threatening than those I've faced before, Izuku said, exiting stealth right on the giant's shoulder. After all, bigger targets are much easier for me to hit. Kargalgan's eyes widened as Izuku jumped from his shoulder to his face, driving the massive angel sword into his eye. It was too close of a range for the orc to activate his shield and he cried out in pain and rage as he went to claw at his eye. But Izuku was already moving on. You've lost. Do you know why? Izuku slashed at the back of his enemy's knees, dropping him to the ground, where he looked up to quite the awful sight. A teen with an obscured face, the only distinguishable trait being his glowing green eyes, and his three loyal bodyguards standing behind him as guards, because as a magician, you've lost your guards, which means, you've lost your life. Could it be? The Mon Izuku cut off his rambling by stabbing through his skull and releasing the sword's feathers inside to shred his brain. The dungeon's boss has been slain. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Level, 86. Strength, 154. Vitality, 106. Agility, 137. Intelligence, 156. Sense, 118. HP, 27,164 over 27,164. Shadows able to be extracted, 156. Shadows able to be saved, 121. It's a shame there's a limit on how many shadows I can have. Otherwise I could have an army a thousand strong. Oh well, at least I got some strong shadows out of this and now. To take his, Izuku lorded over Kargalgan and muttered, Arise, Shadow High Orc LV, 10 Elite Knight Grade. Come, I've been seeing a lot of Elite Knight Grade recently. Choose a name for the Shadow Soldier. Kargalgan is too wordy. In battle I'll need something much easier to call out to. He scanned the orc's body up and down, looking for any type of distinguishable feature, but the only thing he could focus on were the Shadow's enormous tusks. Izuku sighed, Fine. It's pretty lame, but for now, you're Tusk. By now, Izuku's army was reaching some pretty insane levels and the lineup looked as such. 63 Shadow High Orc, 25 Shadow Bears, 19 Shadow Infantry, 6 Magicians, 3 Shadow High Orc Bodyguards, Smokey, Tank, Igris, Hyo, and Tusk. Item Class, S. Item Type, Artifact. The strength of all magic is doubled when held. Item Class, S. Item Type, Dagger, plus 150 Attack. This dagger can duplicate up to eight times and its trajectory when thrown can be controlled mentally. It was some pretty amazing loot, but Izuku still found himself disappointed. Am I ever gonna get my gauntlets back? My best skills rely on using them. Izuku's back exploded with heat as blue flames licked the area. Of course, with his sense stat, he had felt it coming a mile away. Tusk's hymn of protection had kicked in before Dabai's attack could reach him and now the S rank had about 120 shadows aiming their respective weapons at him. D-A-B-I. Rukiu screeched, moving to hold him back, but Izuku stopped her with a shake of his head. Your Talia Todoroki. Izuku asked. You're damn right you little shit. I was gonna give you today as a grace period, but since no one can really prove what happens in dungeons, I thought this would be the most opportune time. He looked about to launch forwards into battle with the team, but Izuku interrupted him. Your brother tried to kill me and got another innocent person killed for no good reason other than money. He was evil and I acted in self-defense. I should have nothing more to say than that. But, he was your family. Izuku bowed low, and I am sorry for your loss. W what? Dabai had expected a multitude of responses. Such a sincere apology was not one of them. It wouldn't have been weird for Dabai to see Izuku grovel and beg for his life. But it was weird when he saw the teen offer his condolences. Miyuki watched with rapt attention as All Might scooped up Shoji and rushed him out to the healers while Endeavor herded the rest of the still shell-shocked students out. Dabai let out a low growl, and the flames on his arms died down. F fine. You win kid. The ring of shadows broke open as he walked away, back the way he had come from. Their Kaiyu, you happy? Ryukyu gave him a sarcastic roll of her eyes, but smiled all the same and said, Yes, I very much am. Following after him, Dabai noticed she walked closer to him than she had been in years. Izuku let out a sigh as he finally found himself alone in the cavern and he collapsed to his butt. 
He figured that with his own power and the power of the shadows, an S rank like Dabai should have been easily overpowered. But he certainly didn't want to fight him any longer, probably thanks to the fact that his mana was still regenerating. Everyone saw me extract Tusk's shadow, so they know how I get my summons now, but the real problem is my aura. There's no way All Might or Ryukyu didn't notice my rapid growth in strength. So are they simply waiting to talk to me in private, or do they really not realize what they sensed? Igris laid a hand on Izuku's shoulder as if attempting to comfort his liege after a long day of battle. And while Izuku was tired, he also felt satisfied. He had gained plenty of levels, some loot, expanded his army, and he now knew something that put a smile on his face. On an individual level, his power had just barely surpassed that of Bakugo's. He had reached his goal. Izuku took a deep breath before stepping past the threshold and back into the real world expecting a horde of faculty berating him with questions. But instead, upon exiting the red gate and emerging back onto the somewhat destroyed grassy field of the arena, he was met by an empty stadium. Well, empty except for Midoriya. Yeyurazu hugged tackled him. I was worried when you didn't exit after the others. Izuku paused for a moment as his brain caught up with the situation and his arms lingered in midair before finally relaxing to hug her back. I, un, uh, yeah, sorry. Where is everyone? They finally managed to force all the spectators out and the teachers ran off to escort everyone else to Recovery Girl. That did plenty to set Izuku's mind at ease. While Recovery Girl wasn't an S rank in healing, she was in a rank and as long as her patient was still alive, she could heal them and regrow their limbs. In addition, the lack of people and the chaos gave Izuku the slightest hope that the four S ranks who had entered the gate after him wouldn't have noticed his substantial increase in power. Unfortunately however, his shadow extraction skill was out in the open. There was no way all seven of the students, plus the S ranks, missed him pulling summons out of the corpses of a couple dozen high orcs. So, what should we Izuku cut off as he felt an S rank or a quickly falling towards them from the sky? Slightly on edge and not sure what to expect, Tusk, Hayo, Igris, Smokey, and Tank emerged around him. The figure, whatever it was, landed as a blur, cracking the earth and kicking up an explosion of dust. Are you joking? A deep, yet feminine voice asked, I hear something about a special gate opening at the UA Sports Festival, and arrive just in time to see it close. Izuku's fist clenched, activating Dominator's touch and sweeping aside the cloud of dust, revealing a short teenage girl around 18. She had long white hair, perfectly tanned skin, and the feature that stood out most, two fluffy rabbit ears. Izuku knew without a doubt who this was. The current number 8 hero, Maruko, the youngest s rank hero to ascend the hero rankings just barely beating out Hawks. She fixed him with something in between a smirk and a scowl, and who are you? Maruko strutted up to him, standing at least a full foot shorter than him. I'm his body tensed up as Maruko's eyes narrowed and she leaned her head closer to his chest. H. Hey. Her nose twitched and a slight smile of delight spread across her face. Huh. You smell good. Thank you. Yay Razu. Much to Izuku's surprise, got in between the two, pushing Maruko away. What do you think you're doing? Izuku tilted his head and looked back to his shadows. Igris and Hayo were shaking their heads, as if they knew exactly what was going on. Maruko still had the same smirk on as she practically allowed herself to be moved backwards. After all, she was an S rank and Yeyurazu was in a rank. Maruko's smugness was palpable despite being six inches shorter than Yeyurazu. It was almost a comical exchange. I smell mana, kid. Aside from him, every hero I walk by smells like trash, including you. Yeyurazu somehow ignored the comment about her smell altogether and stuttered out, K hey kid, how old are you? Crossing her arms, Maruko's ears twitched as she responded, 18. I may be short, but I can still kick your ass seven ways from Sunday. Flustered by the sudden competition Yeyurazu blurted out, what does that even mean? Maruko rolled her eyes and leaned to the side, looking past her and towards Izuku and his shadows, so you wanna go a few rounds? Excuse me. What? Are you scared? She asked with a glint in her eyes. With those summons of yours and your mana, I'd say you're around an S-rank. There's no way you're scared of a little girl like me. She continued goading him, but Izuku simply mirrored her crossed arms and called his shadows back into himself. It's already been a long day, maybe another time. He took Yeyurazu by the hand and pulled her away from the crazy rabbit hero. Though it was just out of the corner of her eyes, Maruko could see Yeyurazu smiling in success. But Maruko wasn't about to shy away so easily, and as Izuku turned to leave for one of the arena tunnels she appeared in front of him once more, sorry, but I'm not letting you leave without at least giving me a name. Izuku heaved a tired sigh. Izuku Midoriya. Maruko's bunny ears flopped forwards, pressing against her head as she cheered inwardly. Wait, why do I care so much about just getting his name? Izuku gave her an odd look, as if he was waiting for permission to leave. She HM fed, I'll wait for next time to get your number. Yeyurazu fixed her with a glare as Izuku's eyes seemed to glaze over, as if he couldn't fully comprehend her declaration. 
In truth, something in her bright red iris had caught his eyes and for just a moment, he felt like he was staring right into her soul. Noticing this, Deirazu gave his hand a squeeze and he snapped back into reality. We'll see about that, he finally said, walking away, hand in hand with Yeyurazu. Of course, even as they reached the tunnels to exit the arena, Maruko's enhanced hearing could catch the sound waves of their conversation. What was that about? I I don't know. Something about her eyes. They seemed familiar. To the shock of no one, the sports festival was cancelled and school was even put on hold for a week as the staff consulted each other about the new threat of inexplicably appearing portals. Endeavor, Ryukyu. And Dabai all agreed to do their best to locate this Kirajiri and imprison him, or kill him if the former is impossible, All Might said, leaning forwards onto the horseshoe-shaped table, his body notably less bulky. I can't believe those two agreed to take on the same task. Well they both care about Shoto, Midnight, in their own ways, of course, but they still were upset by the interruption of what was supposed to be his day. Aizawa sighed and rubbed at his temples, all of this on top of the Jeju Island activity. Is there any chance it's correlated? The problem with this situation lies within your question. Nezu said, smiling despite the incidents. We don't know enough about either situation to make any conclusions. What about Tsukachi? Snipe asked, looking towards All Might, who was not only a part-time teacher, but the head of the agency association, meaning Tsukachi was one of his employees. Unfortunately, All Might shook his head. I haven't been able to contact him since the other day. It's like he dropped off the map. He was investigating 13's death before all of this. Do you think he found something while looking? It's possible, Midnight said, after all. There's no one I know in all of hero history who's ever managed to force open a red gate. All Might, you know him best. Any ideas? All Might paused for a moment, as if he was considering something, but quickly shook his head. No, there's nothing. He neglected to comment on his announcement on the birth of the second ruler. They hadn't heard it. And for now, there's no reason for them to know. Then the next solution is Izuku Midoriya. All Might shook himself out of his thoughts. What? How? You told us yourself. Vlad growled. He pulled some sort of living shadow out of the villain's corpses. What if he can do that with 13? We could know everything she knew. That is the next logical step. Nezu admitted. Aizawa, you and Tashinori should go talk to him. If he can do such a thing, then request it of him, even if you have to beg. The faculty blanched at such a proposal. Nezu never acted so seriously. Whatever this situation was, it was fiercely important. So, should we just knock? Aizawa gave All Might a tired glare. What else would we do? Break the door down. All Might said nothing and simply wrapped his massive knuckles against the door, which was opened almost immediately to a girl with straight black hair and a beautiful face. Though, Miss Yeyurazu, I apologize. Principal Nezu must have given us the wrong address. But Yeyurazu simply smiled and bowed to them. I assume you're looking for Midoriya. Huh? Oh, well yes. Then you have the right address. She opened the door wider, inviting them inside. As they took a seat on the ratty couch, Yeyurazu asked, Would you like some tea? All Might raised his hand like a schoolboy and Aizawa nodded gratefully. The kitchen was just next to the living room, so they could hear each other perfectly. Do you two live together? Aizawa asked bluntly, causing Yeyurazu to blush slightly. Not yet. I mean, no. I keep telling her she should just move in and stop denying it. A younger voice said as Sakura creeped around the corner. It's funny, they haven't even kissed yet and she already wants to move in with him. Sakura. Yeyurazu scolded, don't be rude, seemingly remembering her manners. Sakura bowed to the teachers and introduced herself. She's just here because Izuku asked her to look after me while he was away, which is totally unnecessary by the way. Yamomo. Your brother asked me to stay with you and I'm going to stay with you. Sakura smirked, admit it, you just like sleeping in his bed. Yeyurazu froze, realizing that her teachers were watching the back and forth. Um, please forgive her. You know how kids are these days. I'm not that much younger than. Aizawa interrupted as he was handed his tea. You said Izuku was away. Where is that? I wouldn't know. But it's likely that he's out tackling dungeons to pay for his living expenses. And out mother's medical bills. Sakura chimed in, as if it was a necessary tidbit. Well, if he trusts you with his sister in his bed, Aizawa said with a hint of teasing in his voice, then I assume you're aware of his ability to call upon the dead and use them as his warriors. He can do what? Sakura blurted out. She had been escorted from the snowy red gate before she could see Izuku resurrect Haya. Yeyurazu nodded. Yes, I've been aware of his ability since before we started our first day of school. Do you know if it's possible for him to do it to humans? Who you want him to bring back 13, don't you? Yes, so it is imperative that we learn of his current location. We must unravel the secrets of 13, whatever they are. Yeyurazu had to stifle a small giggle at All Might's dramatics, but Sakura let rip a full laugh and Yeyurazu finally managed to push her out of the room, back to her bedroom. Well, I'm sorry, but I wasn't lying to cover for him earlier. He really didn't tell me where he planned on going. 
He asked for my help and I trusted him enough not to push further for answers. Then, we're gonna need a bigger search party, Aizawa said to All Might. After all, he could be in any of the dozens of dungeons throughout Tokyo. Izuku looked up at the perfectly sculpted barred gates in front of him. The gates guarding a heavenly palace, huh? He retrieved the key dropped by the angel guardians from the last time he had been there and inspected it. I waited to come back here until I was slightly stronger, but I've grown so much that I wonder if this place will even be a challenge for me. Probably shouldn't have said that. I'll end up jinxing myself. He shrugged to himself and inserted the key, turning it in for some reason, completely shattering the gates in front of him like glass. Well, I've still got a hearthstone, so if things get dicey, I can always run. The environment past the gates seemed to suddenly build themselves, like a video game level rendering. It was a simple white hall, with marble pillars and a red carpet. If anything it reminded Izuku of his encounter with Igris, just brighter. Well, without further ado, come forth. Quest, normal quest, collect heavenly souls. Part 1. The heavenly palace is filled with angelic beings. Hunt them down and collect their souls for special rewards. Quest completion requirement. 10,000 heavenly souls. Rewards. 1. Item of your choosing from the store. 2. Plus 20 bonus stats. 3. Hidden reward. 10,000. Izuku scratched at his head. School's off for the next 7 days, but will that even be enough? I've expanded my army pretty substantially. But still, 10,000. He looked behind him, a smile crossing his face as he saw all 121 shadow warriors kneeled, ready for his command. Well, I guess we're only wasting time here, let's get going. Strolling down the hallway, an army at his back, Izuku felt like he could take on the world, which wasn't all that dissimilar from the number he had to match. And when he shoved open the doors at the end of that hallway, he began wondering if he really was here to take on the world. The entirety of Tokyo was stretched out before him, its grey and bland architecture replaced by the most blinding white marble structures he had ever seen. Ethereal figures floated around these buildings, high in the sky, peacefully going about their business. Or at least, they were until Izuku stepped one foot out of the hallway. All at once, a cacophony of screams that sounded closer to musical instruments erupted across the city and the beating of hundreds of wings filled the air. Item Class S Item Type Dagger Plus 150 Attack this dagger can duplicate up to 8 times and its trajectory when thrown can be controlled mentally. Skill, Sprint LV. 3 has activated. With the explosive leap and movement speed, Izuku blurred forwards, leaping into the air. Onyx daggers in hand to take the first kill. His body collided with the first angel. The ornate daggers plunging into its pure white and featureless form. Collected heavenly souls, 1 10,000. Izuku flicked his wrists, duplicating the dagger so that 4 rested in each hand. As the other faceless angels swiftly approached, he launched all eight, finding that the telekinetic control was closer to Dominator's touch than he had expected. Collected Heavenly Souls, 39 10,000. Collected Heavenly Souls, 52 10,000. Izuku looked around, surprised to see that even his basic infantry was slashing through the angels with abandon. A stark contrast to the battle with the high orcs, which means these things are really weak. It's not even worth extracting their shadows, scratching at his head. All the while directing around the daggers, Izuku found himself wondering why the key had even been ranked at S rank. I figured it meant the dungeon itself was S rank, but these guys are barely even D rank. It's gotta get harder the longer the fight goes on. Right, or maybe I just got too strong before challenging this place. Izuku shook his head. There's no way that's the case. I'm sure I'll find my fill of danger by the end of the day. And at this rate, I can just sit back and watch them get torn to shreds. Izuku shouted out loud, happy to see the fruits of his labor. But I think that'd get boring before long. So, jumping back into the fray, he became the angel's boogeyman. Yukiu growled into her pillow as her phone buzzed on her dresser. It was less of a draconic roar and more of a cute grumble, slamming her palm down on the dresser nearly hard enough to break it in two. Her fingers felt around for the device, eventually finding it and raising it to her face. Its light felt like it was enough to blind her permanently, but she bravely pressed answer and pulled it close, HRM. Hello, what's up Rukiu? Hawks cried out from the end of the other line. Sorry to disturb your rest, but the ten have been called to action. W what? Hawks no-nonsense tone and answer pulled Rukiu out of her exhaustion. Turns out our timetable's been moved up. Jeju Island's first Namu made landfall about 30 minutes ago. Has it been dealt with? It killed 12 men and women before snatching up a child and flying back to the island with her in tow. What? Rukiu shouted, and you didn't stop it. Hey hey, I was nowhere near the incident. And none of the other heroes nearby had the flight capabilities to stop it. That's why we're pushing forwards for the raid to happen now. Alright. Okay. One more thing before you head over, Hawks began. All Might and Maruko keep asking around about some kid. Izuku Midoriya. Know anything about him? Why are they looking for him? 
Ryukyu asked, pushing aside Hawk's question. All Might said something about needing him for 13, whatever that means. And Maruko just said that he smelled normal. To anyone else, that sentence might have sounded crazy, but Ryukyu had known Maruko for quite some time. In her entire life, Maruko had never once encountered someone that smelled even remotely good. Her acute mana sense had severely affected her olfactory sense and forced everyone to smell, as Maruko put it, like a wet dog dipped in sewage. If she smelled someone good for once, it made sense that she'd be at the very least curious about why. Haven't seen him since the UA Sports Festival, but I'll keep my eyes open. All right, Hawks chirped, his normal cheery self back. Then get down here as fast as you can. We'll be right down. Hawks paused, we. Ryukyu cursed under her breath. Ryukyu, whose W Ryukyu hung up, unable to think up an answer on the spot. Sounds like the chicken is jealous, Dabai drawled out, running a finger down Ryukyu's cold back. She shivered in response, being cold-blooded. Someone with flames like Dabai's could make her feel completely relaxed with just a single touch, but she managed to push him off and pull herself out of bed. Well the chicken also needs me, and any other S ranks would be welcome. Dabai scoffed, at Jeju Island? No thank you. Don't start acting all selfish again with that weird persona of yours. Hey, I love you and all that, but I also love life. I'd rather not lose it to that damned island. Ryukyu rolled her eyes at his less than genuine declaration of affection. You've never even been there. Seen enough footage to know that it's someplace I'd rather not go. So you're scared of a simple raid. Dabai raised one arm from behind his head and pointed his index at her. You're not getting me with that kindergarten baiting tactic. It's an S rank. No one could blame me for not going. Hem, stooping low enough to try and kill a kid and then two chicken to even join me for a raid. Ryukyu shrugged on her hero uniform, as Dabai's expression remained unchanged and she sighed. Come with me and I'll find an excuse for you to punch Endeavor. Before she could even finish her sentence, he was up and throwing on a shirt. Geez, no need to twist my arm like that. Kayu, Izuku threw a right hook, taking off the head of an intermediate angel like it was nothing. They've gotten to about high C rank, which means I was right about their power increasing as the floors went on. After defeating a certain number of angels, Izuku was given a dropped item. Item, Entry Permit. Item Class, Type, A Permit to Enter the Second Floor of the Heavenly Palace. Usable in Floor Movement Magic Circle on First Floor. By now, Izuku had received the 49th Floor's permit to move on to the 50th Floor. At first he figured every 10 or so floors would show him some sort of crazy boss monster, but then he passed the first 10 floors with no problem, then the next 25, then the 30th. Apprehension became replaced with boredom as Izuku's army tore through floor after floor at a frightening pace. Dominator's touch skill level has risen. Izuku had only seen those two messages as he continued to make his way to the massive pillar of light that signified the floor movement magic. It was only the second time he had leveled up since entering the gate. A full two days had passed and he was seeming to make some decent progress. But if there are truly 100 floors to this dungeon and if he didn't increase his pace of soul collection, he wouldn't be able to finish the quest within the next five days. If the 50th floor doesn't have something special, then I know this dungeon is just kinda a joke. Maybe the quest rewards are the real goal here, not the completion of the tower. Izuku's belief was cast away. However, as he entered the 49th floor's magic circle and was introduced to the 50th floor, that's a mouthful. Izuku said as he looked to the massive creature a couple of hundred meters away. Sitting lazily on a throne was a humanoid figure with a body like a lion's. Thick fur covered its body and its hands and feet ended in talons and claws as long as Izuku was tall. Unlike the previous angels Izuku had encountered, this one had a face of some sort, a golden ring of light hovering above it. He described it as a face of some sort because for whatever reason, Izuku couldn't pin down any features. He knew it had the distinguishing qualities of a face, but every time the memory attempted to enter his mind, the cherub's face morphed and whatever he had seen was lost. Standing up, two sets of eagle-like wings spread from its back and flicking its wrist, a whip of fiery light appeared in his hand. High-leveled angels rushed Izuku and his army, gleaming white armor adorning their body. These ones are probably closer to B-rank, but it still doesn't matter. Even if my level hasn't been rising all that much, the level of my shadows has been increasing at a decent rate. They'll take care of these guys like they're nothing and then we can focus the big bat. Igris, Hayo, and Tank did just that, slashing through seven of elite guards before the rest of the shadow soldiers even had a chance to attack. Activating stealth, Izuku prepared himself to face the cherub head-on and buy time for his soldiers to join him. But oddly enough, the hybrid angel seemingly refused to move, completely emotionless to the slaughtering of his forces. Then maybe I'll just wait until the rest of the guards are. Prey's idly beating wings suddenly flapped with enough force to topple a building, expelling a mass of white flames. Tank, the attack's power is too high. 
Skill, Defender has failed. Tusk, the High Orc Sorcerer's Hymn of Protection appeared just in front of Izuku, shielding him and Igris from the enormous waves of heat. Unfortunately, the rest of his forces were wiped out with that singular blow. Obviously, they could regenerate, but such a huge blow was not ideal. Charidus Cherub Cray's skill, periodic cleansing is on cooldown. It looks like his skill avoided all of the other angels, which means I can't wait for him to wipe out his own forces. Izuku turned around to face Tusk, who was still holding up the barrier, waiting for his liege's next command. And I don't know how long the cooldown is for that skill, so I've gotta finish this now. Inventory. Item, Orb of Avarice. Item class, S. Item type, Artifact. The strength of all magic is doubled when held. As Izuku handed the blood red orb to Tusk, he called back all of his shadows, thankful that they didn't need to run to him to fade back into his shadow. Instead, they simply disappeared in whatever position they were in, leaving the other angels to stumble forward, wondering where their opponents had gone. With Tusk behind Izuku, and Igris the only other shadow remaining, Izuku smirked, you know what to do Tusk. With all those buffs, Tusk increased his damage with frenzy, combustion, and strengthening and by increasing his size, he was effectively upping the area of effect for when he used. Tusk mirrored Kray's explosive blast of fire, scorching the earth and swallowing every single angel in an orange inferno, leaving just the boss. However, he would not go down without a fight. The fiery attack had obscured Izuku's view, so he was unable to see the light whip fly through the air and slice off Tusk's head in one motion. Hey, Izuku yelled to the boss as the fire faded, he's new. Sprint LV. 3 has activated, appearing just in front of the cherub's impossible face. Izuku clenched his fist and threw a punch, give him a break. As Tusk regenerated, Kray went flying backwards, crashing through at least three buildings as he did so. Standing back up, he emitted a high-pitched warbling noise and thrashed its arm, causing its whip to move like a snake and launch its head for Izuku. Tank, Izuku said calmly, calling back his army from his shadow. The white whip collided with the Namo. But instead of cutting through him like it did with Tusk, it stopped short, gripped in his arms. Passive skill, shock absorption. Shadow Nama will take 99% reduced damage from blunt attacks and 50% reduced damage from any magic type attacks. Thanks, now just hold on to that for me. Izuku shot past Tank, Igris and Hayo running alongside him. Tank did one better and used his massive strength to rip the whip out of Kray's hands altogether. Flicking forwards the eight knives, Izuku pinned the cherub's wings against the building behind him, hoping that it would prevent his flame ability from activating. Hayo formed two massive ice blades in his hand, and Igris wielded his shadow sword, throwing the angel's demonic wing sword to Izuku, rearming him. Feeling himself grow bigger and stronger, he knew that Tusk was buffing the trio. Kray tugged against the daggers still pinning him. Normally, they'd break off from the building behind him from such extreme force, but Izuku was using Dominator's touch and the telekinetic control of the daggers to keep him pinned. As he noticed the three approaching, his warble became more of a roar and reaching behind himself, he tore away his own wings, a spray of white life force spurting from his back. Izuku's eyes widened in amazement at Kray's pain tolerance, but just because he respected the angel didn't mean he'd stop. The cherub's palm flew forwards, intending to squish Izuku under it but Igris jumped in front of his liege, using his shadow sword to bisect the limb completely, racing up it like he would a mild slow. Hayo followed closely behind, throwing both ice swords into the place on Kray's face where you would find eyes, drawing another roar of pain from the angel. Its free hand went to slap it where it saw Hayo last, but Igris vaulted off his right arm, slashing through the left at the tricep and effectively crippling it for Izuku to make the perfect stab, piercing its heart. Collected heavenly souls, 3,021 10,000. I guess Kray counted as more than one soul. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Kray's body slumped back into the building he had been pinned against, white light leaking from his body as blood. Izuku pulled his sword from the angel's heart and lobbed the weapon back to Igris, who accepted it gratefully. At the same time, he noticed a few pillars of light behind him. Oh, some new items. Finally, some armor. I've been missing these things since I lost my shadow steel set. You obtained item, Kray's tail. Izuku held out the whip in his right hand with an apprehensive gaze. I'm not even sure I know how to use one of these. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku did his best to mimic Kray's arm movement and accidentally sent the whip flying through a building, cutting it completely in half. Maybe I'll just leave that in my inventory for now. You obtained Kray's wings. Just a simple material drop. You obtained ingredient item, World Tree's Fragment. Item, World Tree's Fragment. Item class. Item type, Ingredient. A piece of wood extracted from the wooden grip of Kray's whip, which was created from the World Tree's branch. Woods from the World Tree contain powerful magic and thus are used as ingredients for magic items of the highest quality. Highest quality huh? 
Guess I'll save it until I can find something to do with it. Izuku turned to look at Tusk, who was still gazing at the orb of avarice like it was solid gold. Speaking of highest quality, that thing sure does work. Magic type hunters would lose it over something like that. I could probably buy a mansion selling that thing. He pushed the thought to the back of his mind, deciding instead to focus on his other new item. Item, Olympian chestplate. Item class, S. Item type, armor. Plus 50 strength. Plus 35 vitality. Set effect will activate if this item is equipped along with Olympian armor pieces. Set effect 1. Set effect 2. Set effect 3. Well well, it looks like the shadow steel armor has met its match. 50 strength is crazy. Level, 91. Strength, 209. Vitality, 146. Agility, 142. Intelligence, 161. Sense, 123. HP, 34,982 over 34,982. Shadows able to be extracted, 184. Shadows able to be saved, 143. Nine levels away from 100. I wonder if I'll stop growing at that point. Oh well, only one more thing to do now. He walked back to the corpse of Cray, pausing just in front of it. Arise. Extraction has failed. You have two attempts remaining. Arise. Extraction has failed. You have one attempt remaining. To CH. Is it because he was stronger than me? I did need Igris, Hayo, and the doubled buff from Tusk to beat him after all. Izuku sighed, okay. One more time, with feeling. He held his hand out to Cray, arise. Extraction has failed. The soul will no longer be able to be extracted. Seriously? He shook his head. I guess it is the first time an extraction has failed, so I should be grateful it took me this long to encounter it. The rest of the angel guards were still pretty weak in comparison to his other shadows. So Izuku decided to take only 10 of them instead of filling up his remaining slots. Instead of the normal blue and black of most of his shadows, the angel shadows, like the high orcs, had a different color scheme. Theirs was one of black and white. By now, Izuku had a total of 131 shadows, with 12 spare save slots, yawning and stretching his arms high into the air. Izuku realized he had basically been fighting for two days straight. Opening his inventory he pulled out a small sleeping bag. Guard me while I sleep. If there's anything you can't handle, wake me. The army kneeled to him. Their heads bowed as he passed into unconsciousness, certain that he'd be completely fine. Upon waking, Izuku had found that his soul count had risen from 3,000 to nearly 4,000. You guys must have been busy. Sorry for troubling you. Igris shook his head, saying nothing out loud. But by this point, Izuku could practically hear his thoughts. No my liege, it is our honor to be trusted with your safety. Izuku clapped Igris on the shoulder and hopped onto Smokey's back. All right team. We've got the floor permit. Let's move out. The shadow bear shot forwards, far surpassing the speed of any commercial vehicle as he rushed towards the pillar of light that signified the next floor. Another day and a half had passed by the point Izuku reached floor 75. His soul count had surpassed 9,000 as the difficulty and number of angels steadily increased. The growth had been exponential, which explained why he gained so much progress with so few floors compared to the first 50. The only growth that hadn't been exponential was his level count, which had stopped just after ticking over to level 92 on floor 64. After floor 57, Izuku had actually decided to experiment with Igris's weapons and took the angel's demonic wing off of him in exchange for Kray's tail. The effect was immediately noticeable. Now he had a bit of range to him with the whip, but still had his shadow sword for close combat. <laughs> Item class, S. Item type, whip. Plus 200 attack. Forged from concentrated light and the branch of the world tree. This whip is capable of slicing through nearly anything. Plus 50 attack when dealing with undead creatures. Emerging from the light of the 74th floor's magic circle, Izuku had a sense of deja vu as he looked over a massive boss villain. However, unlike Kray, this one was not humanoid. The dragon was actually a brilliant white worm. Unlike typical dragons or wyverns, a worm had no wings and instead undulated through the air like a serpent. It was nearly as long as an office building was tall and had four legs, each with their own set of razor-sharp talons that could cut through solid steel. Nice big target, Izuku remarked as a few hundred angels materialized around it and started rushing the shadow army. Tusk, clear a path, him of the fire dragon. A burning red draconic head appeared just above Tusk's head opening its mouth to spit out a long stream of heat. It tore through the sky, searing dozens of the angels every second before they caught on and split up into every conceivable direction to avoid the blast. Just like the fight with Kray, Izuku, Igris, and Hayo were rushing the boss, allowing the rest of the army to handle the minions. Although, this time, they had Tank running with them. Saryu seemingly had no problem facing the four of them alone however and the angels overhead continued to ignore them. The reason for this was revealed moments later when its mouth pulled open 
revealing several dozen rows of teeth and an unending void of light at the back of its throat. Hayo, an ice mountain, stretching towards the heavens, appeared out of nowhere, far surpassing the height and width of the surrounding buildings. Hayo's cryokinetic abilities seemed to grow in strength alongside his level. Unfortunately, it still was nothing next to the boss's attack, as if it was some sort of solid structure. The light flowing from Seriyu's mouth shattered the ice wall instead of melting through it. Scatter, Izuku yelled, turning on his stealth and disappearing into the alleyways of one of the buildings. Seriyu's blast tracing towards him. As he continued to stampede through the all-too-clean gap in buildings, Izuku began to feel a bit of heat licking at his back. Knowing that the attack was gaining on him, despite him being hidden, he started vaulting off the walls, getting higher and higher. Eventually, instead of touching the wall, his feet made contact with the gravel on one of the roofs. From there he could see the whole situation. Seriu's beam attack had stopped after receiving a lash to the cheek from Igris's new whip, though its description said it could cut through almost anything. Izuku was still shocked by the fact that it had gouged such a deep crevice into the worm's face. In a rage, its tail swung around, slapping at the area Igris was in. Not only did it completely ravage his body with its scales, but it continued onwards, carrying him into a building that crumbled like sand under Seriu's weight. Seriu flinched back as a long-range fire beam struck the center of its body. Tusk had noticed the battle going poorly and did his best to aim for the head. But the distance was too far and the angels attacking him were simply too numerous to get a good shot. Of course, for the worm, the distance was no problem and light began to escape its maw as it aimed for the high orc. Thankfully, Tank and Izuku were in perfect sync. While Igris and Tusk had kept their opponent occupied, Tank and Izuku had run along the rooftops, getting as close as possible before vaulting off the roof, each with a fist aimed straight for its jaw. The immense force shut its jaw like a pneumatic press, the light exploding inside the enclosed space, nearly shaking off Izuku, who had kept himself latched on by jamming the angel's demonic wing into the flesh of its chin. Smoke rose from its burnt mouth and it was too busy trying to clear the annoyance from its eyes to notice Izuku scaling his way up the mouth. Using the juggled blades, he created foot and handholds along its face. Once on its neck back he stored the juggled blades in the inventory and pulled back out the long sword, raising it high and stabbing into the space just above the eyes, presumably into the brain. Seriu obviously didn't like that and Izuku could tell its serpent-like body was about to start bucking all over the place. Hayo wasn't about to let that happen and for the second time, he sent a wall of ice racing to smother most of the worm's body, freezing it in place for Izuku. Silently thanking the autonomous nature of his shadows, Izuku heaved as hard as he could against the longsword, dragging it across Seriu's back, cutting open a street-wide gash that spilled light blood like a river. As it grew weak from blood loss, it raised its head for one last blast of light, but Igris was in a bit of a bad mood after being slammed into a building. Leaping from the wreckage, he flicked the light whip, splitting the scaly face down the middle, killing it instantly. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Heavenly souls stored in the belly of Seriu have been discovered. You received x220 heavenly souls. You obtained item, Olympian leggings. You obtained ingredient item, spring water of the echoing forest. Item, Olympian leggings. Item class, S. Item type, armor. Plus 35 agility. Set effect will activate if this item is equipped along with. Olympian armor pieces. Set effect 1, plus 5 all stats. Set effect 2. Set effect 3. Normal quest. Collect heavenly souls has been completed. Izuku nodded to himself. I'll look you over in one second. I've got something important to do. Placing both of his palms on the cold dead scales of Seriyu he whispered, Arise. The ice lining its body shuddered and cracked as dark energies leaked from its body and a shadow began to form in the sky above the corpse. Well how about that? Izuku said with a smile. It looks like I've got my very own dragon. Normal quest. Collect heavenly souls has been completed. As Izuku's new shadow soldier, a black and white worm, a serpent-like dragon he had named Karkinos, circled overhead. He looked over his quest rewards. 1. Item of your choosing from the store. 2. Plus 20 bonus stats. 3. Hidden reward. Accept reward 1. Please choose an item. The store page opened in front of Izuku, giving him a list of items that listed their costs in gold. Some of the middle tier items seemed to be in the hundreds of millions, but the true treasures cost upwards of hundreds of billions. What should I choose? Izuku plopped down to take a seat as he scrolled through the list, considering each and every possible option. He wanted something that he wouldn't end up selling back to the store or to a real-world vendor. I've been earning some pretty good weapons from just clearing dungeons. So is this even worth it? Izuku paused for a moment, beginning to consider something and scrolled all the way to the bottom of the list seeing a blessed random box. It had been sitting in the store ever since Izuku had picked the cursed random box after doubling his daily quest requirement. No matter what he did, Izuku couldn't find a way to purchase it, but now... Blessed random box. Izuku disliked the idea of choosing something that could essentially be anything. 
but the cursed random box had provided him with access to the heavenly palace, so this must be as good, right? Item. Item class. Item type. Huh. No name. No class. Not even a type. Izuku stared down at a black, ornate and oddly shaped key. It held no description or hints as to its use. Sighing, he shoved it into his inventory. I'm sure I'll find a use for it one day. Except reward too. Hmm. I keep approaching my shadow save limit, so I guess I'll put it all into intelligence. Level, 93. Strength, 217. Vitality, 154. Agility, 185. Intelligence, 169. Sense, 131. HP, 37,942 over 37,942. Shadows able to be extracted, 225. Shadows able to be saved, 183. I guess that's all that exponential growth starting to kick in again. Except reward 3. Hidden reward, recipe. Holy water of life, a recipe. When did this RPG turn into a crafting game? Squeezing the rough parchment paper in his hands, he caused it to disintegrate and prompt him with another item display. Item, Holy Water of Life. Item class, S. Type, Consumable. A mysterious potion that can cure any disease with powerful magic. The effect will only take place when the entire bottle has been consumed. Required items. World Trees Fragment. Spring Water of the Echoing Forest. Purified Blood of the Seraph. Izuku took a moment to simply stare at the system screen. We're reading its words to ensure he understood it properly, Any Disease. His eyes narrowed and he closed the prompt, gesturing to the rest of his shadow forces, forget slowing down for rest. We're marching onwards. Double time. Above him in the sky, Carquinos roared in approval, swooping low to collect his liege. It's no longer about getting as many kills as we can. It's about tearing this place down as fast as possible. Izuku stepped up onto the head of Carquinos. You don't have to worry anymore, mom. I'll be your hero. Why the hell are we meeting here? Dabai asked as he strolled into the Agency Association's training hall, trailing just behind Rukyu. Because patches, someone yelled out as the hallway opened up into a massive room. The Koreans want to check us out. Dabai shot the source of the shout, Maruko, a confused glance. The Koreans. Yeah. A grizzled voice said as Dabai bumped into the chest of an all-too-sturdy man, the Korean. Looking up, Dabai met the orange eyes of a slightly beastly Korean man, who, despite his threatening tone and appearance, was attempting to hold out a hand to greet the two new arrivals, Bi Kyun Ho. Ryukyu stepped in front of her, boyfriend to take his hand and introduce herself. And this is Dabai, another S-rank friend of mine. You brought that fool. Endeavor shouted from the second floor, which overlooked the sparring center, leaping down the entire distance like it was a step. He got in Ryukyu's face. This man is only going to be a liability in the field. Beak pushed himself between the two. Hold on now, he said with a strong accent. Thankfully, his Japanese was sufficient. We estimate that the number of Namu has increased exponentially since the last raid. We'll need every able man we can get, especially any other AoE types. A beautiful woman with short blonde hair similarly made sure that Dabai wouldn't do anything rash. Besides, this raid is no longer just about recovering the island or preventing the Namu from reaching the mainland. It's now brought an innocent girl with untapped potential into the mix. The woman then proceeded to whisper to Dabai. And any enemy of Endeavor is a friend of mine. Dabai smiled. Cha he and I'm guessing. She took a few steps back and bowed low. I gotta give you credit for kicking my old man's ass. It ended in a draw. Endeavor emphasized doing his best to act professionally amongst his colleagues. Hey so I noticed you brought most of the ten here. But where the hell is All Might? If we're going all out for this thing, you'd think he'd be important. Oh, he he. Sorry about that. A blonde boy with a UA school uniform ran over. All Might said he couldn't participate, so he sent me as his stand-in, Mirio Tagata. A schoolboy. I didn't get a chance to get my hero costume from the school in my rush over, so I look a little unimpressive. But I promise you, I can fill his shoes. Kid, I don't think you understand how big those shoes are. Maruko finally hopped away from the bench she had been using to stretch and walked over. It's true. He gave Blondie here a run for her money. Be Blondie. He and asked. Dabai sized up Mirio once more. He had felt an insane amount of mana pouring off he and but he barely felt any from Mirio, which meant he was likely a physical type. All right then, kid, let's go a few rounds. Do you really think now is a proper time to be messing around? Choi Jong-in, Korea's ultimate soldier, said through a translator. When else are the strongest from Korea and the strongest from Japan gonna have a chance to go at each other? Hawks responded. Besides, it's not like the raid is gonna happen today or tomorrow. We still have to wait a full two days for all the Navy and other preparations. I say let him go at each other. Floor 80 was a cakewalk, but Izuku still found himself prompted with two windows. Izuku immediately crushed the stone. 50% is pretty damn good. 
Quest, Normal Quest, Collect Heavenly Souls. Part 2. God's Finest Servant, the Seraph Lucifer, resides at the highest floor of the Heavenly Palace. Kill him and collect his perfected soul. Quest Completion Requirement. Defeat the Strongest Angel, Lucifer. Rewards. 1. Highest Quality Runestone. 2. Plus 30 Bonus Stats. 3. Hidden Reward. The Top Floor Huh. I bet I'll find him at 100. He looked over his shadow army. Alright, it's becoming inefficient to move as one army, so I think I'll split you up into teams. We need to find those entry permits as fast as possible. Smokey, Tusk, Tank, Igris, Hayo, and Carquinos each led their own teams, immediately dispersing from Izuku to kill as many angels as possible and recover the permit. Initially, he had been afraid that Carquinos would be far too beastly to lead a team or take proper orders, but like Smokey, he performed just as well as his peers. I guess that just goes to show how much more effective a shadow is if it's a grade higher. It's gonna be a bloodbath when Igris hits that grade. He's only a few levels away after all. A. And, real quick, Captain Grade is a grade I made up to put some distance between Elite Knight and Commander Grade. Although, unlike the past few floors, where it only took him an hour at most to recover the floor permit, he had been stuck on floor 85 for nearly two hours now. Could there be some sort of boss villain that's hiding from me? Mana, 10,247-12,240. 2,000 mana in an instant. Izuku turned his attention to where he sends Smokey's team. Whatever is attacking them, it's tearing them apart like it's nothing. I guess I've got no choice. Izuku made the snap decision to recall all of Smokey's team as his mana dropped to 8,000. Another two hours later, Izuku was becoming more and more frustrated. After recalling Smokey's team, Igris had been attacked. Then Hayo, doing his best to visualize the formation his shadows were in, Izuku realized that in order to attack Igris's team and then Hayo's, they would have had to skip over Tusk and Tank. Does that mean the enemy isn't strong enough to take them down? Karkinos hasn't been attacked yet either. Though it wouldn't be wrong to say that in terms of raw power he outpaces every other shadow soldier, myself included. Izuku clapped his hands together. Alright then, it looks like I've got some bait for him. Hiding in one of the divine office buildings with his stealth, Izuku watched over the street that Smokey and his team stomped down. All of his other shadows had been recalled, meaning the only possible option for attack would be Smokey's team. He was arguably the weakest of all the shadow leaders, so it made sense for him to be the bait. Oh, they're here. A flock of angel knights dropped out of the sky. Their two sets of feathery wings working in perfect harmony to lower them safely to the ground. Unlike most of the other angels, which simply attacked him without armor and rarely with weapons, these angels were decked out to the nines. Their armor was beautifully crafted and perfectly interlocked to form an impenetrable guard. They carried similarly crafted long spears. Ornately formed with specially designed shapes that would make any spear-wielding hero back on earth drool over them. The first angel dashed forwards, their wings giving them a burst of speed. Using his spear more like a sword, he cut all the way through Smokey's torso, bisecting him at his thickest area. It was a pretty insane display of strength, especially considering that Smokey should be around in a rank by now. Well, there's no reason to wait any longer. Izuku leapt through the window, shattering the crystal clear glass and disabling his stealth as he crashed down on top of one of the angel knights, killing them instantly. Another four rushed him as Tusk, Igris, Karkinos and the rest of the shadows emerged from Izuku to handle the others. He killed those four with barely a wasted motion. Looks like they were just enough to get me to level 95. Within 20 seconds, only the lead angel knight was remaining, their four wings and the rest of its body trembling as Izuku stalked towards them. I've been curious for a while now, so thanks for answering my question. It looks like angels can feel emotions. Izuku pulled out his longsword. I'm really not a fan of killing someone who doesn't want to fight, so if you have over the floor permit, I'll leave this place without harming you. Izuku realized the proposition sounded somewhat hollow, as he had just mercilessly murdered the rest of the angels' team, but he had yet to see a villain that truly displayed fear, so he figured he'd give them an out, noticing that the angel was still considering whether or not to try attacking him and that they seemed a higher rank than the other knights he had just killed, he cranked up his bloodlust. The beautiful spear dropped from the knight's hands and they fell to their knees. Please forgive me. I was in the wrong. I'll give you the permit. That voice. Izuku relaxed his stance. Take off your helmet. The angel acquiesced, a long and thick braid of golden hair spilling out to hang next to her perfectly sculpted face. Izuku's eyebrows raised. She has a face. So far, the only angel I've encountered that had anything close to a real face was Kray and that barely counts. Please forgive me. She repeated, her blue eyes, accentuated by a blue eyeshadow on her eyelids, dancing between the dark and powerful forces surrounding her. It is the duty of my clan to defend this floor at all costs, and not allow any intruders to exist. Clans, just how detailed and immersive is this dungeon? 
Izuku nodded, realizing that this girl was likely at the mercy of whatever voice compelled other villains to kill all humans. I won't kill you as long as you don't give me a reason. I understand, she said, still on her knees, you seek the entry permit. If you deliver me safely back to my home, I can procure it. Tusk. The high orc held one hand over his chest and bowed his head slightly before aiming a finger at the angel girl, using gravitation magic to lift her into the air and bring her right up into Izuku's face. As she got closer and closer, Izuku could tell a slight blush was forming on her face, but he ignored it and turned his bloodlust from a 5 all the way up to 11. How do I know? The color drained from her already pale features and her eyes became pinpricks as she went into a flight or fight response, but she couldn't move anywhere with Tusk holding her perfectly still. That I can trust you. Izuku's eyes leaked glowing emerald light, and his figure became enshrouded in shadows from the girl's point of view. I I I wasn't lying. The angels are not allowed to dd deceive. Tusk allowed her to fall back to the ground as Izuku let up on the pressure and gave her a smile. Fine. Help me get the permit and I'll leave here peacefully. T thank you. She wiped at her eyes. A few tears had leaked out. So, what should I call you? She stood on shaky legs, scooping up her spear and helmet, gripping them tightly to try and stop the trembling. I am Lady Essel, eldest daughter of the Raider clan. So, do you have a voice in your head, telling you to kill all humans? Hum. Essel tilted her head as he looked up, contemplating the question. Well no, but we do have another type of voice that tells us to protect the area we reside in. How long have you heard the voice for? The moment we opened our eyes. Opened their eyes. Does that mean they were somewhere else before being put here? Taking his time to formulate his next question he asked, Then, where were you before you opened your eyes here? The angel world. She said matter-of-factly, there was no warning, we simply appeared here. What were you doing in that realm? Essel's face became blank, her eyes unfocused suddenly, war. We were preparing for, war, war, against what? It was, it was. Essel's voice became almost full of static. You have surpassed the allowed amount of information. The conversation will be interrupted. Damn, I guess the system really doesn't want me learning too much. Oh well, I guess I shouldn't try to push it too far. Izuku called back his shadows, so... Where's this home of yours? Ugh. Dabai was thrown to the ground hard enough to dent the concrete floor and knock the wind from his lungs. Maruko and Hawks belted out a laugh as he waved off Mirio's hand up. Ow. All right. You can be All Might for now. Great. Min Byung Jayu. An S-rank healer said, clapping his hands together. Now that that's settled, may we be graced with the whereabouts of All Might. B. Kyohun smiled and slapped his friend on the back. What's with the Shakespearean? Min. Shakesp. Bayang Jayu shook his head. This is why I'm becoming an English teacher and you aren't. That suits me just fine. Mirio thought for a moment. Well, All Might didn't tell me exactly what was going on. But he did say that he was searching for two people. Sukachi and Izuku Midoriya, Ryukyu said, quite confident in her guess. The student shrugged. That's what I would assume. Sukachi. I don't think I recognize that name. Izuku Midoriya sounds familiar though. Oh, he and cried out. Was he one of the students participating at the UA Sports Festival? He got stuck in that red gate right. Whatever happened to him? And why is All Might out looking for him? Mirio shrugged a second time. All Might will be All Might. He's always had some strange interests in certain people. And Tsukachi is a friend of his that went completely missing. Totally off the grid. So I'm sure you can guess the reason for that particular search. He and noticed that her question about Izuku was not answered. But she let it go as Endeavor scanned over their group of heroes and proposed a sparring match between all of the S ranks there, just to test everyone out. Yeah, I think I'll sit then out. Damn I replied. Going over to rest on the bench Maruko had been using to stretch. Everyone here is an S rank, myself included. But that doesn't mean we're all at the same level. That Mirio boy. He seems too strong. Could he actually be a match for All Might? Though Izuku now had Essel guiding him towards her home. They were still beset by waves of angelic enemies. Apparently, those base angels, the ones with no face, attacked anyone indiscriminately. Even other angels or angel knights like Essel. Of course, it was barely a hindrance to Izuku and Essel, who rode Karkinos through the sky, heading for a gleaming white palace. How about that? A heavenly palace inside a heavenly palace. Since Karkinos was a massive target and an easily perceived threat, Izuku and Essel decided to enter on foot, greeted by another guard, who responded to Essel's question about the location of her father. Lady Essel, he's currently in the throne room. But, I must ask, who is that man behind you? Essel didn't back down in the face of the massive and imposing guard. He's someone of utmost importance, so treat him as you would treat any guest. As they strolled into the throne room, Izuku found himself looking around, noticing all the qualities of a boss fight. Had I fought my way here, there's no way this wouldn't be the final bout. I feel like I got given a dialogue prompt and chose the pacifist run. Is that a good thing or a bad thing though? 
Izuku was so caught up in his own thoughts he barely noticed Essel's father, another angel with divinely handsome features, recoil at his presence. ESIO, how could you bring someone like him here? No guest brings an army hidden in his shadow. Hum, so he can see Igris and the others. That's interesting. His thoughts remained calm as the throne room guards leveled their blades at his neck. There's no need for any fighting. I promised Essel I would leave her peacefully if you handed over the floor permit to me. Essel's father paused, realizing that Izuku was the one who had been climbing the floors recently, killing Kray and Seryu in the process. He's not someone we can fight, is he? The entry permit. Is that all you truly want from us? Izuku paused for a moment. Well, actually I do need a guide, so I'd like to borrow Essel for a while longer. Izuku once again ignored the blush appearing on the angel girl's face. Essel's father asked Izuku to partake in a meal while they talked over everything. It had gone quite well, though Izuku was surprised when the elder angel requested that above all, Essel remain safe. Izuku assured the father that he would not allow her to partake in any battles and that he would protect her. Essel's face again grew hot at such a declaration, but Izuku didn't notice at this time. Emerging from the magic circle on the 86th floor and being greeted by the massive castle of the next angel clan, Izuku was confused as Essel knelt down, taking off her backpack and removing some special bottle of alcohol. My father prepared gifts for each of the clans so that negotiations would go more smoothly. Negotiations. Izuku stopped in his march towards the castle. He had spared Essel because she had surrendered, but the truth was, he didn't have time to enact the same discussion with each and every clan, sorry, but there won't be any time for talking. I'll be back. You're going to kill them all. I hope you aren't acquainted with them. And no, Essel answered, in fact, we're on bad terms with every single clan in the tower, but I'm just wondering why you bothered to talk with my clan but not the others. Izuku shrugged, I'm not sure. Maybe you're just special. Hey, for now, just wait here, I'll be done soon. Level, 99. Strength, 223. Vitality, 160. Agility, 191. Intelligence, 175. Sense, 137. HP, 45,195 over 45,195. Shadows able to be extracted, 260. Shadows able to be saved, 201. How apt. I've reached level 99 just as I completed floor 99. Igris and Smokey both increased their grade. Igris is now at Captain Grade and Smokey is at Elite Knight Grade. School starts back up in only a couple of hours. I'll have to be quick with the 100th floor. Then again, I haven't slept in quite some time. I'll need rest once I get back. I can always miss just one day right. After all, I've been training pretty hard during my days off. Izuku turned to Essel. It looks like it's time for you to go back to your floor. Floor 100 is apparently home to an insanely strong enemy. I've noticed sharper and sharper increases in difficulty since climbing up these last five floors. I'm not sure even I can guarantee your safety for floor 100. So then, I'm no longer useful to you. Izuku frowned at her depressed tone and laid a hand on her shoulder. You've helped me a ton. But what comes next? You don't need to put yourself in that sort of danger. He sighed. Your father asked me to keep you safe, and the safest place for you now would be your own floor. Essel shook her head. No, I want to come with you. I want to see the final outcome of your battle. Izuku scratched the back of his head. What if something happens to you? Think about your father. Izuku normally wasn't prone to worrying about promises he made with villains, but these villains were closer to humans than some heroes he had met. I'm happy to know you care that much about me. Essel began. Okay, you're making it sound way too serious. But you can't control what I do and if I get hurt because of my own choices, then my father can't blame you. Besides, I trust you to protect me. Izuku sighed once more, but nodded, all right then, it's up to you. And with that, the two of them entered the magic circle and moved on to the 100th floor. Two hours after Izuku entered the 100th floor of the Heavenly Palace, Korea and Japan boarded their respective team's helicopters, all of which were headed for one place. Jeju Island, the fourth Shai Hasekai raid, with nearly 20 S-rank heroes heading for the raid, no one could have predicted just how wrong it would go. 2 KDX-111 destroyers, 2 KDX-IV destroyers, 4 DDH-975 destroyers, 1 DDH-971, and 12 frigates were all deployed near the north side of Jeju Island. All of them carried heroes of some type, and all were meant to handle any of the Namu that tried to escape the island. Inside one of the helicopters that was deploying the S-rank heroes, Cha Hien, Beek Yohun, Ma Dong Wook, a massive man with matching strength, Choi Jong In, Korea's ultimate soldier, Lim Ti Jiao, an archer, and Min Byung Jiao, their healer, were joined by Mirio Takata and Maruko, both of which had insisted on joining the main assault team. I never understood the whole hero name thing, Hien said to Maruko who smiled wide at the girl five years her senior. 
Well from what I hear, even you Koreans have some names. I I don't undurst. Maruko lightly punched Hien's arm. Come on dancer, don't hide it. Hien's face went bright red and she had to resist the urge to hide herself away. She had earned the title of Blade Dancer or Just Dancer from those who had seen her fight. But because she was greatly embarrassed by the title, the head of her agency had banned the usage of it amongst their employees. Unfortunately for Hien, the name appeared to have leaked out. I appreciate you joining us, Maruko, but I'd prefer if you didn't distract one of our most powerful fighters. Heh, sorry. That's what my guild does with each member before a dangerous raid. It typically distracts them from the fact that they could lose their lives to otherworldly villains. Nirio rested a hand on Maruko's shoulder, giving her a somewhat stern look and interrupting the conversation. You can call me Lemillion while we're on mission. Since we're about to drop, I figured we should go over the battle plan. The main reason the past raids on Jeju failed was because of the boss villain, a human type nicknamed Overhaul. His magic involved breaking down anything he touched to a molecular level, instantly killing them. It was for that reason that physical types were at such a disadvantage in his presence, which is why I'll engage him up front while the rest of you make sure I can divert my full power to him. Beak shifted uncomfortably in his seat across from the cameraman, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can allow someone your age to handle that burden alone. Mirio flashed him a blinding smile. It's okay, with my quirk, there's no way he can touch me, I'm the best choice. And besides, All Might is entrusting me with everyone's safety while he's gone. If that means I have to fight him, then I'll gladly do it. Jeez kid, you better not die on us. The world needs more people like you. Oh, looks like the Japanese teams are in position. One of the helicopter pilots called out. This is Endeavor, all points check in. Endeavor held a hand up to his ear as Gang Orca came to a stop next to him, signaling this was their spot. Hawks and Musha are in position. Genist, Crust, and Fat Gum all set. Rukiu, Dabai, and Edshot are raring to go. I still have no idea how you talked me into helping, Kaiyu. Ryukyu chuckled. I promised you the opportunity to punch Endeavor in the face, remember. All points begin operation. Unleash it all. From the helicopter, a massive burst of magical energy could be felt from all four points. All right people, that's the signal. Be called out. Japan's heroes will be able to hold that aggro for about an hour, so let's get this done. Hey camera guy. Maruko yelled out as they were about to leap out of the helicopter into the hollowed out mountain that had become filled with Namu tunnels. Just so you know, we're here to eliminate the boss and kill the Namu type that's producing all of their offspring. Protecting you isn't included in that mission. He nodded, gripping his sword, I may not look like much, but I am in a rank. As they leaped out, Choi clearing a path with his insane fiery powers, the navy activated their own special equipment, an electric jamming satellite that blanketed the island in a signal that cut off any communications between the Namu, as most of them had some sort of way to talk to one another or their queen. Well, let's get started. Choi placed his hand on the ground, spawning a couple dozen balls of fire that danced around the hundred different tunnelways. It took him only a few moments to stand once more and start down a pathway. They encountered the odd Namu creature here and there, dispatching it without much difficulty. But upon reaching a massive hollowed-out cave, they were greeted with a real sight to behold. Rows and rows of hundreds, if not thousands of pure black, slime-looking embryos. Unlike most other creatures, Namus were not born from eggs or from a womb. Instead, their goopy, yet-to-develop bodies were simply plopped out anywhere the queen desired and they grew from that. It was rather disgusting. Well well well, after taking the girl, I was wondering when the next attack would be. Frankly, I'm disappointed, a guttural and raspy voice said, directing everyone's attention up to an outcropping of rock, where a man with two normal human arms and two dark unnatural arms rested, I suppose I should introduce myself. I am over Hull, and you're all my prey. Six hours earlier, Izuku emerged onto the 100th floor of the Heavenly Palace. It was quite beautiful, a peaceful garden with blooming flowers and a bright blue sky. Asil and Izuku remained in place for a moment before realizing nothing was going to attack them right out of the gate and they cautiously began strolling through the greenery, eventually coming to a plaza of sorts, a quiet and calm fountain spewing out water. It was so relaxing that had Izuku not known this was floor 100 of a dangerous dungeon, he would have laid down in the grass and taken a nap. Thankfully, he knew better and as he exited from the slight thicket of trees that obscured a bit of the sky, he was grateful that he had not gotten pulled in. Hovering just above the fountain was a purely white being. His armor was completely unlike anything Izuku had seen so far. It was as detailed and as finely crafted as Essel's, but it didn't have the same sense of uniqueness he had seen in the other sets of armor. Three sets of wings hung behind him motionless, seemingly having no impact on his levitation. He only had an upper half, the area below his torso fading into a milky white fog of sorts that was attached to him. His hands were pressed palm to palm in front of his face in prayer, eternally silent as he beseeched his creator. What? Doors made from fine white marble burst out of the ground, 
opening to release hundreds of angels. He wasn't praying, he was activating a skill. The angel turned to face Izuku, confirming what he already suspected. Izuku scoffed. Why does everyone have the most wordy names? Lucifer's aura far surpassed anything else Izuku had felt inside the dungeon. But while there was a bit of apprehension in the air Izuku wasn't necessarily worried. After all, on his climb to floor 100, he had obtained a few more pieces of the Olympian armor from the Angel Clan's armories. Item Class S Item Type Armor Plus 40 Intelligence Said effect will activate if this item is equipped along with Olympian armor pieces. Said effect 1 plus 5 all stats. Set effect 2. Set effect 3. Item class, S. Item type, accessory. Plus 20 intelligence. Plus 20 cents. Set effect will activate if this item is equipped along with Olympian armor pieces. Set effect 1 plus 5 all stats. Set effect 2. Set effect 3. Item class, S. Item type, accessory. Plus 20 strength. Plus 20 vitality. Set effect will activate if this item is equipped along with Olympian armor pieces. Set effect 1 plus 5 all stats. Set effect 2 plus 10 all stats. Set effect 3. Level 99. Strength 253. Vitality 190. Agility 201. Intelligence 245. Sense 167. HP 47,395 over 47,395. Shadows able to be extracted. 367. Shadows able to be saved. 221. In his rampage through the last dozen or so floor, Izuku had greatly expanded his army to include 49 angel archers, 20 angel knights, 30 angel mages, bringing his total soldier count to its maximum of 221 shadows. The angel knights were really the only ones with any true power to them. But Izuku decided that having some flying ranged attackers would be useful as he could always level them up later. As it turned out, Essel herself was not an angel knight but an angel noble, an incredibly rare and powerful species, which made sense considering she was the leader of the group that had attacked Smokey. But he simply hadn't expected someone like her to hold so much power. As Izuku looked around at the angelic army that appeared out of nowhere, the seraph's arms spread out to either side, conjuring two massive maces from seemingly nowhere. Though Lucifer made no immediate moves, his face hidden by a helmet, his forces drew closer and closer, to the point where Essel began to become nervous. Um, Sir Midoriya. Not yet. Some of the angels hit the ground running, trampling the perfectly manicured grass as they charged towards Izuku. Not yet. Essel began to regret having pushed so hard to come with him, but then a shadow spread out from under Izuku, spreading wide over the entire garden. Skill, Domain of the Monarch has activated. All shadows within the Monarch's range will have their stats increased by 50%. Come forth. The ground the angels were running over erupted with shadowy spears and other blades, skewering the white beings from below as the shadows pulled themselves up to the real world. The cool blue of their bodies replaced by a dark and menacing purple. Although, it did nothing to modify the red of the orcs or the white of the angels and Carquinos. Carquinos is using skill, divine retribution. As Carquinos grew to a size that was only comparable to a skyscraper his maw opened wide, letting forth a beam of white energy that scorched the earth and seared the angels to a crisp. The ones that were too close to Izuku for Carquinos to hit. Well, Igris had something to say about them hurting his leech. Instantly, a battle between two hundred and several thousand had shifted to a battle between two hundred each. Lucifer crossed his maces in front of his chest, signaling to Izuku that he was about to use some sort of skill. He was too far away for a melee attack, so Izuku wrapped Essel in his arms and turned his back to Lucifer preparing to leap away as Tusk created a barrier between the two to buy time. Slashing with both maces, Lucifer created an X-shaped artifact of solid light that carved a path through everything it touched. Izuku's mana dropped by about 2,000 as it tore through his army and slammed into Tusk's shield. The High Orc's eyes widened as he realized that for the first time since being summoned as a shadow, his shield was being broken, roaring. Tusk poured as much of his energy into the hem of Protect as he could, succeeding in holding it back just long enough for Izuku to exit the blast radius and then, it exploded. The blinding fire enclosed at least a dozen shadows within its radius, stealing another thousand mana from Izuku, Igris, Smokey, Hayo, Tank, get those maces out of his hands. Carquinos, clip his wings. Hayo sent two separate waves of ice to freeze each arm as Tank dove at the right while Igris and Smokey headed for the left using the bear's weight to pull down Lucifer. The Seraph's three sets of wings went to flap, likely to unleash some sort of attack or attempt to escape, but Carquinos was already on it. The massive serpent-like body swooped down from the sky, his talons flashing as they slashed across Lucifer's back, completely cutting away two of the sets. Izuku finally set Essel down behind what seemed a safe spot. Stay as far away from the battle as possible. I've got to go help them. Skill, Sprint LV. 3 has activated. 
even as he was weighed down by two elite knight shadows, a captain shadow, and restricted by the ice magic of another elite knight, Lucifer was managing to make progress, his arms pushing back against the enemies holding him down. The ice began cracking and Igris and the others began losing any grip they had on the maces. Carquino circled back around, his jaws primed to snap down on the seraph's head. But before he could, Lucifer's remaining wings got off one beat. Four feathers fell from his back and became eclipsed by a glowing light as they shapeshifted to four white and gold longsworts, all of which rocketed through the air, dicing up Carquinos like a blender and forcing him to pull back as his body was decimated. It all seemed to be going wrong, but Izuku finally joined the battle, charging forwards as nothing more than a blur and slamming into Lucifer's chest, denting the armor heavily and allowing his shadows to wrest away his weapons. Pulling out the juggled blades, Izuku sent them spinning through the air, cutting down Lucifer's two remaining wings and ending his assault on Carquinos. Somewhat freed from the weight of the shadows, Lucifer stumbled backwards, finally breaking the ice as the milky white mist on his bottom half coalesced to form a solid shape. Without his wings it seemed like he needed his legs to stay upright. Monarch, the angel muttered, You intend to kill me. Take a good look before you do so. I am you and am I what you will become. His blinding armor creaked and cracked, twisting into a demonic form as it was overcome with a black color that spread up it like a virus. I, Lucifer, am the most powerful vessel of God, but I am also that of a fallen angel. Two new bat-like wings shot out of his back. I am your past, monarch, he spat, and I am your future. His gauntlets curled into hooked talons, looking sharp enough to tear through just about anything. Yeah? Izuku asked. Well the future looks pretty ugly. Leveling his longsword at him, he smirked so I think I'll just kill it. R-A-A-R-G-H. His claws slashed through the air, creating dark blades of energy that flew by Izuku, who had to jump and dive over them to avoid getting cut. Rolling to his feet, Izuku's arm hauled forwards, cutting at the ankle of the twenty-foot-tall angel-turned-demon. It growled unnaturally at him as his fist clenched, ready to crush him into a paste, but Tank covered Izuku's body with his own, the blow crashing harmlessly into his back. Igris jumped from Lucifer's arms aiming for his head as he flicked his whip. Lucifer ducked at the last moment, the whip continuing onwards to slice through his wings like they weren't even there. Landing behind the boss of the heavenly palace, Igris was buffed by Tusk, growing nearly as tall as Lucifer himself, swinging his sword with the same power that would be given to a club. Igris cleaved into the side of Lucifer's armor, biting his skin and letting flow a spray of grey blood. Lucifer's free hand batted aside Smokey as he rose to his full height to claw at the demon. At the same time, he gathered more of that dark energy into his foot, stomping on the ground and sending a shockwave strong enough to throw all the shadows and Izuku off balance, knocking them to the ground. He picked up Tank by the neck with his massive hands and flung him away, apparently deciding that he was more trouble than he was worth spinning around. He slashed at Igris, cutting his body into five separate pieces. How did it get so low so quickly? Looking back to the rest of the angels clashing with his army as he activated stealth, Izuku realized that on average, the angels outpaced his soldiers. So far, the only reason they had been keeping up at all was because of Tusk's AoE attacks, his shields and his buffs. In fact, Tusk had been working overtime to help both teams and it was quickly wearing him down. We have to finish this now. Hit him with everything. Tusk is using skills, him of frenzy, him of strengthening, him of giants, and him of combustion, and him of the fire dragon. Carquinos is using skill, divine retribution. The two beams of heat hit Lucifer from both the front and back at the same time turning his dark armor into a white hot mess of melted metal. He roared in pain, but wasted no time tearing off his armor like it was paper and manifesting a shield of dark energy that held back Tusk's blast for just a moment. That one moment where his hand was held out was just one moment long enough for Igris's whip to sneak through, severing the arm at the elbow. At the same time, both blasts cut off, Tusk and Carquinos's energies exhausted just as Izuku leapt forwards, driving his fist into Lucifer's chest, creating an unnatural crater in his skin and causing him to skid backwards. Lucifer fell to his knees, his withered and grey chest scorched with burns that would cause anyone to beg for mercy. But to the credit of the fallen angel, he simply reached up to his head with his remaining hand and pulled off the helmet that was quickly turning to slag. His head was full of once golden hairs, now turned pure white and a face that had once seemed eternally youthful was old and decaying. I have served as the guardian of this garden since my lord put me here. I did my best to protect its purity, even taking on the powers of the devil to make certain I would be strong enough when someone like you arrive. But it appears my efforts were in vain. Lucifer looked out over the scorched garden and the angels fighting shadows. You have corrupted this place and I believe you will corrupt many more, so I have no choice but to hug. Izuku had stabbed Lucifer in the chest. Piercing his heart, sorry, I would've let you have your last words, but it sounded like you were going to do something dangerous. Lucifer croaked out a wheeze and his fist opened, releasing a blinding light attached to a golden sword. Mo, Narch, what? Sighed. Will you? 
Beyond, Izuku withdrew his sword, allowing Lucifer to collapse onto his back. You defeat the strongest angel, Seraph Lucifer. Izuku collapsed onto his butt, breathing hard as he watched the body of the fallen angel turn into golden dust and float into the air, sprinkling itself over the melted armor, repairing a few pieces and turning them into the white and gold pattern Izuku recognized as the Olympian armor. Normal quest, collect heavenly souls has been completed, turning around. Izuku saw that most of the angels had been dealt with. But he also saw one of his shadows sprinting towards him, a body in their arms and Izuku went cold. He stood and dashed over, meeting them halfway, recognizing Essel's golden locks and perfect face, where her stomach should have been. There was a long dark wound and Izuku realized what had happened. Lucifer's energy slashes hadn't stopped at him. They had raced past, one of them heading for the area Essel was watching from. Izuku felt around clumsily for a pulse. If she was still alive, the strongest potions from the store could maybe save her. But, he felt nothing. She was as cold as ice. Damn it. Izuku's hand went limp, falling to his side as he clenched his jaw. I, should I give her a burial? I could use. No, no, I wasn't given power over death just so I could bury someone. Izuku gave his shadow a solemn look, set her down. As if he was handling a newborn, the shadow gently laid her on the grassy ground. I'm sorry for this, Essel, but it's my only option, so please, arise. The shadow that had carried her to him was shot backwards as a mass of darkness erupted from Essel's stomach, encapsulating Izuku in a bubble of ink like night. From inside that bubble he was shocked to see bits of that golden dust from Lucifer sprinkling the shadow. Moments later, two bright eyes gazed back at Izuku, blinking in surprise. The bubble began to shrink, condensing into a form, taking a humanoid shape with three sets of wings. Shadow Seraph LV, Mind Captain Grade. Shadow Seraph has been renamed, Essel Radier. What, Sir Midoriya? The shadow asked, white accents tracing their way up her body, coming to a stop on her face as it mimicked the features of a specific angel girl. Essel, you can, talk. The monarch's desires, the shadow's will, and the seraph's blessing have granted Essel Raider the ability of speech. Essel smiled at him, I don't think my father's going to be very happy with me. After all, now I have to spend all of eternity with you. Her voice was filled with pure joy. It was so much of a relief that Izuku nearly passed into unconsciousness. After all, he had been awake and fighting for the past three days straight, but he resisted, instead choosing to open his daily quest reward, accept status recovery. For some strange reason, unlike the other gates Izuku had been inside, this dungeon did not reset his daily quests every day, so he had saved the status recovery for an occasion just like this. As all of his exhaustion was washed away, he was left with nothing but a smile and a pile of loot, one item in particular catching his eye. Hold on just a little longer mom, I'll be there soon. Back in present time, the four Japanese teams were busy handling all of the Namu pouring out of the mountain. Come on, Musha. Hawks joked as he lazily hung back, leaning against a tree, his feathers swinging through the air, cutting the Namu like they were paper, or falling behind in kills. Not all of us care so much about simply looking good. Hawks, the old man inside the armor replied as he cut another Namu out of the sky. It seems like far more Namu have flight capabilities than we originally anticipated. If they have this many then why did they only send the one Namu to the mainland? Were they waiting for something? Or simply protecting their queen? Silence was the only thing that followed. Surprising Musha, Hawks never remained this quiet during raids. Even during the stickiest of situations, his mouth never stopped. Musha wasn't sure why, but it sent a chill through his spine and as he dealt with the final Namu nearby, he spun around. The only trace of Hawks left being his decapitated body. WH what? Musha reached up to his ear to signal the other points. But his arm never made it, it was torn off before he could even blink. The last thing he saw as before a fist punched through his skull was a dark black exoskeleton. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. You have obtained item, Olympian boots. You have obtained item, Olympian gauntlets. You have obtained item, Genesis blade. You have obtained weapon pair, Daybringer and Nightbringer. You have obtained item, Seraph's blessed ashes. You have obtained ingredient item, purified blood of the Seraph. Item, Olympian boots. Item class, S. Item type, armor. Plus 40 agility. Set effect will activate if this item is equipped along with Olympian armor pieces. Set effect 1, plus 5 all stats. Set effect 2, plus 10 all stats. Set effect 3. Item class, S. Item type, armor, weapons. Plus 200 attack. When wielding weapons in both hands with the Olympian gauntlets equipped, those weapons will gain a 25% bonus to their attack. Set effect will activate if this item is equipped along with Olympian armor pieces. Set effect 1, plus 5 all stats. Set effect 2, plus 10 all stats. Set effect 3, skill, guardian angel. There's so much loot, I can barely keep up with all of it. Normal quest, collect heavenly souls has been completed. Rewards, 1, highest quality runestone. 
2. Plus 30 bonus stats. 3. Hidden reward. Received runestone, shadow exchange. Received 30 stat points. Received title, angel hunter. Title, angel hunter requirements have not been met. I think I'll put all the points into intelligence. Level, 102. Strength, 256. Vitality, 193. Agility, 244. Intelligence, 278. Sense, 170. HP, 47,395 over 47,395. Shadows able to be extracted, 372. Shadows able to be saved, 252. Izuku had no idea what the issue was with the Angel Hunter title. But upon crushing the runestone in his hand, he forgot all about it. Skill, Shadow Exchange LV. 1. Job Specific Skill. No mana required. Exchange locations with any selected Shadow Soldier. This skill has a cooldown of 3 hours. The cooldown will change depending on the skill level. Holy crap. It's like teleportation. Shaking his head, Izuku realized that by now, he was only wasting time. I'll look at everything else later. World Trees Fragment. Spring Water of the Echoing Forest. Purified Blood of the Seraph. Would you like to craft consumable, holy water of life? Yes, Sir Midoriya, Essel asked, her shadowy body moving around behind him as she tried to fruitlessly peek over his shoulder and look at whatever he was looking at, crafting holy water of life. The success rate and number of items crafted will be dependent on the crafter's intelligence stat. I guess it's a good thing I plugged all my stat points into intelligence. 5. Crafted Item Holy Water of Life x6 Izuku felt like jumping into the air, but he refrained. He didn't want to jinx himself and risk the fact that this water might not cure his mother at all. He still had some of the purified blood and a chunk of the world tree fragment left, but the spring water of the echoing forest was entirely gone. Oh well, I've got six of the things and I supposedly only need one. Hopefully, due to the death of the dungeon boss and the clearing of all 100 floors, you will now be booted from the dungeon. Wait what? Izuku looked over to Essel, but, before he could finish his sentence, his vision went dark and when it reappeared, he found himself standing just outside the Endeavor Agency, all of his shadows surrounding him. 63 Shadow High Orcs, 49 Angel Archers, 20 Angel Knights, 30 Angel Mages, 25 Shadow Bears, 19 Shadow Infantry, 6 Magicians, 3 Shadow High Orc Bodyguards, Smokey, Tank, Igris, Hyo, Tusk, Carquinos, and Essel all standing in front of what should have been a busy agency and street. But Izuku ignored the fact that there seemed to be no one around and he turned to Essel. I am sorry that you didn't get to say goodbye to your father. Essel shook her head. It's not exactly what I would have wanted. But from here on out, as long as I'm with you, I'm at peace with whatever happens. A calm smile was stretched across her face, surprising Izuku as he called back in all of his shadows except for Essel and Carquinos. Well then, he said, climbing up to Carquinos's head, as long as you're certain. He paused, looking in the direction of the hospital his mother was slumbering in. So, you wanna meet my mother? Rukyu team, have you been able to make contact with Hawks or Genus team? Endeavor said over the Japanese comms. Negative. We've cleaned up some of the Namo around here, but most of them rushed back to the mound. We're heading to Hawks team now. Good, I'll be heading for Genist. Once you rendezvous, begin your evacuation of the island. What? But what about Maruko, Lemillion, or the Koreans? They've got their own orders, now follow mine. Ryukyu grumbled to herself, but since Endeavor was number two and All Might wasn't here, the Japanese government had given him the reins of the operation. As Dabai ran alongside the dragon girl, he gave her an odd look, something doesn't feel right here. You sense it too don't you? Rukyu sighed, yes. But just because we get a chill down our spine doesn't mean we get to abandon the mission. We figure out what happened to our teams and then we leave. Where's the girl? Nirio shouted, pushing off the floor with such force that he stumbled the other S ranks inside the tunnel. He shot upwards, heading for Overhaul, who stood calmly on a ledge, ducking at the last second. Overhaul avoided a strike that would have taken his head off, for now. She's safe. Maybe not comfortable, but she's safe. Mirio's fist decimated the wall behind him as he leapt backwards. After all, an enhancement type like herself is too valuable to lose. Mirio almost froze in place, you're using her. Overhaul tilted his head. What? Did you expect us to treat her with love and affection? No, I mean, you didn't try to kill her. Mirio's eyes narrowed. The Namu that kidnapped her was under orders and gate villains never take prisoners. Their only goal is to kill. You're not a human type gate villain, you're just a human villain. That explains your power to break things down and rebuild them. It's not magic, it's your quirk. But then, how'd you manage to ally yourself with the Namu? Overhaul chuckled. The League of Villains are quite helpful when it comes to human-gate relation. After all, they have some special connection to the gates, just like you, Eek. Mirio scowled and launched himself right back into the fray, doing his best to kill Overhaul. 
but the human villain was too nimble and every time Mirio got too close, he would place one of his four hands on the ground, destroying it and reforming it as a massive wall, obscuring Mirio's vision for just a second as he used his permeation quirk to pass right through it. Sha Hien and Bi Kyo Hoon looked around in shock. There's no Namu anywhere. Isn't this their nest? Do they not care about it? Choi asked. It doesn't matter, just so long as the million is able to kill over Hall. Then we can move on to the queen herself. I bet that's where we'll find all of her guards, Maruko said, itching to jump into the battle. But holding herself back for the sake of Mirio who had requested the one-on-one -on -one to make sure he didn't have to worry about anyone else getting hurt. She didn't normally hold herself back from a fight. But the way Mirio was moving and the power he was suddenly putting off made her reconsider her desire to fight over Hall. There was something about the both of them that just didn't sit well with her. Overhaul slapped his hand on the ground, creating a forest of spikes that hindered Mirio for just a moment, allowing him to avoid another devastating strike from the blonde boy. I know I can't beat you. You have the full power of a ruler on your side and I only have the power I was born with inside of me. But, Overhaul created a perfect box around himself and Mirio, thinking it was a poor attempt to hide, dove right through it, but I have the support of all the monarchs. Mirio's eyes widened as Overhaul's lower right arm shot out, a glowing stone held in it. He turned his torso intangible, but it changed nothing. Overhaul's arm passed into his chest, dropping the stone there and pulling out his hand. Mirio collapsed to the ground, his body burning with pain suddenly. He tried to activate his quirk, but for some reason, all the strength had left his body. As Overhaul took down the box shape that had obscured them from the rest, he laughed, How'd you like that? Yagumont made that for this specific occasion. Unfortunately, it's the only of its kind, so we can only seal away one of you ruler pieces of shit, but I think sealing away Iik, the largest fragment of brilliant light is a good choice, what do you think? Maruko and the Koreans rushed forwards, intending to kill the villain, but Overhaul made another forest of spikes, slowing them down, no. The ruler was my only prey. You eight can be the prey of my newest experiment. A million, Iik called out. His body becoming completely covered in a white fur as his body shapeshifted to mirror the aspects of a tiger. His power increased dramatically and he began crashing through the spikes with no concern for his own health. But the young hero weakly waved him away. R. Un. Then, he was overcome by a massive amount of orange light, blinking out of existence just like that. You bastard. Beak shouted. His fears suddenly a reality. I'll kill you for that. I reckon you could. Overhaul said lackadaisical. I was prepared for Eek after all, not you. Eek jumped into the air, his body heading straight for overhauls. Within moments, they would collide, but a blur interrupted Beak's attack. But I believe this one will be more than enough to kill you all. He's already had some fun with your Japanese comrades. The half-tiger man was slammed into a wall of the cavern, a deep gash appearing from his shoulder down to his pecs. The culprit of the attack, a humanoid ant with the most powerful aura any of the heroes there had ever felt. Beak fell forwards out of his crater, the one attacked nearly enough to push him into unconsciousness, but Min Byung Jaya was there to pick him up with his healing magic. As an S-rank healer, his friend's wound was closed within an instant. As the tiger got back to his feet, Maruko and Hien rushed the ant, one kicking with enough power to decimate a building, the other slashing with enough force to cut a mountain in half. The ant only needed one hand for each. He caught their attacks in each hand, crushing he and sword in Maruko's foot like they were made out of paper mash. Then, with both of them put off balance, he drove a fist into the side of both, crushing multiple organs at the same time. The two fell to the ground, unconscious as Choi jong in and Lim Ti-jai launched their respective projectiles at the ant. It brushed off the fire and caught the magical arrow with little effort, throwing it to Beak, injuring him yet again. By that point Ma Dong-wook was the last physical hero left. But as soon as the ant noticed a glowing green aura of healing surrounding the two female heroes, it punched him in the gut, breaking several bones and sending him flying to the side. It dashed behind him, stabbing his clawed hand through a space that appeared to be occupied by nothing and yet, blood spurted from that empty air as Byung Jiu's camouflage skill was broken. B-Y-U-N-G-G-Y-U, Beak shouted, unable to comprehend what was even happening as the ant lurched forwards, his mouth tearing off the head of the healer and swallowing it whole. He tore the magic arrow out of his chest and leapt at the ant, his claws ready to tear him to shreds, but the ant caught him by the throat, squeezing hard enough to interrupt and cancel Beak's transformation. Yawara we ak. The ant said as it seemed to adjust to the new language it was speaking, where? Is her kaing? Kei king. Choi and Lim tried to launch another barrage, but the ant dropped Beak and slashed each of them across the chest, forcing them to the ground in pain, blood spurting out. The ant seemed to sniff the air, outside. He's there. The strong one. Blurring away, the ant disappeared, racing for outside of the caverns. The strong one, is it heading for Endeavor? Does that mean that some of the Japanese heroes are still alive? Did you like him? Overhaul asked. He tends to do his own thing, but he weakened you all enough for me. 
He may look like an ant of some sort, but he's actually a Namu believe it or not. Overhaul lorded over Beak's shaking body, growing weary from the injuries and from blood loss. Took me a couple of years, taking apart and reconstructing those things before I landed on him. He's this nest's ultimate warrior. Even that endeavor you have waiting outside is no match for him. So, which one of you should I kill first? Two hours earlier, Izuku stood by the side of his mother's hospital bed, Essel standing behind him with her hands clasped. The doctors somehow hadn't noticed the two ride in on a massive dragon, their attention perfectly glued to the news channel. Izuku thought it weird, but once again, decided to ignore it. He had more important matters, holding the holy water of life in his shaking hands. Izuku took a deep breath. The system has created at least a dozen miracles so far. There's no way it can't do this, forcing down the butterflies in his stomach. Izuku uncorked the fancy bottle and held it to his mother's lips, forcing the liquid down her throat. Almost instantly, the color began returning to her face, but even as Izuku urged for her to wake, she did not and he sighed tiredly. Well, it was worth a shot. I've done what I could. At the very least, with my new power, I have more than enough to keep her comfortable now. Asil rested her hand on Izuku's shoulder, surprising him with its warmth. I'm sorry, Izuku, she said, using that name for the first time, I'm Sue. Ri, Izuku's brow furrowed as she trailed off and he looked up, surprised to see his mother sitting up in bed, her long dark hair flowing down her back, Izuku, is, that you, I, Izuku's voice caught in his throat, you've grown so much, how long have I been asleep, it, Izuku cleared his throat, it's been four years, and how's little Sekura doing, she's, Izuku's voice warbled, good, mom, and Ko Midoriya took her son's hand, completely ignoring the shadowy figure of Vessel behind him, it must have been hard, doing it all on your own. She smiled with enough pride to block out the sun, but you did do it. You kept your promise and took care of her for me. I couldn't have asked for a better son. At that, Izuku lost whatever nerve had been holding back his tears and he began bawling as his arms wrapped around his mother, squeezing her in a tight hug, something he had not been able to do since he was twelve. For several minutes, they remained like that, mother and son, sobbing into each other. Essel even wiped away a tear. Somehow and Igris manifested next to her. Resting a hand on her shoulder, as if to say, we are his knights, he is strong for us when we need him, so it is now our time to be strong for him. Essel nodded and a small giggle escaped her, you know, for such a quiet night, you know how to say a lot with one look. It was just then that Inko and Midoriya separated, each getting another good look at each other, so, his mother laughed, who are your friends? Oh, uh, Izuku contemplated how to tell her for a moment, but before he could even begin to explain, the door to his mother's room burst open. Young Midoriya. Oh, Izuku spun around, might, instead of the massive muscular man he was used to. All Izuku saw was a skeletal figure, no fat, no muscle, basically just skin and bones. Izuku almost apologized and said he sounded like All Might, but then Izuku took a closer look. His hair was the same blonde and his eyes were the same deep and sunken craters. This couldn't actually be All Might, could it? Young Midoriya. He called again, running into the room, only to realize the fragility of the situation. Izuku's eyes were red and puffy, as were his mother's, not to mention Essel and Igris had drawn actual weapons to prevent the intruder from ruining the reunion. Oh, my deepest apologies for ruining. This, he bowed quickly, so quickly that it barely looked like he had done so. Young Midoriya, I've been looking for you for several days now. Where have you been? Uh, was school not off for the week? I could have sworn. No no, it's not about that. All Might paused to take a breath. At first I was looking for you for your specific ability, but things have changed now. What's going on here? A male nurse said, rounding the corner to see two shadow soldiers with sharp weapons and they ran off screaming. The uh, Izuku muttered, what is going on? I can't say everything here, but you need to get to Jeju Island right now. Gee, the island is about to be raided by most of the top 10 in Korea's top S ranks. I don't see why that requires. Are you or are you not Ashbourne? All Might's suddenly desperate tone only forced the two shadows to get their blades closer to his throat. A monarch, he squeaked out. Monarch, does he know about the system? My job. If you are, then the Jeju Island raid team will desperately be needing your help. Izuku scratched his head, and, how do you know that? I, listen I'll explain as much as I can on the way. Please, we have to get on a helicopter now. Izuku, and Ko said calmly, doing her best to defuse the situation, it sounds like you're needed. Mom, I can't just. And Ko interrupted him with a shake of her head. Heroes don't get to choose when they are needed. And I know that my boy has become a strong hero. So please, allow the doctors to watch over me while you go save whoever needs saving. Izuku was frozen for a moment, his body ready to move, but his mind telling him that he needed to stay. However, his mother ruffled his hair like she used to and snapped him out of his dilemma, her eyes telling him everything. He sighed, all right, fine. Izuku walked over to his mother's window, opening it wide, but just so you know, 
We're not taking a helicopter. A smile crossed his face as he watched All Might's eyes widen at the sight of Karkinos, hopping onto the dragon, pulling All Might along with him. Izuku gave his mom one last wave as doctors and nurses rushed in. Let's go Karkinos, to Jeju Island, 50 minutes before Mirio is defeated. All right, Izuku said over the rushing wind, spill it. What does being a monarch mean? Who's Ashbourne? And why do you look like that? We've got about an hour before we reach Jeju, so tell me everything you know. All Might sighed as he prepared for a long-winded exposition. At the beginning of time. Wait, is this just gonna be some fairy tale or a real thing? All Might pouted for a moment. It's real. Considering what you've seen, does anything really seem that far-fetched? Izuku shrugged. Anyways, at the beginning of time, there was a being, an absolute being. Nowadays, people would call him God. But he was not the benevolent creator that most religions depict him as. He created all of the universe and their many realms. The earth, which houses humans, heaven and hell, which hold angels and demons respectively, the dark caverns from which all Namu come from and many more. But he swiftly became bored, so he took the forces of light and dark and broke them up into eight pieces each, creating the rulers of light, whose goal was to safeguard existence no matter the cost and the monarchs of darkness, who were tasked with destroying all of the universe however they could. Izuku shifted uncomfortably from atop Karkinos's head, so, I'm one of those monarchs. I'm meant to destroy all of reality. All Might shook his head. As the war between the rulers and monarchs waged on, the rulers begged the absolute being for help in destroying the monarchs. The absolute being refused and soon after, the rulers learned that their gruesome and unending battle was just for the amusement of their god. Seven of the eight rulers banded together and rebelled against the absolute being with Ashbourne being the only one to remain loyal. Okay, you've officially lost me. I'm a monarch in some sort of reincarnation of Ashbourne, who was a ruler. Ashbourne, the greatest fragment of brilliant light was betrayed and killed by the other rulers when he attempted to save his creator. But what no one, not even he, knew, was that the absolute being had implanted a failsafe in him, he had granted him the power of death itself. Upon waking, his army destroyed by his once thought to be allies, Ashbron tore off his wings and forged an armor of pure shadows. As he brought up a new armor of shadow soldiers, Ashbourne joined the monarchs, wishing for revenge against the rulers. All might look sad for a moment, as if he had experienced it personally. Of course, he wasn't safe with the monarchs either and two of them betrayed him out of fear, the rulers joining the fight against him. He nearly died, but once the two monarchs were pushed away, four of the rulers kneeled to him, asking for his forgiveness. Instead of accepting it, or denying it, Ashbourne made a simple request. He asked for the rulers to kill him. He had fought for both sides and been betrayed multiple times. Izuku felt a pang of sympathy for, well apparently himself. Ashbourne was not granted his request and instead decided to disappear, remaining neutral as the war waged on, now targeted at the subjugation of one particular planet. Earth, Izuku answered, they want to kill us all. And they have, seven times now. S7. Each time the Earth was destroyed by the monarchs, the rulers brought it back to life. This is the Eighth War and the rulers, in an attempt to save the Earth, gave us the gates, imbuing humans with mana and powers that we never would have had before. Sometime after those wars began, Ashbourne rejoined with the monarchs and Antares. The monarch of destruction welcomed him back. Since then, the rulers and the monarchs realized that in order to win over Earth and end the war between them, they would need hosts. The monarchs, being the pure evil they were, decided that instead of granting their hosts power or assimilating with them, they would be taken over fully, prisoners inside their own bodies. Meanwhile, the rulers went around, testing humans that could handle their power and were worthy of it. Does that mean, Ashbourne will take me over one day? All Might was silent for a moment, I'm sorry, I have no idea. This was all the information that Iik, the ruler who granted me power, gave me. Izuku nodded, doing his best not to panic with that information. So if you're the host of Iik, then how come you suddenly are all skinny? I passed the power of Iik on to someone I thought worthy, Mirio Tagata, a classmate of yours. Since the beginning of the school year I've only been relying on the power that was left over. It's for that reason that I couldn't sense your status as a monarch until late. It takes a great deal of practice and skill to sense that specific type of power and I've been distracted. Why'd you pass it on? All Might lifted his baggy shirt, showing off a gruesome scar over his stomach. I got in a fight with Antares myself and, well, I could no longer handle Eik's power like I used to be able to. How many rulers and monarchs have hosts then? For the rulers, well, they take longer to choose more suitable hosts. So right now, if we count you as a ruler, then we have three. You, Mirio, and Sukachi. Sukachi. All right. You were inside the gate when he acted. It appears that he's become the host to the weakest fragment of brilliant light, Pola. And the monarchs, there's no way to be certain. I did some pretty substantial damage to Antares as he did to me, which leads me to believe that Tamura Shigaraki, the one who invaded the USJ, is to be his future host. Kirajiri, 
Their teleporter appears to be the monarch of Frost, Arut. Other than that, the other six could either already have their forms and are in hiding, or any number of them have yet to find hosts. All Might shook his head. There's too much that is unknown. Izuku let out a heavy sigh, digesting all the information. Oh, he said, remembering a much more normal topic. How'd you know that I would be needed at Jeju Island? You told me Mirio was already part of the raid team, right? If that's the case and he's as strong, or stronger than me, then why are we running over there? All Might's eyes narrowed. I had a vision of sorts. I cannot be sure what caused it, or what I saw in it, but I'm certain that whatever is happening there now, it's nothing good. Damn, Endeavor muttered, gazing down at the torn apart bodies of Crust, Best Genist, and Fat Gum. All of them were powerful fighters, no normal Namu could kill them. Endeavor, a voice buzzed in his ear, not one of the people on the island, Matsumoto. Endeavor responded to the official who was overseeing the Japanese's involvement with Jeju Island. It appears we've suffered some casualties. Hum, that's a shame. Oh well, are the Koreans engaging the queen? Endeavor nodded, I believe so, sir. A little while back, the jamming signal seemed to fail and all the Namu went rushing back towards their queen. Well, what are the chances the Koreans, Maruko, and that boy will survive the coming storm? Endeavor thought for a moment. I've seen all of the Koreans in practice matches and I know Maruko's strength from experience. If it was just them, I'd say they'd have a 0% chance to survive. But that Mirio boy, he has insane potential. With him there, I can't be certain. That's no issue at all. As the live broadcast from inside the Namu nest just showed off the boy getting killed, then all is going according to plan, Endeavor said. Correct. As soon as we are certain of the Koreans' deaths, then we will send in the rest of our forces and eliminate the threat, declaring you a national rank hero and ridding ourselves of Korea's strongest. It's a shame we have to waste Maruko though. She seemed so promising. Perfect, Endeavor replied, ending the call abruptly and turning to Gang Orca. For now, we just have to wait until the live feeds catch he spun around as a massive pressure assailed his body, creating a wall of flames. He deflected whatever blow had been sent his way, sending it crashing into Gang Orca instead and destroying his entire upper body. Are you the king? The attacker asked as the flames cleared, revealing an ant like Namu. Endeavor, clad in the strongest armor money could buy, smirked as the ant asked this question, Am I the king? He chuckled, flames exploding from his body as his aura expanded. Why yes, I am the king. Kiki Kik. The ant chirped, releasing everything he had been holding back, freezing Endeavor in place with his power. It was at that moment that Endeavor realized just how utterly screwed he was. He was one of the strongest in Japan, but only All Might had ever come close to this. Of course, that was only the power All Might had let him feel. Just this aura from the ant felt like it was enough to shatter his armor. It moved fast enough to be a blur even to Endeavor and he knew that his life was about to end. But before it could make contact, a shape dropped down from the sky. Crashing heavily into the ground in front of Endeavor, Izuku allowed his Olympian armor to appear on his body, making him decidedly more intimidating with its white brilliance and gold accents. Unfortunately, manifesting it did not give him any buff like the Shadow Steel armor did, but he decided that he didn't need them. In each of his gauntleted hands he held a mace. One dark, one light. <laughs> Item class, S. Item type, mace. Plus 200 attack. When equipped alongside Nightbringer, Daybringer will have a chance to inflict bonus burn damage. <laughs> Item class, S. Item type, Mace, plus 200 attack. When equipped alongside Daybringer, Nightbringer will have a chance to inflict bonus frost damage. On top of these top tier maces, his gauntlets boosted their attack by a full 25%, making their actual attack 250, a higher number than anything he'd ever wielded before. Asil, Igris, make sure the heroes inside the tunnels survive at all costs. Take all the angel units with you. Endeavor looked around in shock as 100 shadow soldiers manifested around him. He shouldn't have been in shock because he'd already seen this power at the sports festival, right? In reality, Endeavor was shocked by the fact that the knight in front of him, Igris, had grown to such heights in just a week. It shouldn't have been able to grow at all and yet, here was a being that could likely solo several S ranks like they were newborn fawns, stumbling around his feet. If Izuku Midoriya controlled someone like him with ease, then just who the hell was this kid? Endeavor. You should run, Izuku said without turning his back. But know that if you try to hide, I will find you and hold you accountable for what you have tried to achieve today. W what? I heard you, every last word. It seems that my sense stat has given my ears quite the upgrade. No, no one will believe you. Him, maybe not. But they might believe him, Izuku said, nodding his head backwards, causing Endeavor to realize not only that All Might was behind him, skeletal and all, but he was also riding atop a massive dragon made of shadows. This, this power, it's not natural. Karkinos, do me a favor and keep All Might safe while you provide some air support. Karkinos roared in understanding, swirling back into the sky as it prepared to eliminate any Namu that left the cave. You, you are the king. 
The ant screeched out, running up to and getting in Izuku's face, his mere presence enough to crack the very ground they stood on. Izuku smirked, that's right, I'm your king. So be a good peasant. He activated Dominator's touch, forcing the ant to its hands and knees with the blue telekinetic energy, and kneel before your monarch. So, which one of you should I kill first? Overhaul asked. He stepped over the bodies of the girls. They're basically dead already, so that's no fun. Looking over to Choi and Lim, the ranged fighters he smiled. You two look like you still have some fight left in you, unlike your physical fighters. I was hoping my perfect Nama would leave you just alive enough to fight. But it appears he's stronger than I anticipated. Choi flung a few weak bolts of fire and Lim attempted to draw his bow. But one arm was too weak, so he lifted the one he could, manifesting a few mana missiles. Overhaul batted it aside with his upper arms, which looked to be completely black, like it was nothing. Hmm, maybe he wasn't too strong. Maybe you were all just too weak. Oh well, I'll just finish it. No point in playing with something too weak to play along. You, bastard. You killed buying Jayu. Beak weakly muttered from his position on the floor. I suppose I did. Overhaul crouched down to the shapeshifter. But don't worry, you'll be joining him. His palm reached forwards, ready to touch Beak and turn him into nothing more than a blood splatter. Igris couldn't let that slide, as allowing any of the heroes to die would disappoint his liege. So racing into the room, he chopped off Overhaul's arm at the shoulder. Before he could even realize what was happening and reach out another of his four arms to kill his target, Essel's spear shot through the air like a bullet, stabbing him through the chest and pinning him to the floor. Just then, as Overhaul began screaming in rage and pain, the rest of the nest came to his aid. Hundreds of Namu began appearing from every possible tunnel, surrounding the heroes and two shadows within moments. Shit, Beak muttered. He realized that even if these two were powerful beyond belief, they couldn't protect all of the heroes at once. Don't worry, Essel said to the ones that were still conscious, you're safe now. Essel is using skill, Heavenly Barrage. From her three sets of wings, dozens of feathers fell away, beginning to hover in the air as they shifted to dark blades. Most of them raced to kill the Namu, but a few of them diverted, doing the best they could to gently gather up the heroes and place them against a rounded alcove, allowing Essel and Igris to more easily defend all of them. They're going to get overwhelmed eventually, Ma Dongwook realized. He figured they'd survive and continue on killing, but it boded poorly for their ravaged group. Oh, we're not the only ones here to protect you, Essel said, smiling back at the group. The others were just a bit slower. As that last word left her mouth, a hundred separate angel shadows poured through the same tunnel Essel and Igris had come from. Beak's eyes widened as arrows and magic assailed the Namu by the hundreds. The twenty or so actual sword wielders somehow managed to do even more damage. All of them zipped around on wings that made them an equal match for any Namu, flying or otherwise. Are any of you healers? Essel asked, crouching down next to Maruko and Chahian. These two won't last much longer and it's too hectic to move them now, the trauma will kill them. We, we did, Beak muttered, his eyes inexorably drawn to his friend's headless corpse. Essel nodded, then for now. All we can do is hope they hold out while we clear the nest. You, 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 you. Overhaul finally got a good grip on the spear piercing his chest and destroyed it with his quirk, freeing himself from the ground and allowing him to wrap his fingers around his severed arm, destroying the remainder of it and building it back up to what it once was. You're ruining. Igris cut Overhaul in half with a flick of his wrist, Kray's whip doing the rest. He dealt with him just like that. What the hell are these things? Izuku made a show of holding down the ant with Dominator's touch, but in reality, it was taking a hell of a lot of effort. Of course, from the ant's perspective, it didn't know this. All it knew was that Izuku's strength was equal to itself. With a bout of strength, the ant shoved off the ground, breaking Izuku's hold on it as he kicked at his armor. It was such a small blow that Izuku was surprised to find himself skidding backwards as the ant's wings snapped out, carrying it quickly back into the caves it had come from. You're not getting away that easily. Skill, Sprint LV. 3 has activated. The tunnel was winding and sometimes it curved so sharply that Izuku had to run on the walls to take a turn and keep up with the ant. But what confused him the most was when he took the final turn, the pathway opening to the massive cavern that currently held the war between Shadows and Namu. In that last turn, the ant had completely disappeared from view. Above you, Beak weakly shouted, sending Izuku into a roll forwards, narrowly avoiding the ant as it dropped from the ceiling, crashing into the ground and sending shockwaves throughout the chamber. Pulling himself to his feet, Izuku saw that the ant was simply staring at him as the world around them continued to devolve into chaos. More Namu poured from the tunnels and more shadows began emerging from Izuku. How about this? Izuku said over the din of battle, just you and me. No more tricks, no more running. The ant seemed to tilt his head, as if considering the proposal before walking right up to Izuku. This time, calmly and when both stood chest to chest, neither made a move. The Arank who was simply there as a cameraman was trying not to freak out. He'd never felt anything like this before, W who is that? And what is he doing? 
I. I think he wants to fight it head on, a fair one on one. Is he crazy? Choi shook his head. No. I think he's just strong. For a moment, the world seemed to go quiet as the two sized each other up fully. The ant stood a full head and a half taller and possessed considerably more mass, but Izuku was undaunted as it threw the first punch, slamming into the side of his head with the force of a bunker buster. The wind forces it generated were enough to even buffet the heroes being protected by Essel, and they had to shield the two girls in order to keep them from becoming any more damaged. By the standards of humanity, Izuku should have been a stain on a wall. Instead, when the dust cleared, Izuku stood tall, his head only turned slightly to accommodate the blow's power. So, is that all you can do? Wah, my turn. Skill, overwhelming strength LV. Three has activated, swinging with all his might and then some. Izuku sent Daybringer crashing into the ant, a concussive blast hurtling out of his left side as it passed through the right. Like Izuku, the ant did not move from him spot, but unlike Izuku, his right side was cracked, bleeding, and steaming from his opponent's blow. It looked like Daybringer's burn damage had kicked in, but Izuku didn't stop there. As the ant stumbled from such a heavy blow, Izuku swept its legs, knocking it onto its side and while it was still in the air, perfectly horizontal, Izuku brought down Nightbringer on its chest. Skill, overwhelming strength LV. 3 has activated. This is, impossible. I was supposed to be the strongest. The ant thought to himself as the exoskeleton on his chest cracked loudly and he smashed into the rocky floor. Skill, overwhelming strength LV. 3 has activated. Skill, overwhelming strength LV. 3 has activated. Skill, overwhelming strength LV. 3 has activated. Again and again Izuku slammed his maces down on the Namu, continuing to damage his exoskeleton. But it seemed like it was never enough to fully break it off. Gotta finish this up. Maruko and that Korean girl won't last much longer in their condition and my potions can't heal someone that damaged. Izuku raised Daybringer for one last attack. Aimed right for the head. Skill, overwhelming strength LV. 3 has activated. The ant rolled to the side at the last second, a purple tongue-like protrusion jutting out from his mouth and scraping against Izuku's exposed cheek. Poison? Izuku asked. The ant took that to mean that he was scared. How unfortunate human. It looks like I win. He raised a fist to punch at the supposedly paralyzed Izuku. Why? Izuku turned to the side, showing off that the poison that had tried creeping through his veins was already gone. And before the ant could change course, Izuku swung Daybringer, still charged up with the skill, smacking him across the face and launching him away as Izuku remembered just why he had missed his gauntlet so much. The overwhelming strength skill required that gauntlets were equipped to be used, but it never said anything about using weapons alongside the gauntlet. Sprinting over to the space where the ant had crashed, Izuku was surprised to see it shoot out of the rubble faster than it had been before. Hey, Deke shouted suddenly, overhauls running to the queen's chambers. The girl's gotta be in there. Apparently, in all the commotion, Overhaul had reconstructed himself and escaped from his shadows. Shit. Igris. Go get H. Izuku froze. There were razor-sharp claws inches from his face. They would certainly hit him and they would certainly do too much damage. Reactive skill. Guardian Angel has activated. Cool down. Five minutes. Transparent yellow wings appeared just in front of Izuku's face. The claws glancing off of it and the ant rushing past Izuku. Where did this sudden burst of speed come from? He asked himself as his eyes did his best to track the flying villain. When he finally caught a glimpse of it, he realized what had happened, knowing that a battle of strength was impossible and that his poison didn't work. The ant decided to push everything he had into speed. His body mass shrunk, arms, legs, and torso thinning out to become insanely quick. Even his hands thinned out, making his claws longer with a smaller point. They were far sharper now. Izuku threw his maces back into the inventory as he leaned backwards, narrowly dodging another slash. It's surprising, you're as strong as the Seraph, or maybe even stronger. But, you're still not stronger than me. Sprint LV. 3 has activated. Without the weight of his weapons, Izuku was beginning to catch up to the ant's speed. Trading blows with just his fists, Izuku found that the ant had made a grave mistake. It thought itself to be the fastest, an insurmountable force of speed, so it sacrificed its raw power. But without that strength, it could now stand up to Izuku's attacks even less than it could before. Skill, overwhelming strength LV. 3 has activated. Izuku punched at the ant's head, but he sacrificed his arm to block it, the limb practically snapping off. I. I must flee, the ant thought to itself, I must survive, if I continue to eat, and grow, then maybe one day I can surpass him. Did you think I'd let you leave? Izuku asked, appearing just in front of the ant, his fist cocked back. Skill, infinite strength LV. Max has activated. Overhaul sprinted through the tunnel with heavy shaking breaths. Those things, they aren't normal. No summon should ever be that strong. The tunnel once again opened up to a massive cavern where the Nama Queen, essentially just a giant mass of black matter, rested. Her royal guards remained vigilant, but they let Overhaul pass. He didn't stop running though. 
The guards were strong, Atas ranks were needed to kill them, but they couldn't hold back what was coming. Towards the back of the room, there was a small room Overhaul had formed with his quirk, blocked off by a rather large boulder. He lifted it like it was nothing, revealing the shivering form of a small girl with white hair curled up on a bed of greenery. Overhaul wasn't sure why, but the Namu insisted on attempting to furnish the girl's room. They gave her whatever they could to make her comfortable. In truth, the Namu did it because anyone that was allowed inside their nest freely was one of them and they took care of their own. Unfortunately, the girl was still there against her will and the Namu certainly weren't going to do anything to save her after they themselves had kidnapped her. Overhaul roughly took her in his arms and began making for the wall the queen rested against. It was the closest to the outside and he needed to escape now. With the girl, he could continue his work, improving his creations and making villains strong enough to even take down the shadows that chased after him, or so he thought. Upon opening the wall, creating a massive hole to the outside, Overhaul was beset by two disturbingly close sounds. One was the distinctive shing of a blade tearing through flesh. The other was a roar that could only be described as Godzilla-like and it was right outside the cave. Izuku's fist was piercing the ant's stomach. Gross purple fluid spilling from the wound as its body went limp, its short reign of terror finished. You have leveled up. The ant's body fell to the ground as Izuku removed his gauntlet from its guts. H. Hey. Beak shouted in Korean, confusing Izuku for a moment as he looked back just in time for him to switch to Japanese. Cha Hien. Maruko. Izuku handed healing potions to everyone but the two girls, drink these. He crouched down next to S ranks. Both of their faces had gone completely white and sweat ran down their faces as they desperately clung to life. We can't move them and they're too damaged for my current skills to heal them, he said, referring to his potions. And the holy water of life was reserved for disease only, it couldn't cure wounds from what Izuku understood, where's your healer? H he's dead. Shadows, find and bring me the body of their healer. Beak looked up in shock, completely recovered by the potions, why? What are you doing? The only thing we can do. I don't have any healers amongst my shadows, so I need to borrow yours. Izuku raised a finger to point at the rank cameraman, you, turn off the camera. He obliged almost immediately when he saw the gleam of light in Izuku's eyes. Within 15 seconds, a high orc had Byung Jayu's headless body in his arms and he set him gingerly on the ground. Izuku, Essel said, Igris is struggling with overhaul, he's using the girl as a shield. Neither Karkinos or Igris can do anything. Then go help them. I'll follow you soon. At the very least make sure overhaul remains trapped inside the cave. Essel nodded. Karkinos is making sure of that. Good luck here. His head is missing. But since I managed to revive Tank from a pile of flesh, it should still work. Shadow extraction is possible on this target. Thank God for that. Arise. For just a moment, darkness oozed from Byung Jaya's body, but it quickly faded back into him. Shadow extraction had failed. Two attempts remaining. Arise. Shadow extraction had failed. One attempts remaining. Why? With my intelligence stat, this shouldn't be a problem. It's almost like he doesn't want to come back. Like it's reinforcing my belief that extracting the shadows of humans is wrong. Izuku shook his head as his eyes landed on the pale broken forms of the two girls. Well, too bad. The living take precedence. Arise. Shadows exploded from the body as Beak finally grabbed Izuku by the shoulder and screamed at him. What are you doing to my friend's body? Izuku ignored him as a hand shot out of the shadows, pulling together a mimicked form of the healer. You, Choi breathed out. Is this the source of your power? All of those shadows, they are enemies you have killed and brought back as your allies. The shadow of Byung Jayu didn't even wait for orders from his liege, instead choosing to brush past him and lay one hand on each of the girls for direct and powerful healing. Izuku smiled. My shadows are not the same as what they are mimicking, but they do take on qualities of those they are extracted from, which tells me just how kind he was. He acted before I could even ask him to. Almost immediately, the color returned to the faces of both heroes, their bones returned to their proper posture, and their wounds closed completely. With the job done, the shadow healer stood looking over the rest of the room and ensuring no one else was harmed. Beak's hand was still holding onto Izuku's shoulder, but the grip was looser and Izuku could see hints of pleading in his eyes. It didn't take him long to understand what that pleading meant. Cancel extraction. As Bayang Jaya faded away into nothingness, leaving only his physical body as a reminder, he and Beak gave each other a warm smile. Thank you. Izuku nodded and began walking to the same tunnel Essel had gone down. Tusk, Tank, Hayo, escort them outside, protect them at all costs. Using his gigantification, Tusk easily scooped up both of the still unconscious heroes in his hands, allowing them to rest comfortably with him. What about you? Ma Dong Wook asked. The immediate threat is gone, but the girl, Iri, is still trapped by overhaul. I'll finish it. Izuku said with confidence, sprinting away into the darkness of the tunnels. At the end of Overhaul's tunnel, a giant shadowy dragon head peeked into it, white light flowing from its mouth as it prepared to unleash the breath attack. 
Of course, for now, neither Carquinos nor Igris could do anything as Overhaul held his hand over Eri, threatening to turn her into nothingness if they came any closer. Igris understood that Overhaul had taken her for a reason, and because of that reason, he was unlikely to kill her, but at the same time, it was his mission to ensure her safety. He nor Carquinos could take any chances. The same was true for Essel and for a time, the three simply stood there, a Mexican standoff of otherworldly proportions. But then, just like that, Iri disappeared from over Hall's hands. Izuku hugged the shivering Iri tight to his chest, having removed the visual effects of his armor so that she could comfortably feel his warmth. Tears had been leaking from her eyes, but her fear had kept her from fully releasing those sobs. But when Izuku's hand went to pat her head, all the tension in her body was released and she bawled loudly into his shirt. W.H. what? Overhaul shouted, earning a threatening glare from Izuku. You, shut up. Now with the shadows holding him at blade point, and with Iri safe, Overhaul could do nothing to stop the monsters that were surrounding him. Eventually, Iri's cries faded to tired breaths as she passed into unconsciousness in Izuku's arms. Now, I want to ask you some questions. How many monarchs have hosts? What? What do you know of the monarchs? Here's a hint, Izuku said, I am a monarch. Overhaul stumbled backwards in fear, suddenly realizing why this boy had been so dangerous, so powerful. TTT there are four of them that I know of, BBB but they spoke of another like he had already found a host. Would that be in reference to me or another monarch? That Kurajiri seemed to recognize me in some way at the USJ. What are their plans? What? Their plans? Their next move? What is it? I I don't. Izuku sighed. The villain Overhaul who had confidently taken down a ruler-enhanced being and boasted in front of seven different S-rank, was now shaking in his boots. They probably gave him the task to eliminate Mirio and that's it, which means he's useless. Izuku thought for a moment about having Igris kill him right then and there so he could be converted into a shadow soldier, but he changed his mind quickly. He didn't want someone like this in his army. He didn't want to leave a single trace of his disgusting corpse remaining. So as he turned around, beginning to walk the way he came, he gave the only appropriate order, Carquinos. Once me and the girl are at a safe distance, turn this bastard into ash. No, Enigris and Essel jabbed their blades through his multiple arms, pinning him in place, making him helpless. They too could kill him without any trouble, but their liege had asked for this vile man to be utterly eradicated, reduced to atoms and they were going to do everything in their power to make sure his request was granted. It only took Izuku a few minutes of walking re-entering the cavern where the ant Namu corpse laid, to hear the massive thrum of energy that undoubtedly came from Carquinos. You have leveled up. You have reached the necessary level for your job-specific skills to increase. Shadow Extraction LV. 2. Shadow Storage LV. 2. Monarch's Domain LV. 2. Shadow Exchange LV. 2. It took me reaching level 105 to get here. Does that mean I have to get to 210 just to get them to the next level? Izuku hoped that wasn't the case. Igris and Essel appeared next to him moments later, standing at the ready behind their monarch as he looked over the corpse of the ant. Izuku nodded to himself and turned around, gently passing Iri off to Essel. Make sure she gets out of here and if possible, try to hand her off to one of the Japanese destroyers. All might already spread the word that my shadows were an ally. Why do we need to hand her off? Essel asked, honest curiosity in her voice, to which Igris responded by directing her attention to the massive pile of Namu embryos behind him and the other Namu that still attempted to escape from the Shadow Army. Igris is right. We still have a job to do and this one doesn't deserve to be put into any more danger. He handed Iri to Essel, who took her gently, enveloping the girl with her arms and one pair of wings, as if they were a blanket. You go, Carquinos will be blanketing the island soon with his attacks. So it'll be safer for her. Essel nodded and shot off into the sky. Her feathers creating blades of darkness that eviscerated anything even remotely close to her. Well, I suppose we should get started. Arise. Like all of his previous extraction events, the ant's shadow rose from his body, pulling into a sphere in front of Izuku. Izuku couldn't be certain, but it felt far denser than any other shadow he had obtained before. Seraph's blessed ashes. Those were the particles that surrounded Essel's extract, evolving her from an angel noble to a full-on seraph. Does that mean I can make this guy even stronger? Izuku nodded, yes. Shadow Namu Commander Grade has evolved to high-end Shadow Namu General Grade. Two new grades. So now the list in order would be Normal, Elite, Knight, Elite Knight, Captain, Commander, and then General. A. And I am aware that Commander and General are the same grades just from different sources. Commander is in the novel and General Grade is used in the webcomic. But like I did with Captain Grade, I simply wanted to add more grades for more possible progression. The ant manifested suddenly, its body looking far larger than before, with an additional set of arms slightly lower than its other pair. It looks like the ashes evolve the creature, so I can't expect the same thing if I just upgrade my shadow's grade only. 
It's too bad that I've only got two more uses out of the ashes. The ant's aura was far stronger than before, causing Izuku to worry for a moment that he had created something even stronger than himself. But then the ant kneeled to him, my leech. Keek keek, its mandibles clicked, it is my honor to serve you. He can speak, just like Essel. Does that mean commander or general grades give shadows the ability to speak? If it's commander then Igris only needs to rank up once more to be able to talk. Shadows able to be extracted, 222 734. Shadows able to be saved, 222 504. Izuku's eyes nearly bulged out of his head as he read over the numbers. It appeared that leveling up his job-specific skills had doubled both of the maximum shadow values. The system message slightly distracted him from the insane jump in power he had received and he began thinking as quickly as possible, not wanting to waste any time. Well, he looks like an ant so something around that, right? Oh, what was the name of that author who wrote that novel? The Ants. Bernard Werber. That's kinda a lame name. So how about? You are Baru. Kiyak. A shrill shriek of happiness escaped Baru's lips. There's still a lot of Namu remaining out there. My sense tells me there's at least a couple thousand. Four thousand and thirty-six to be exact my leech. Baru stated, still kneeling. Hem, that's a lot for the rest of the heroes to deal with, especially since they can fly. Karkinos can catch a decent chunk with his wide range attacks but, looking over to Baru, Izuku asked a simple question, if it's you, can you kill the rest? Baru stood, a clawed hand held over his chest, if you give the order, it shall be done. Izuku smiled, good, now exterminate every last Namu that once lived here. He disappeared from Izuku's sight the second the demand left his mouth, rushing off at full tilt to fulfill his liege's wishes. Izuku gave Igris a worried look, don't you think he's just a little too strong? If Igris could sweat, Izuku was sure he would be doing so. Baru possessed an asinine level of raw power and speed now that he had evolved. Oh well, it was my decision to enhance him. As long as he remains loyal, the only thing I should fear is underusing someone like him. And the only things left. Izuku turned to the pile of Namu embryos, or to finish this off, and to bolster the army. Using shadow extraction, he pulled out as many Namu corpses as he could fit into his shadow save, ending up with 282 new humanoid Namu all with wings. Geez, even if these things weren't at night grade, they'd be great as just basic manpower. Izuku realized as the Namu got to work, recovering magic cores from the bodies of the villains. We're not taking any of those cores, Izuku ordered. We should leave them so that Korea can use them to rebuild Jeju Island. The Namu dropped the crystal-like objects immediately. Besides, this magic core I got from Baru should be more than enough for my financial needs. He looked down at the onyx black core he had recovered, its color, for some reason, suddenly reminding him of Yeyarazu. Ah oh jeez, I haven't talked to her in over a week and then I'm going to show up on the news having cleared an S-rank gate. I hope she isn't too upset about anything. I'll worry about it later. Izuku reached into his inventory, pulling out a white and gold sword. Item, Genesis Blade. Item class, SS. Item type, Longsword. Plus 350 attack. A longsword imbued with the greatest power of the Seraph. A cleansing fire effect will activate with each swing. Effect cleansing fire. Summons blazes of white fire that will burn anything in its wide path. An SS rank. I've never seen an item with that class. Well, I suppose now is a good time to test it. Making sure his shadows were behind him. Izuku stepped up to the massive pile of black flesh and swung his sword, a ginormous blast of powerful exiting it just as it had said. Within mere moments, the entire birthing pile had been turned to ash, reveling in the insane power stored within the sword. Izuku smiled, walking off deeper into the caverns to eliminate any other nests he could find. Tiarate who was starting to become bored, stationed on board one of the Japanese destroyers. She was meant to be a stopgap alongside the dozens of other heroes against any escaping Namu. But she thought her talents were being wasted here. She was ranked at a low A. But thanks to her quirk, she was able to break through the S rank ceiling. In her opinion, she should have been amongst the Japanese heroes drawing the attention of the Namu for the Koreans. Or even hunting down the queen with the Koreans. But no matter what her opinion was, she was still stuck on that damn boat. It was for those reasons, her boredom the main one. That when she saw a dark shape flying in the sky, heading for them, that she became excited. Charging to the front of her agency team, she readied her katana, practically shaking with anticipation. But then a call came out from the captain of the destroyer, hold your fire. That's one of ours. Kiara began to wonder how such a dark shape could be mistaken for one of them. It was clearly a Namu, right? But as the figure grew closer, she changed her mind. White patches of light ran throughout their vaguely feminine shape, and two sets of feathery wings sprouted from her back. All Might says it's one of the hero's summons. So is that what people saw when people reported a giant shadow dragon? She wondered to herself. She had been below deck when Carquinos had flown overhead. The angel, no, the seraph landed on their deck without making a sound and looked directly to the captain. Is there a quiet place I may stay? 
she asked, unfurling her third set of wings just barely enough to show off the silver hair of Eerie. The entire deck's eyes widened as they recognized the identity of the girl. But absolutely, the captain waved over one of his underlings and ordered them to escort the shadow to safe quarters. All right people, we've got the girl. We're retreating to Japan. The other destroyers can handle it from here. What? Kiara complained to herself, the cheers of the other heroes overshadowing her disappointment. She was happy that the girl was safe, but she also wanted to fight some Namu. Th there it is. A voice suddenly shouted, pointing to a huge worm that was circling around the mountain, discharging beams of energy seemingly at random. Looks like we might have some action after all. The captain reported, the closer destroyers have already engaged some of the Namu. Ready yourself. Kiara once again got ready, ecstatic when she saw a legitimate Namu heading their way. First one is a blur shot by all of the destroyers with such speed it appeared to be in multiple places at once, mine. Kiara finished just as her eyes caught up with the phenomena, watching as the Namu dropped into the ocean, sliced in half. Oh come on. But Baru felt no remorse for taking the girl's kill. He only felt joy as he continued fulfilling his liege's request, carving through thousands of enemies within just 20 minutes. And so, just like that, with the help of Izuku Midoriya and his shadows, the Jeju incident came to an end. Eventually, the flood of Nama was massacred and all the surviving heroes were safely on the decks of their country's respective destroyers. Rukyu and Ed Shot in particular were deep in mourning when it came to the Japanese team. While the Koreans had only lost one of theirs, Japan had lost over half of their top 10. Hawks, Best Genist, Fat Gum, Crust, Gang Orca, and Musha were dead, along with Mirio whose true fate remained unknown. Maruko was still unconscious, recovering below deck after the Koreans had dropped her off. She would make a full recovery. Dabai stood awkwardly behind Rukyu, his presence being the only comfort he was giving out. Finally, Endeavor sat on deck with his back against one of the massive cannons, his expression slack and unfocused. With six body bags laid out across the deck, it was impossible to ignore how much of a loss this had been for the Japanese and the shock showed on most of the faces there. These were S-rank heroes, the top of the world, right? But instead of triumphing and standing atop their enemy's body, they had been turned into nothing more than a statistic. After the twenty or so minutes of Namu killing, it took only another five minutes for Izuku to begin retreating to his country's navy. As Karkinos brought him close, allowing him to hop off the dragon, onto the deck of the destroyer, he noticed Rukyu's slackened expression, unbeknownst to him. This was because of her obsession with dragons in relation to her quirk. She rarely got to see any up close as they were always trying to kill her, so one that was peaceful and under human control made her practically drool over it. Should I be jealous? Dabai asked teasingly. It was perhaps the wrong time for humor, but it was also the only way he knew how to handle tragedy, so believe it or not, it was his best attempt at consoling Rukyu. Upon helping All Might down to the deck alongside him and calling back Karkinos into his shadow, Izuku realized that Rukyu was stomping towards him. Should I be nervous? Her expression looks pretty serious. She's not going to blame me for coming in at the last second, is she? But instead of words of indignation and anger, Ryukyu stopped one meter from Izuku and with the most perfect posture he had ever seen, bowed at a 90-degree angle, please, use your power and bring my friends back. Izuku's eyes widened in shock and surprise as Ryukyu made such a loud and pleading declaration, essentially revealing the source of his powers to everyone on the boat. For a moment he panicked, unsure as to how to react, but thankfully, All Might covered for him. Tatsuma, young Midoriya's powers do not extend that far. He is only capable of healing, not resurrection. Yukiyu was about to shout back a retort. She had seen Izuku extract Tusk's shadow after all, but then she looked into All Might's eyes and saw a stern request buried within them. Almost immediately she understood her mistake. Whatever this boy's power was, he was doing his best to hide it and by exposing it, she decreased the chances that he would actually help her. Why don't we go get you some coffee? You've been on your feet for some time now. The tension shifted from Ryukyu's odd outburst and Izuku's appearance to All Might's less than muscular form. Is that really All Might? What happened? Is this the reason he didn't show up for this raid? All of these questions and more assailed the minds of the lesser ranks, distracting them from the fact that Izuku had disappeared from sight, following close behind All Might with stealth. Dabai apparently had a similar idea and followed suit. After the captain of the destroyer had given them a private soundproof room reserved for top government officials, Izuku sighed and let go of his stealth, eliciting a small squeak from Ryukyu and no reaction from Dabai or All Might. Do the others just have a really good poker face or is she just really jumpy right now? Sorry, he apologized, but I don't really want the nature of my army to become public knowledge at this time, and know it would be my place to apologize now. But, but you still want me to bring back the six that died. Izuku finished as he shook his head. Are you aware that most of my summons are not capable of speech and that all of them are merely copies of the original, not the original? Ryukyu nodded slowly. I figured as much. 
Then, why bring them back? Izuku, while still very much interested in bringing those 6S rank heroes into his army, was not about to disgrace their bodies and take what was essentially their soul for himself. He had been unsure of his decision to not take human shadows before, but after seeing Bayang Jayu's reaction to his extraction being cancelled, that being one of bliss, Izuku was certain. Taking the shadow of a human was like denying them peaceful rest and forcing them to be his slaves. Rukyu's answer was shockingly simple, because the world needs them. The world needs as many powerful heroes as it can get its hands on. She sighed wringing her hands out. Before we left for Jeju, all the heroes wrote up their wills just in case. On all of the top tens, except for Endeavor, there was a simple request. Find a proper heir to replace me, so that the world does not know fear. Ryukyu nodded as Izuku began to understand her heartfelt request. I still intend to find replacements for the top ten, but... Those six, nothing would make them happier than the ability to continue serving as protectors. Remembering just what the second rank top ten member had planned to do, Izuku asked Ryukyu if she had been aware of Endeavor's scheming. By the way her eyes widened and her heart began speeding up. Izuku could tell she was filled with rage, is that my sense stat? I'm not just able to sense people, but their emotions too. That bastard. Ryukyu's fist clenched and a part of the table they were sitting at broke under her pressure. It appears that I owe you an even bigger debt for saving Maruko from his schemes. One of Izuku's eyebrows raised. Oh, are her and Maruko close? Dabai scoffed. TCH, I'm still not a fan of you kid. But if you messed up my old man's plans, then I guess we're a little closer to being even. So, this is your honest request? Izuku asked. Had Rikiyu been knowledgeable about Endeavor's plans, he would have refused to extract the six shadows on principle alone. But if she was innocent and truly wished for it, then, yes, please. She bowed her head a little lower and Izuku nodded. Very well. The upper deck of the battleship had been completely cleared. Only Rukiu, Dabai, All Might, Izuku, and the six dead heroes remained. Actually, there was one more, Edshot, who Rukiu had told of Izuku's powers before he had agreed to extract their shadows. Before anything could get started, however, a figure appeared next to Izuku as if he was moving around via teleportation. Instead, it was just the fastest Namu alive. Baru kneeled, my liege, the small human has been delivered by Essel and the other humans are currently taking care of her. Izuku rested a hand on Baru's shoulder, you've done excellently, but I have one more task for you before you can rest. Anything my liege, please inform Essel that I wish for her to reside in the girl's shadow until further notice. Baru has some sort of enhancement power. We can't be too careful when it comes to her protection. It is as you say my liege. I will depart at once. Baru left much in the same way he had appeared, shocking the surrounding heroes. That, thing, is your summon. Yes, I'm sorry if he disturbed you. Baru's aura may have grown quite a bit, but it was still unmistakable as the abomination that had torn apart Ryukyu's team members. By it's all right. Izuku stepped forwards. The body bags of all the heroes opened up. Some recited without much of their body. None had their heads intact. Ryukyu wanted to tear her eyes away, but she could not ignore even a second of the process. I will begin. Arise. Without fail, all six shadows emerged from their respective hosts on the first try, as if they were attempting to prove Ryukyu right. These six weren't done yet. They weren't ready to give up the fight that easily. Shadow Human LV. 12 Elite Knight Grade. 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 They came out as elite knights even though they were weaker than one of my elite knights. I wasn't even given the option of using the Seraph's ashes on them. So does that mean this is a reaction of my shadow extraction skill reaching LV? 2. Izuku went by, one by one, assigning them the same names they had in life. Hawks, Best Genist, Yore Musha, Gang Orca, Crest, and Fat Gum. Stand, he commanded, calling them to their feet. Can any of you speak? It was a far-fetched question. It seemed that so far only commander or general grades could speak by default, but Essel existence proved that it wasn't an impossibility for another grade to speak. But, just as Izuku expected, all six shook their heads in unison and he turned back to Rukiyu. Have you changed your mind? I can dispel them at any time. Her face was frozen in an expression of shock, but that quickly morphed back to relief at the carefree smiles she saw on her comrades' faces. She had indeed made the right choice. Fox even offered her a small wave. And at that moment a single tear leaked down her face? No. Thank you. You have done more for me and for them than anyone would have ever thought possible. Just like that, Izuku had obtained six more beings of great power to stand among his other generals. At the same time Korea was holding a funeral to commemorate the passing of their fallen heroes. That of Min buying Jayo and a dozen or so who had perished onboard the destroyers from the Namu. Japan was doing the same. Hundreds if not thousands had gathered to see off the six top ten who perished on the island, living on in Izuku's shadow. 
One of the main people missing, however, was Endeavor. Izuku wasn't sure what had happened to him, but All Might assured him that both the agency association and the government would come down hard on Endeavor and the government official he had been working with. The news of such a betrayal to both the Koreans and two of his own people had yet to reach the public. In total, 52 of Japan's heroes had perished, and 20 civilians had lost their lives from the Namu that Baru did his best to catch up to. Mirio Tagata was among those counted. Though truthfully, no one had been completely certain as to what happened to him. All Might, after watching back the video recorded from the cameraman, similarly concluded that he wasn't sure. While it was apparently possible for rulers to perish, just as monarchs could, it seemed unlikely that Iik, the largest fragment of brilliant light could be killed with a simple artifact, even if it was a result of the monarch's work. Of course, perhaps most interesting of all, Izuku was suddenly receiving attention that was reserved only for celebrities of the highest status. Dozens of news networks contacted him at once, asking for interviews. He turned them all down, but that didn't stop them from reporting on him. Izuku Midoriya, Japan's newest heroic calamity. Upon further research, it appears that he is barely 16 years old, still pursuing his studies at UA. The school continues to reinforce the belief that if you want to be a hero, go there. There are hundreds of reports like that on the news, on the internet and there are even more forums discussing him. I'm glad he saved everyone he could, but that amount of summons isn't natural. Doesn't matter what quirk or what skills he has, it just defies all reason. If he had this much power, why wasn't he involved in the raid? Wasn't his upperclassman part of it? Do you think he's single? Izuku shook his head as he realized just how many comments there were about his love life. The service had ended quite some time ago and Izuku was retreating to his motorcycle after conversing with All Might for a moment. He could have easily run home, Quicksilver carrying him far faster than any motor vehicle. But he didn't want to ruin this nice suit he had bought with his sweat. The day Izuku returned, he had deposited Baru's core at one of the many high-end auction houses. Within the hour, it had sold for an exorbitant price, nearly 100 million yen, a, and around 900k in USD. Adding on to his quickly growing monetary value, Izuku began to realize he could be considered far more than wealthy. He hadn't just sold Baru's core, but a few of his old weapons and leftover materials from the Heavenly Palace. He could buy anything he wanted now. With his mother awake, his monetary troubles thrown into the wind and his power far surpassing that of most S-ranks in the country, Izuku felt like he had reached the pinnacle of his desires. By now, going back to school sounded like a ridiculous thing to do. What should I do? Mom will probably want me to go back to UA. And I can't exactly disagree with that sentiment. Dropping out of high school sounds too disgraceful to me. Even if the goal of that school is to turn me into what I am now. Izuku smiled. These are some pretty lame concerns compared to what my week has been like. Oh well. Looking down at the time on his phone Izuku realized that his mother was scheduled to be discharged about an hour from now and Sakura would be there visiting with her. Guess that's my next destination. He climbed onto his motorcycle, no helmet secured on his head. After all, even if a car slammed into him head on, it'd be more prudent to worry about the car, not Izuku. But before he could start up the machine and head off, a voice stopped him. Excuse me, Izuku Midoriya. Izuku had half a mind to ride away regardless. The pleas of the approaching man sounded all too much like the reporters that continued to hound him. But then, the man's appearance stopped him. He was dressed in rather formal clothing, befitting of a governmental agent. I'm Ensign Matsuo, with the Japanese Navy. The Navy. What do they want with me? Izuku dutifully shook the man's hand. This is in regards to the girl you rescued from Jeju, Eri. Sir, he added on, likely feeling weird about calling a 16-year-old sir. Is she okay? Izuku had heard nothing from Essel, so it was unlikely that something had happened, but he had to be sure. She's physically well, due to her immense potential and, well, to be frank, lack of family too. She's being watched over on one of our naval bases. The man combed his hand through his hair. Well, the true issue is her psyche. She's being treated by our best doctors, but even then, the girl refuses to sleep and she barely eats. It's starting to wear on her quite a lot. The doctors are fearing that. We're worried about her to say the least. Izuku scratched at his cheek awkwardly. Well, um, excuse me for saying this but, what can I do about it? Every now and again, some of the hallways can get a bit rowdy and it scares the girl. One of those times, a shadowy angel left her room and slammed one of the guys against a wall, threatening him if he didn't quiet down. Izuku couldn't help but let out a chuckle at Essel's natural motherly instincts. He had instructed her to keep her safe from any physical threats. So her actions were almost certainly her own, she um, she didn't hurt anyone did she? A few bruises, but nothing serious. That thing is one of your summons, correct, sir? Izuku nodded. I put her there to protect Iri. That's a relief to hear, because she's been the only thing comforting the girl. Whenever your summon shows up, Iri actually manages to get an hour or so of sleep and sometimes, she'll even eat. 
We asked her why she only does it with the angel around and she told us because she knows the monsters won't get her while your shadow is around. Izuku's heart beat out of rhythm for just one moment as the depressing reality of that belief sunk in. She was so terrified that it took the aura of a shadow that surpassed S rank to comfort her. Well then, I can instruct my summon to stay out with her as much as possible. Matsuo nodded, that is one solution, sir. Izuku tilted his head, what's the other? We would like to ask you and your family to take in this girl. Izuku's eyes widened as the man bowed low to him, please sir. It is no good for the moral of our men to know they can do nothing as they watch this girl waste away, so please save her. The next day, Izuku went back to school. He was still mulling over the request Matsuo had given him. So in the meantime, he had instructed Essel to remain out at all times and act as motherly as she could. Just the fact that Essel refused to disappear was enough to allow Eri to get a full night's sleep for the first time. In the meantime, he had his hands full with his return to education. Yeyorazu treated him about the same as always. Although after explaining the situation he'd gone through, she seemed even more bold and insisted on holding hands as they walked through the hallways. The rest of the school, on the other hand, was not nearly as inviting. Some of his classmates still treated him the same, having known him before for a bit of time, although there was always some sort of tension when talking to them. While before he had been a powerhouse even among his peers, now he was basically a god with an army at his disposal. Of course, not everyone was as disturbed as some. Bakugo went on to treat him as he normally did, shouting about how he would kill him and all that. Most would probably be annoyed by this lack of change in the bully, but Izuku found it almost reassuring. Just because he had changed didn't mean everyone else would. Mina, Kaminari, Minta, Todoroki, Gyro and a few others, much to his shock, only seemed to grow friendlier towards him. He didn't think much of Gyro, Kaminari or Mina's reaction as they were generally all really nice to begin with. Minta at first, like others, appeared to be frightened by him, but as Izuku quickly learned, his remarks about his strength were merely banter between peers. Todoroki surprised him the most, forcing him to come up with a few theories. The most likely of which was that Dabai had informed his younger brother of what Izuku had done to mess with his father's plans and if Todoroki was anything like his older brother, he hated his father. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Of course, there was also the possibility that Todoroki held no ill will towards his father and was merely relieved that Izuku had saved him. Regardless of why they were comfortable around him, Izuku welcomed it. This was exactly what he'd been looking for. Something a bit more normal that reminded him he was still human. You're gonna be a dad. Mina asked just a tad too loudly as the rest of the lunchroom stared at Izuku like he was some sort of an- What? No, I mean, I'm not sure. Not right now. Izuku shook his head. Besides my current apartment is way too small to accommodate a little girl. So just get a bigger apartment. Kaminari suggested like it was the simplest explanation in the world. Which is because it was. I mean, with your strengths, getting that much money shouldn't be that hard right? He was right. Izuku already had more than enough money to buy a mansion. Great idea Dofus, Gyro said. Punching his arm, it completely ignores the fact that he's 16 and still in high school. Who in his position would want a kid? Mina hesitantly raised her hand and when greeted with a few surprised looks from Ida and Todoroki she explained, Oh come on, who doesn't want a kid? A little bundle of joy running around your house. I concur that a child is indeed a blessing, Ada said, but one must not underestimate the effort and care that is needed to raise one. It would be irresponsible of Midoriya to accept responsibility for this child when he is away at school for most of the day and taking care of gates or homework in his spare time. Izuku tilted his head awkwardly. Actually, that wouldn't be a huge problem. Iri's already become really attached to one of my summons, Essel. She takes care of most of Iri's needs already at the base and since she's one of two of my summons who are able to talk, it makes her a perfect stand-in for a mother. When he noticed some of the odd glances he was getting in response to suggesting that a summon raise a child, he changed the subject. Anyways, it'd be weird for me to move into a place just me and her. My mom won't ever leave that apartment. He refused to explain why. And my sister's school is right there. So unless I moved into a smaller place, myself and a little girl would be too few people for a home. Then have Yeyorazu move in with you. Kaminari once again suggested out of the blue, receiving another punch from Gyro. Oh, will you quit that? They're already dating. It kinda makes sense. Oh, and did you ever consider the fact that they didn't want to move that fast in their relationship? Don't try to pressure someone into that. Sorry mom. Kaminari responded, receiving another punch. Alright that's it. Stop punching me. Gyro went to throw one last punch for good measure, but Kaminari had actually been goading her into it and just as her fist made contact, he turned his electric powers up to minimal charge, shocking her in return. As those two continued to bicker, Izuku and Yeyorazu were exchanging curious glances, as if gauging what the other thought about Kaminari's idea. Their silent exchange went something like this. What do you think? I've been wanting to get a new place for a while now. Kaminari didn't pressure you did he? 
I'm fine with moving in together, but a child. Asil is doing a good job as a mother. Nanny, do you really want to put the growth of a child in the hands of a summon? Granted it's your summon, but still. My mother could visit every now and again. Or, I could drop out of school. What? Yeyarazu accidentally blurted out loud, startling the table and herself with just how in-depth their silent conversation had become. I'm serious, Izuku said to Yeyarazu as they began walking home from school. It hadn't even been a possibility in my mind the other day, but now with Iri in need, I feel like dropping out is the right choice. Yeyarazu bit her lip. With the strength you've reached, I don't doubt you're making more than enough to support three people, but I just wanted to make sure this is what you want to do, not something you feel like you have to do. Izuku smiled. I get to live a luxurious life at home with an adopted daughter and my girlfriend and don't have to worry about school. What's not to love about that? Yeyarazu couldn't help but smile at that. Before now, I didn't think I'd have any reason to drop out and my mom wanted me to stay, so I figured I'd just go along with it, but now I've got a real purpose behind it, then I'm going to do the same. Yeyarazu declared, giving Izuku's hand a squeeze as his eyes bulged out. What? Why? Well, as a hero of your current status, school has kind of become irrelevant. It's designed to help people handle their quirks and get them scouted into high-ranking agencies. But if you've got a direct line to All Might himself, then forget joining an agency, let's create our own. About that, Izuku said, nervously looking down. We can't. Not yet. I talked to All Might at the funeral about this. He said he could waive something simple like the necessary amount of heroes needed for a raid since my shadows were so strong. But he simply couldn't allow a miner to undertake the running of an agency. He said it had to be someone 18 or up. It was something the rest of the people in charge wouldn't budge on. So then, let's just hire someone. Izuku shook his head. It's not that simple. We need someone who is an S rank or someone has an agency license. Basically everyone who meets those requirements already have an agency of their own, or they're part of a substantial agency. And they're not likely to give that sort of thing up for two kids. Then I guess we just have to wait until we're 18. Yeah, Izuku said sighing. Well, we've got all these plans, but it's probably to sleep on them for a few days before we decide for certain. Asil is certain she can handle Iri for a few more days. Yeyarazu agreed as they came to the point where they had to head opposite directions. She planted a small kiss on his lips as her goodbye and headed off, her long hair waving behind her as Izuku sighed once more. Although this time, he sighed as his heart melted. For some reason though, he could have sworn he felt some sort of emanation of jealousy from his shadow. W was that Baru, or Igris, or all of them. Izuku shrugged and shook his head with a smile. Completely unaware that at his school, someone with the face of Achako Yuraka was placing plastic explosives all over the school's structures. I'm home. Izuku called out as he walked through the door, setting down his bag on the couch and strolling into the kitchen for a snack, his jaw slightly slackening when he saw who was there waiting for him. His mother was holding a cup of coffee, Sakura was sipping on lemonade, and Maruko lifted her tea in greeting. Hey. Hey. Maruko called out in the small apartment, raising her small cup of tea to him. She was dressed in a relatively simple outfit, a white t-shirt, shin-length jeans, and boots. It seemed like she dressed more for practicality than to impress. M. Maruko, Izuku asked, surprised by the presence of the teenager. What are you doing here? Or rather, how'd you find out where I lived? What? Am I not allowed to thank my savior? She asked with a massive smirk as she lightly punched him on the shoulder. Well, maybe lightly was the wrong word for it. It looked light, but the attack was enough to stumble the unprepared Izuku a tiny bit. Is she bad at holding back? No, she would have broken a normal person's arm with strength like that. She's testing me, isn't she? A thought ran through his head as an unexpected event occurred. Baru leapt from Izuku's shadow, grabbing at the hero's wrist with more than enough force to break it. Izuku's eyes widened. He must have thought she meant to harm me in some way. Izuku's gauntlets wrapped around his hands and he stopped Baru's fingers moments before they were about to crush Maruko's wrist. Then he grabbed the bug by the head and dragged him back away from Maruko. You ever try to hurt someone I know ever again, and I will cancel your extraction. I don't care how strong you are. The threat was quiet, but it held considerable weight for Baru. Within the blink of an eye, Baru was kowtowing on the floor, his head pressed up against the hardwood. Forgive me my leech. It will never happen again. Izuku sighed heavily and called the bug back to his shadow, storing away his gauntlets at the same time. Sorry about him. He's hasty. But Maruko only smiled in response, while his mother and sister seemed surprisingly relaxed. W why aren't you guys freaking out? Inko smiled warmly. Honey, your father was an S rank before. Well, anyways, I saw plenty of exchanges like that when I went to his agency, back when we were younger. I just think he's cool, Sakura responded, and I'll never turn down a good fight. Maruko looked at Mrs. Midoriya sheepishly for a second. Ah, but I'd also hate to ruin your home. Inko chuckled as she began dragging away Sakura. Well, we'll let you two have your chat. What? No, Sakura cried out. We just started talking with her. 
It's Maruko for crying out loud. But Izuku's mom was having none of that, and easily dragged away her daughter. Izuku did feel a slight pang of guilt for his younger sister. After all, S ranks, especially the top 10, held more fame than any other celebrity. Getting pulled away from the Maruko. Who had entered your house for a chat? Well, it was simply unimaginable. As soon as the two were out of the way, Maruko set down her cup and got within a few centimeters of Izuku, mirroring the first time they had met at the UA Sports Festival, or rather during its incident. Her nose twitched imperceptibly as she got uncomfortably close. Silence enveloped the two of them for a few moments before Izuku asked, Why are you really here? Something tells me you wouldn't track down my family home just to thank me. Maruko's serious gaze disappeared, replaced by her trademark smirk, I want two things. Quite demanding towards her savior, Izuku thought with amusement in his eyes. Number one I want to go on a date with you. The first declaration was made with such seriousness that Izuku couldn't help but bark out a laugh, it didn't dissuade her in the slightest. Second, I want to fight your strongest summon. Come, now that's an interesting request. He thought to himself, prepared to respond as Maruko opened her mouth a third time. Finally, hold on, didn't you say TW? I want to start an agency with you. Once again, Izuku felt like belting out a laugh, but he restrained it, only because this conversation now served to go his way. Well, I can't say I'm against your last two requests, but I am already seeing someone. Maruko shook her head. What, is she the jealous type? Um, I don't think so. But when a guy in a relationship goes out on a date with another girl, then if she's not the jealous type, I see no problem in sharing you. I'm not necessarily opposed to it. Sharing me. What's up with this girl? You don't even know me and yet you're already willing to share me with another girl. Maruko gave him a teasing glare. Hey, if there's one thing that turns me on, it's strength, and you're just about the strongest person I've met that doesn't stink like a rabbit's turds. I'm beginning to regret the entirety of this conversation. Izuku shook his head. Sorry, but I'm not about to risk something good I've got going just cause you've got compatibility issues. Alright, then how about this? I fight your strongest summon. If I win, I get a date. If you win, you get to form an agency with me. Hold on, wasn't that one of your requests? Why do I have to suddenly fight for it? Maruko's lips curled up into something close to evil. These bunny ears aren't just for looks you know. I know that you want an agency with your girlfriend, so I might as well turn it into a leveraging tool if I can't get my first request. Well then regardless of what happens, it sounds like you win. Maruko shrugged. You've also got a chance to earn something you want, don't you? It just so happens to be something I also want. I suppose it's not like I have anything to lose in this situation. Even if she manages to win, then what's the harm with one date? Doesn't mean it'll become some sort of regular thing. Izuku smiled, deal. But uh, where are we gonna fight? If we clashed anywhere around here, it would just turn everything to ash. The agency association has a gym that can withstand most attacks. We can head there. Come, Izuku murmured to himself as he sent out his perception, searching for the soldiers he had stored within a few particular heroes. Ah, uh, he exclaimed as he found just the dragon lady he was looking for and she was right where he wanted to be. Maruko gave him a few odd glances, but a cute squeak escaped her lips as Izuku grabbed her by the shoulders and pulled her close. Mom, I'll be going out for a bit. Okay, you and Maruko have fun on your date. Aye, it's not a date. Before Maruko could wonder any further about why Izuku had pulled her close, he spoke one word. Exchange. Skill. Shadow exchange has activated. In Kai black shadows crept up Maruko's and Izuku's legs as their world went dark and they appeared just behind Ryukyu, storing away some practice weapons that had been used by some of her trainees. As appropriate of her S-rank status, she quickly felt the presence of someone behind her, someone with immense power that hadn't been standing there moments earlier. She spun around rapidly. One hand outstretched to attack the presence with her growing claws. Izuku caught her wrist like he was lightly snatching a leaf out of the wind as he wore an embarrassed smile. Sorry to startle you. We were just here to use the gem. Rukyu's eyes widened as she realized who she had just attacked. When did you? Her lips curled upwards into a small smile. Actually, never mind. I should know by now that you don't follow any sort of normal. Logic. She trailed off as she saw Maruko was blushing bright red pressed up against Izuku's chest. Like I said. Not logical. Maruko pushed herself away from Izuku as he asked, Do you think the association president would be fine with us borrowing the gym for a while, even though we're not part of any agencies? Mukiu chuckled at his request for permission. His power makes me forget he's still young. As she walked past the two, resting a hand on Izuku's shoulder, You're Japan and Korea's golden boy now, you can basically do whatever you want. Korea's? Wait, did you seriously not know? Izuku tilted his head curiously. Jeju Island was one of the biggest disasters in Korea's history and without you, it could have been considered one of the worst raids in history, with Kamish being the only possible exception. In one fell swoop, Korea would have lost all of their S-rank heroes and it's likely those Namu would have continued on to devastate the rest of their country. 
Mukiu shook her head. By that point, it didn't matter that you were a foreigner to them, it just mattered that you won. And now that you have, you've got more pull in Korea and Japan than most countries do. It was a dizzying revelation to Izuku. He knew that he had become a celebrity of sorts, and that people were talking about him, but this, it sounded like he had gotten far more than he had wished for. For just a moment, a brief moment, he considered what he could do with this. He could start a bidding war between nations and become so rich he'd never have to work another day in his life. If the Americans, Russians, or Canadians became interested in him, he might have even been able to leverage his power enough to get a hold of some of their most powerful magical artifacts. But of course, this sudden rush of greed wore off pretty quickly. Izuku could make all the money he needed off of Gates. The store in the Gates provided him with all the magical equipment he wanted, and he didn't like the idea of a country essentially owning him. Although Izuku once heard of special authority rank heroes in America, or national rank as most people called them, People like Thomas Andre or Christopher Reed who were so powerful that they were considered as entire nations on their own and completely free of the influence of any government in the world. What an existence, Izuku thought to himself as he thanked Rukyu for her information and for her understanding with their sudden intrusion. The pleasure's all mine. A final warning though, with your power, you're going to be approached soon about joining the top 10. Sometimes the process is painless, but since we're filling so many spots right now, there's bound to be fierce competition between veterans. Some of those vets aren't going to like a teenager like yourself stepping in. It's true, Maruko said, the blush on her face having faded substantially. I wasn't even that close to his spot, but Endeavor and a few other people who hadn't made it onto the top 10 that year tried to harass me about it. So, what do you do? I kicked everyone except Endeavor into the side of a building. She answered like it was the most nonchalant thing in the world. Huh, Rukiu made her farewells after that, having some agency business to attend to. Izuku and Maruko stepped up to the sparring space, basically, a giant rectangular platform made of magically reinforced materials. So, how do you want to do this? Like I said, you bring out your strongest summon and I fight it. Izuku smiled, are you trying to lose? After witnessing him while he was alive, you don't think you can handle Baru now that he's stronger do you? Baru, is that what you named that Namu bastard? Maruko showed no anxiety however. And before Izuku could say anything, she went to take off her shirt. Thanks to his powerful reflexes, he looked away before he saw anything. What are? I'm wearing a sports bra, doofus. It's much easier to fight like this. She then removed her boots and then her jeans. Thankfully, she had spandex shorts on under that as well. It seemed that she wore this sort of getup at all times, just so that if she was off duty, she could strip down to the bare necessities and fight. As she began bouncing on the balls of her feet, Izuku realized something that he hadn't noticed during the Jeju Island raid. That's right. I meant to ask you, do you just not use a weapon? Nope. My legs are my biggest asset, so I like to only focus on them. Izuku nodded. If she was a swordsman I'd probably lead with Igris, at the very least as a warm-up, but since it's a hand to. Feet. Brawl, Baru is definitely the right choice. I just hope she's not frightened by him. He raised his hand to about chest level, as if he was lifting something up. Come forth. Baru emerged from his lead's shadow, still with his head on the ground after feeling remorseful about the earlier incident with Maruko. Forgive me my liege, I did not intend to harm the weakling. Izuku raised an eyebrow. Mind your manners, that weakling is standing right behind you. That is correct my liege. Oh so he knew she was there. He just didn't care. Maruko sneered at the ant. Come on. Stop groveling and fight me, my liege, Baru asked, looking up at Izuku, as if asking for permission. Izuku tilted his head forwards in acknowledgement. Fight to win, but don't do anything that'll cause permanent damage. Maruko felt a slight chill permeate her body as Izuku gave Baru that sincere order. And at that moment, a faint memory from when she had first woken up on the helicopter from Jeju Island. Her Korean wasn't perfect, so she hadn't caught the full meaning of the conversation then, but now part of her mind was piecing it together as Baru rose to his full height and looked down on her. As Beak trembled in his seat, adrenaline and fear beginning to leave his body, that power. Was I hallucinating? Choi shook his head, cleaning his glasses with a disturbing amount of focus? No. I saw it as clear as you did. Just who is he? Ma Dong Wook began, to control the force of life and death. K I I I E E K. Maruko snapped back to reality just in time to see Baru's arm heading for her side. It was the same place he had struck her back on Jeju. This time though, Maruko knew its strength and speed. Leaning back far enough that her back was perfectly parallel with the ground, she braced one palm on the concrete-like surface, lifting her right leg off the ground as Baru's hand swept over her torso. She kicked at the opposite side of the spot he was aiming for on her, but her leg only grazed open air. That speed, that's not right. Her face was now starting to show a bit of concern. Not for her life of course, but for her pride. 
Maruko the hero was supposed to be undaunted by everything, right? So why was an ant suddenly filling her with such an instinctual response? Growling, she lifted her other leg off the ground mere milliseconds after her first kick, now supporting her body with only one arm. To any normal observer, it might look like she was trying to perform a handstand of sorts, but to Izuku, it looked like a death blow. Using the momentum from her first kick, Maruko's leg, now supercharged with mana, headed straight for the ground, Luna fall. A platform exploded, a shockwave effect rapidly approaching the somewhat stunned Baru. Not expecting to be confronted with such a technique after the human had shown no such signs of strength on the island. The shockwave was enough to off-balance both Izuku and Baru for just a moment. It was such a brief moment that only 22 other people on Earth could have taken advantage of it before Baru's wings snapped open. Baruko was one of those people. Luna Arc. It was a kick so powerful that she rarely got to use it during normal raids, for fear that she hurt the other raid members with its backlash. Unfortunately, to Baru, it was barely more than a passing breeze. Forgive me, weakling. I wasn't taking you seriously at first. Kick kick kick. It seems I gave you too much of an opening. Baru's arm was held up leisurely, Maruko's leg desperately attempting to break through it. Baru's free arm shot forwards, his fingers, and their retracted claws, wrapping around Maruko's torso and slamming her into the ground, just hard enough to not knock the wind from her lungs. Undaunted, Maruko's legs whipped up with an impressive amount of flexibility, wrapping around Baru's next as she pulled to the side with all her might, attempting to slam him into the ground beside her. But he didn't budge. It was like she was trying to move a marble pillar with her legs. No, it would actually be easier to move a real marble pillar with just her legs. This was like trying to move a mountain. Then, if I have to move a mountain, so be it. Izuku's gaze went wide. She's not seriously thinking she can still win, right? Perhaps it was a leftover instinct from his time as a Namo. But Baru knew in that moment that this woman was his enemy and that he had to kill her to protect his leech. With one arm holding her down, two of his other arms reached up, prying her legs off his neck like it was barely an inconvenience. She only made things worse by continuing to pour mana into her legs to strengthen them. Raising his fourth arm, razor sharp claws emerged from his fingertips. K I I I E E K. That's enough, Izuku said calmly, grabbing Baru's fourth arm by the wrist. I think we both know who lost that. Baru realized what he was doing and relaxed his grip on everything he was holding to, allowing Maruko to weakly fall to the ground, panting heavily, sweat running down her forehead. Please forgive me, my leech. Izuku shrugged it off and recalled Baru into his shadow. After all, this likely wouldn't have happened if Maruko hadn't pushed herself so far. I still don't get it. Even if you somehow thought I was the love of your life from the moment you met me, it doesn't make sense to go this far for it. Because, she spat out, you, saved me. Izuku shook his head. It's what anyone would have done in my position. If you really feel like you owe me then just say thanks. You don't need to devote your life to me for something like this. No, you don't get it. Maruko shifted her brilliant red irises from the ceiling to Izuku. I'm a solo hero. I don't have any agency or team. I just run around the country, helping in any raid I can. I've always been the one to save others. I never had the liberty of having someone save me. Maruko pushed herself into a sitting position. I know that. Well, it's shallow, but that part of me just can't help it. Being attracted to that strength. It, it makes me feel like I'm safe. And even though that's the only part of you that I know right now, I want to know more. I want to get to know you, so I can. Maruko looked down, her face turning bright red, so I can know the deeper reasons why I feel like I love you. Ah oh, jeez. Izuku brushed a hand through his hair, a warm smile on his face as he gazed right back into Maruko's embarrassed eyes. You're a handful, you know that. He offered her a hand up, but I don't dislike you either. Maruko's heart skipped a beat, so, if you truly feel this way. He scratched the back of his head awkwardly for a moment, and uh, if Yeyarazu's okay with it, then I think I'd like to get to know you more as well. Maruko's smile returned in full force, but this time, it was not teasing or arrogant, it was one full of joy. She took his hand, then I guess we should get started on that agency of ours. Midoriya, what's bothering you? Yeirazu asked as the two walked down the halls. We've gotten our wish of being able to run an agency of our own, alongside. Yeirazu took a moment to calculate which place Maruko was at now, number two hero. Wait, wouldn't she be three? I'm not counting Endeavor. Ah, uh, news of Endeavor's betrayal, of both his own team and the Koreans, had broken just the other day and rather understandably. The public was up in arms about it. Some of the more patriotic Japanese citizens understood what he was trying to do and barely blamed him, or even defended him, but for the most part, the country basically wanted him dead for shaming them so incredibly. Korea, much to the surprise of all, handled it much better. Perhaps it was because Japan lost more heroes, or because they had made up for their mistake with the appearance of Izuku. Regardless, this understanding completely melted into fury when Japan announced they'd be keeping him on the top 10. 
Endeavor has made a grievous mistake and we are working on a suitable punishment as I make this announcement. But, gates continue to appear and we continue to rely on the strength of heroes. As such, we have no choice but to let him remain as a hero. Maybe it wouldn't have been so bad had they simply removed him from the top 10 and left the announcement at that. Unfortunately, someone thought the correct decision was to keep him up there as a symbol. I'm serious. Yayorazu declared with conviction. You've been acting strange these past five days. Did something with the system happen? She made sure to whisper her question. Until Maruko could guarantee the setup of their agency. They were essentially on standby and continued school as if nothing was changing. Izuku paused. He'd been wondering for the last couple of days how he should tell her about Maruko's attraction to him and how their conversation had ended. I think I'd like to get to know you more as well. God that was so stupid. Why would I say something like that when I'm already dating Yeirazu? Yeirazu sighed and pulled him off to the side, hiding in a corner partially obscured by lockers. I swear Izuku, this is how relationships end. If you can't act normally around me because you have this on your mind, then you should just let it out. Izuku fidgeted for a moment under her gaze before he felt Baru's presence at the edge of his mind. My liege, I believe it would be best to tell her. Nothing will be resolved if you continue to remain silent. Wow, that's actually some really mature advice for once Baru. Thanks, your gratitude pleases me to no end, my liege. And if the girl is not happy with your new relation with the prey, then your valuable army is always here to execute whoever deserves it. And you've officially lost any brownie points you just earned. Also, stop calling Maruko prey. It's creepy. The conversation between the two, which happened at the speed of thought, was over before there was even time for an awkward pause between Yeirazu and Izuku. Izuku sighed, all right. You're right, I'm sorry. So um, Maruko, likes me. Yeirazu tilted her head, wasn't that obvious. For some reason, Yeirazu's calm demeanor scared him. She said she wanted to get to know me better and I said I'd like to get to know her better as well, oh on a more personal level. The onyx-haired beauty let out a small giggle that made Izuku's heart flutter. I've known she was going to be a rival since she showed her face. Yeirazu leaned close to whisper into his ear. But that doesn't mean I'm going to lose in this battle for your love. That bunny can try as hard as she wants, but you're mine. A shiver ran through Izuku's body, but not from fear, rather from excitement. The excitement that someone cared that deeply about him to make a declaration like that. Now, Yeirazu said, pulling away, is thaw. Everyone get down. Izuku shouted suddenly, diving forwards to cover Yeirazu with his body, and Tank emerging to cover Izuku with his body just as explosions began rocking the school. Through his sense stat, he felt as all the gyms were blown up. Then the faculty center, then they reached the main building. Tank and Izuku were buffeted by the multiple detonations that blew out the windows and filled classrooms with pressure waves. Come forth, as the structural integrity of the bottom floor they were on continued to fail. Izuku's shadows poured from his back, each taking positions along the area to support what the explosions had destroyed. My liege, Baru cried, preparing to throw the brutish tank off of his master. He didn't trust the shadow as much as he trusted his own ability to safely secure their leech. Tank stood, revealing that both Izuku and Yeirazu were perfectly unharmed. Though the explosions were violent and surprising, they weren't dangerous, at least, not to heroes of their caliber. I'm fine, worry about everyone else. Izuku stood amongst the dusty hallways as many screaming students ran past him. All shadows not holding up the school, evacuate the upper floors as quickly as possible. He turned to Baru. I want you making sure that each and every injured student is properly healed. Why yes my liege. Baru, it appeared, had not just gained mastery over the Korean language when he ate Byung Jai's head, but also his healing ability, making him an insanely versatile shadow. Hundreds of shadows poured off his back and into the stairwells, making for anyone who was trapped above. Izuku picked up Yeirazu and began running. Come on, we've got to get to the cafeteria. WH what? Why? As soon as Izuku sprinted out the school's front doors, Karkinos's shadow leaked from him, swirling into the sky as he prepared for air evacuation. Because, that's the only place that wasn't bombed. And because, I feel something strong in there. Two minutes earlier. Back Hugo had woken up late today and was forced to miss out on his breakfast as a result. Growling to himself, he stalked through the cafeteria, heading for the counter where all students were served. Entering the line, he was disappointed to see that icy hot bastard standing in front of him. Even more unfortunately for him, Todoroki's senses were probably the most attuned to mana, meaning that as soon as Back Hugo appeared, he felt it. Good morning Back Hugo. He greeted with the same dead expression he held every day. Did you have a nightmare last night? Back Hugo was taken aback for just a moment before shouting back. What are you on about you half and half bastard? You look tired. I've been feeling tired recently as well. A nightmare coincided with each exhausting morning. TCH. What a load of bullcrap. 
Bakugo scolded outwardly, but on the inside, he felt just a little relief that he wasn't the only one who had been losing sleep over creations of his mind. Honestly, what idiot part of my subconscious comes up with a name like Baron, the monarch of white flames and boasts about it in a dream? Indeed, these past few nights, Bakugo had been kept tossing and turning in his bed as a demonic being with red eyes, gray skin, and two massive horns accosted him in his sleep. What a load of bullcrap, he repeated to himself, as if he was trying to convince himself. In front of him, Todoroki tilted his head, did you feel that? Feel Bakugo cut off as a feeling all too similar to intense nauseousness assailed his body and he dropped to his knees. He was about to worry about looking stupid, but then he noticed Todoroki collapsing in front of him and all the students around them either stumbling forwards or passing out altogether. This mana, it's like a grizzly bear sitting on my back. Just then, as explosions began taking place all over the school a figure at least three times the size of a normal human came crashing through the skylight of the cafeteria, landing with a force capable of killing the dozen or so students unlucky enough to be near the figure. <sighs> Just like stepping on ants, an aged and husky voice spoke out, Now, which one of you ants is my prey? The dust cleared and Bakugo managed to tilt his head up enough to see a blonde man with muscles the size of a hydraulic press staring right at him. As the man's lips curled up to form a demented smile, Bakugo realized this man had a massive scar tracing its way down the left side of his face and where his left eye should have been was an orb of pure steel. Looks like you're my prey. Suddenly, the pressure wore off and Bakugo shot back to his feet, his hands crackling with explosion. But it seemed that Todoroki was quicker and a mound of ice shot out from his foot, expanding outwards to cover the villain's entire body. Hey icy hot. That one was. Mine. He trailed off as all the color drained from Todoroki's face. Why you have to run? Todoroki said, his knees quaking. He's after you, I'll slow him down. What are you Bakugo's mana sense finally caught up to his classmates and he felt like puking once more. Hey pray. A voice said from right behind Bakugo, are you gonna fight? Or are you gonna roll over and play dead? Without even making a noise, the villain had somehow escaped from the icy prison. Bakugo answered with a roar, spinning around and detonating his quirk in the man's face. That wasn't an attack, was it? The man asked, his inhumanly large hand reaching out to grasp Bakugo's forearm and with barely any force, snapped it in two. I I I G G G H. Bakugo collapsed, his shattered arm still in the man's grip. Whoops, I guess I used a bit too much force, but then again, I'm sure Baron won't mind repairing such a simple wound. Even in his pain-addled state, Bakugo was still able to make out that name, Ba. Ren, what are you? The man's still human eye lit up with happiness. Well this body belonged to one of your human criminals. I believe your police called him. Muscular. But that man is gone now. My name is Stellion, the monarch of the iron body. You guys. Have dumb names. Stellion gave a hearty laugh. Oh you and Baron will bind just fine. You're both insufferable whelps. Bakugo suppressed the urge to scream once more as Stellion's grip on his arm only grew tighter. By now, his bones were nothing more than powder. Stellion reached behind him. Mana pooling in his hand as a small hole in space, a gate, began appearing. As it reached about the size of a basketball, he felt a small warmth tickle his back. Heh, even this one could generate stronger heat than that. Damn, I even gave in and tried using my flames. Who is this guy? Who can withstand attacks from 2S ranks like this? You bore me, Stellion said from mere inches away from Todoroki. When did he get that close? The back of the giant's fist slammed into Todoroki, sending him spinning through the air, crashing through the walls of the cafeteria and ending up outside, vomiting up blood as pain eclipsed his entire being. Try picking on someone your own size. Two voices cried out as thick tentacles and swirling energy waves slammed into his back. It was Nejire Hado and Tamaki Amajiki, two seniors whose talent and skill showed boundless potential. They were the only other 2S ranks at the school aside from Izuku and the only other present forces capable of standing up to this beast. They were swept aside like flies. The monarch's arm expanded, forming a steel-like substance over it before he punched at the teens, both still at least 50 feet away. The metal exploded off his arm, forming magical shrapnel that pierced the two. And although Stellion was aiming for Tamaki and Nejire, the shrapnel spread far and wide, tearing through the flesh of every other student in the room. Stellion frowned, as if he was disappointed by the absolute lack of power and simply sighed, going back to form his gait only to get interrupted by a loud bang followed by a sharp pain on the back of his head. Impressive, pray. You're the first one to actually make me feel something. Looking over his shoulder, Yeyurazu stood by the entrance of the cafeteria, holding her anti-material rifle charged with mana-enhanced bullets. She chambered another round, aiming for his head once more, but he simply smiled and leaned into the bullet as it slammed into his forehead. At the same time, he raised his forearm to the sky, as if preparing to block something, surprising the invisible Izuku, who was in stealth mode. Both of Izuku's maces slammed down onto Stellion's arm, which had turned to steel. 
The ground beneath the monarch cracked heavily under the pressure and he appeared to be exerting some amount of force to shrug off the attack. Using his leverage on the arm, Izuku vaulted over Stellion, dropping both of his maces into the inventory and pulling out the Genesis blade, swinging it with all of his might into the mountainous man's side. The gold sword dug into his flesh, managing to sneak past his steel exterior. But unfortunately, it stopped only a few centimeters in, as if his flesh was just as durable as his metallic skin. Stellion grinned, more prey. The arm that hadn't been hit by the maces swung down, the fist slamming into Izuku's gut, forcing him to let go of the Genesis blade as he was pushed backwards, his feet digging into the ground, collapsing to one knee. Izuku desperately heaved, trying to get any air to enter his lungs as Stellion stalked over to him. Ashborn, what the hell are you doing here? He paused. Ah, you've yet to take over your human. Well if that's the case, I'm sure none of the other monarchs would mind if I just killed you right here. His fist enlarged. I know we're supposed to be allies, but I really just can't stand your presence. It reminds me too much of the rulers. He raised his fist to cave in Izuku's skull. But before he could, Izuku's figure blurred, his quicksilver skill allowing him to move out of the range of the enlarged punch, a shadow spreading out from below him. Skill, Domain of the Monarch LV. 2 has activated. All shadows will have their stats increased by 75%. What did you just do? Izuku was too busy recovering the air in his lungs to respond. But there was one warrior willing to say something to Stel- K I I I E K. Stellion disappeared from Izuku's view, Baru crashing into him with the force of a Moab and shaking loose the Genesis blade that was biting into the monarch's side. K I E E K. Izuku shakily stumbled over and recovered the sword, storing it in his inventory as Baru continued to slash apart Stellion's skin with his four sets of claws, managing to scrape through even the metallic cover. The monarch and the king of the Namu danced through the sky, their impacts like thunderclaps. If anyone in the room had still been conscious aside from Izuku and Yeirazu, they might have appropriately thought it to be the end of the world. Each time their attacks connected, they sheared away another part of the ground and the buildings around them. Izuku was grateful that he had spent part of the Seraph Ashes on resurrecting Baru as he watched the two clash. With that in the domain of the monarch, the ant like Namu had far surpassed the strength that even S ranks would consider godlike. In fact, even as a monarch, Stellion found himself getting pushed back, Baru's attack strong enough to lift him into the air and knock him around like he was flying of his own volition. Looking back to the rest of the cafeteria, Izuku was stunned by just the sheer amount of bloodied bodies on the floor. Each one had at least a few nickel-sized or larger holes somewhere on their person. Stellion's magical shrapnel was now responsible for the 50-plus still bodies on the floor. Most dead, but some still alive, if just barely as they bled out on the ruined floor. Izuku was frozen in shock by the number and almost didn't notice Yeirazu shouting at him as she did her best to take care of Nejire and Tamaki. Izuku, your potions. Reason returned to banish the fog from his mind and he jumped into action, pulling dozens of potions from the store and pouring them into the students' mouths, closing up most of their wounds. Unfortunately, before he could get to Bakugo, the ceiling broke open in a different spot, Baru and Stellion crashing to the ground, Stellion using his massive weight to slam the bug like Namu into the concrete. I grow tired of this prey, Stellion said, wrapping his hands around Baru's throat and pouring massive amounts of mana into his frame. Izuku's eyes widened in disbelief as he felt Baru's essence being erased. His shadows could infinitely regenerate as long as he had mana, but it appeared that monarchs didn't play by the same rules. He no longer even seemed to mind as Baru tore his flesh with his claws. Stellion grinned as the Namu's legs began to fizzle away, the shadow breaking off in chunks. In fact, he was so caught up in the action he didn't notice Izuku swinging Daber with all of his might into the side of Stellion's head. Daybringer made a clang against Stellion's head as it flung him off of Baru and through the cafeteria walls, trampling the grass of the courtyard as rubble settled around him. Growling, the monarch pulled itself to its feet as Izuku helped Baru do the same. My liege, he seems to have become stronger. I can no longer handle him by. A cracking noise filled their air as Izuku pulled away from Baru, ice encompassing his body entirely. Come now, Stellion, leave alone the boy. Ashbourne and the architect will not be happy if it takes them another ten years to find a host. Izuku spun around, seeing a collection of dark purple mist hovering around Bakugo's prone form. Kirajiri. The misty figure bowed. Ah, my apologies human, but Kirajiri is the name of my host. I am the monarch of Frost, Urut. It appears that Stellion has started a rather unnecessary fight with you. He waved his hand and one of his purple gates swallowed the steel monarch whole. We are just here to collect Baron's host. In the meantime, we look forward to your rebirth oh, Shadow Monarch. Izuku began sprinting towards Urut as he laid a hand on Bakugo's back. Until next time human. But it was too late. By the time Izuku's fist reached the place where Urut had been standing, he was gone. The strength from his skill diffused into the air, creating a blast of wind that tore apart the back of the cafeteria, breaking the massive building into two. 
It was such a strong blast that Yeyurazu, who had been busy healing everyone behind him, was nearly thrown into the air. It even smashed open the ice prison of Baru, letting him free. My liege, are you? Heal the others, Izuku said, his voice low and despondent. The goal of the monarchs was achieved. They're not coming back, so you can focus all of your effort on healing all of the students here. Baru bowed his head and went to assist Yeyurazu, knowing that there was nothing more he could say to his liege to aid him. Izuku took a moment to suck in a heavy breath and curse himself for failing to stop the monarchs before turning around, pulling out his potions once more. He could worry about his failures later, for right now, he needed to save as many as possible. It wouldn't be wrong for someone to claim that Izuku disliked, or even hated Bakugo. However, as much as he hated him and would like nothing more to beat him to a pulp for all the years of bullying he suffered at his hands, the prospect of another monarch being given a host was a terrifying one. Being that host sounded far worse, it was hard enough to even stand next to Stellion or Urut. What would happen when another one was given form? If All Might is right and Antares is still in this world, that means that they at least have three monarchs, with Baron on the way. Izuku dropped to one knee next to Nejar Hado and Tamaki Amajiki, damn. Holes covered their entire body. It was a miracle none of the shrapnel had hit them in the head. They were somehow still alive, but Izuku wouldn't be able to save them with his potions. Baru, focus on these two for now. Perhaps it was immoral of him to assign treatment based on the victim's ranking. But Izuku knew that with the threats that were beginning to appear, keeping the strongest alive was their best chance at handling it. MMMM. Nejair groaned as her eyes opened, surprising Izuku as he poured more potion down another student's throat. Not many would regain consciousness that quickly, she must be stronger than I thought. Unfortunately, as Nejair forced open her eyes, the first thing she was greeted with was Baru's insectoid face. A shrill scream escaped her throat like rising steam as she scrambled weakly away from the shadow bumping into Izuku. Well well, it's okay, it's okay. Izuku grabbed her shoulders and obscured the view of Baru, waving him off to tend to the next batch of students, he's with me. BB but it's a bug. Is that what she was worried about? Izuku shook his head, sorry, but he's the only healer we have right now. Please try to remain as calm as you can for the sake of the others. Najair's eyes widened a bit as she looked around, noticing the number of bodies. Oh my god, I need to go help the others, so just stay here and rest for now. But Najair shrugged him off and did her best to stand, and no. The other buildings were hit. I need to go make sure everyone's okay. Izuku cursed inwardly, knowing he couldn't waste any more time arguing with her and nodded reluctantly, jumping back into his efforts. It took 30 minutes to evacuate all of the main buildings. During that time, several of the upper floors collapsed altogether. The only reason it didn't result in the death of three dozen people was that Karkinos and the Namu cleared out those floors first. It was thankful that his shadows didn't tire because it took another 30 minutes before the rescue teams came to Izuku once more. As he sent more shadows into the building to make sure it didn't collapse one of the rescue workers walked up to him. How long can those guys of yours hold that thing? They don't tire, so indefinitely, why? Have you not found Cementos yet? We have. He didn't need to say more for Izuku to get the idea and his expression hardened. Well, we can't just let this thing collapse. The worker shook his head to fix the damage. The only ones who could do that would be Cementos or an army of construction workers. And no construction team is gonna step inside a building like that. It doesn't matter how many summons you've got supporting the thing. Then where's the body? The body. The man shook his head. Kid, you don't want to see something like that. It's. He trailed off, unable to say more. I've seen men with most of their bodies gone, people missing their heads, and much more. I can handle it. The man huffed, well, why? Izuku grimaced, how good are you at keeping secrets? Uh, what? My liege asked you a question, human, can you keep your mouth shut? I. Yes, the man replied with a pale face. Izuku nodded, we need Cementos, so that's who we're going to get. Maybe it was the undeniable essence of death pouring off Baru, who was standing directly behind the worker or the glow in Izuku's eyes, but some way, somehow, the man seemed to grasp the deeper meaning of what Izuku was saying. By it's this way, Izuku had already experimented with the shadows of the six heroes he had taken. He knew that their quirks still worked as shadows, so it was no surprise to him that the shadow of Cementos was no different. It only took the shadow 15 minutes to stabilize the entirety of the building with his quirk. Sure, the upper floors were still pretty wrecked, but now, the building itself was in no danger of falling. The worker who had assisted Izuku in finding the crushed body of Cementos looked on with something akin to a mix of fear and awe. Izuku had utilized Cementos's shadow inside the building itself, so now one had actually seen the resurrected hero and teacher working hard to save his school. In the same way no one saw that, no one would see Izuku rest a hand on the teacher's shoulder and nod, cancel extraction. Unlike the situation with the six heroes, Cementos had not been spoken for about his preference for remaining alive as a shadow and as such, Izuku chose to release him back to his peaceful rest. 
With that, all 504 soldiers slunk back into Izuku's shadow, resting as their liege walked back outside. Not another word said to the worker, emerging into the sunlight. He noticed a wave of reporters swarming towards the building, but police and agents from the association stood in their way. All Might, Principal Nezu, it's a relief to see that you two are okay. Principal Nezu nodded, a small black cat in his arms. It was only thanks to my friend, Aho here. She seemed to sense the danger before it reached us, managing to convince me to get under my desk in the nick of time. Izuku ignored the odd explanation and turned to All Might. It was another. Monarch. All Might finished. I entrusted Principal Nezu with that information long ago. Right. It was that Kurajiri guy, who said he was the Monarch of Frost. Urut and another villain, who said his host's name was Muscular and that he was the Monarch of the Steel Body. All Might scowled, Stellion, him and Eek fought many battles against each other. Even with both sides despising the other, Stellion and Eek held a special amount of hatred for their rival. Urut said they were taking Bakugo to become a host for Baron, the monarch of the White Flame. He's possibly the weakest of the eight monarchs. But he still is a monarch and we cannot allow young Bakugo to be taken over. Did they give any possible clues as to where they may have been taking him? Izuku shook his head, allowing All Might to give a heavy sigh, as I expected. But, there still is hope. A monarch cannot merely emerge from the gap between dimensions and take hold of a host. We have seven days to find where they'll be building the gate for Baron to emerge from. Seven days. Just like the amount of time it takes for a gate to break open and release villains onto the world. I'll send out every last shadow I have, they'll find him. All Might gave him a concerned glance, but nodded, knowing that his unrelenting force would be one of their biggest assets towards locating Bakugo. Well, until then, I think it would be best if you tried to relax for the next few days. You've had a rough day, and you can leave the searching to us and your soldiers. Needless to say, school won't be resuming anytime soon. Izuku reluctantly agreed, but decided to ask one more question as his shadow army leaked out from under him and began their meticulous search through the city. How many? All Might lowered his head forlornly. Cementos was the only teacher we lost, but 10 other faculty members and 26 students died from the initial explosions. Another 30 died from Stellion's attack. The number would have been higher had you and Yeirazu not assisted in the treatment of your classmates. Speaking of Yeirazu, the girl was currently in an ambulance, receiving nutrients and recovering from using her quirk so much to create healing potions and medical supplies. Izuku took a moment to let out a breath before nodding. All right, I suppose I'll rest for now. After all, tomorrow's a big day. I suppose, he said, his voice melancholic. In reality, tomorrow was a huge day, but now, it was harder to feel excited about it. If you learn anything, make sure to call me. Essel floated through the halls of the naval base, four of her wings hanging out behind her, the other two cocooned gently around. She smiled down warmly at the little girl who was shouting for her to go faster. Just a few days ago, this sight had raised the eyebrows of more than a few of the personnel, but by now, the men and women simply enjoyed the blinding smile of Eri. They enjoyed it, even if they felt a little jealous about the fact that it took a shadow creature to draw out that smile when they could not. Essel saw how much happiness the smile of a child could bring to her surroundings, and with every fiber in her being she hoped that it would raise her liege spirits after the previous day's incident. Currently, Izuku and Yeirazu were waiting outside, having ridden over on Izuku's motorcycle and while they waited for Essel to be granted permission to leave the base with Uri, Izuku looked over his stats. Level, 105. Strength, 259. Vitality, 196. Agility, 247. Intelligence, 281. Sense, 173. HP, 48,145 over 47,395. Shadows able to be extracted, 782. Shadows able to be saved, 557. Remaining stat points, 30. I've been saving up some of the stat points from my daily quests because I was unsure of what to put them into. If I hadn't saved them up, would I have been able to stop the monarchs? Izuku tried to shake off those thoughts though. The beings were on another level. It was entirely unlikely that those stat points would have saved Bakugo. Well, since intelligence increases the strength of my shadows, I suppose I should put all my points into that. It'll be the first stat to surpass 302. Level, 105. Strength, 259. Vitality, 196. Agility, 247. Intelligence, 311. Sense, 173. HP, 48,145 over 47,395. Shadows able to be extracted, 851. Shadows able to be saved, 672. Remaining stat points, 0. Izuku, Yeirazu said cheerfully, bringing her boyfriend out of his thoughts, she's here. Looking up, Izuku's expression immediately brightened. Matsuo, the ensign in charge of Iri's care, was holding the girl's hand as he walked out of the gates that bordered the naval base, Essel floating along behind him. 
Iri, instead of the ragged clothing Izuku had last seen her wearing, was now dressed in a white dress shirt with a filly red pinafore over it. Under that she wore white jeans with brown boots covering her feet. Izuku crouched down as she got closer, her eyes twinkling brightly as she recognized the face of her savior. Hi Iri, do you remember me? She nodded furiously. Auntie Essel told me lots of stories about you. Auntie, Essel, well, I guess she has been taking care of her for the past two weeks or so. He looked up to see pure joy on the shadow's face. Hang on, Essel's only been around me to see a bunch of battles. She didn't tell her about that did she? A child shouldn't hear about their adoptive parents slaughtering entire castles of angels. Just before Izuku could ask what stories she had heard, Iri asked a question of her own, pointing up at Yeirazu, is she another auntie? Izuku chuckled and looked up to Yeirazu, who gave him a look of amusement before crouching down as well. Well, you're coming to live with me and Izuku, right? Iri nodded, so what would you call him? Iri thought for a moment before her entire face lit up with hope, he's my daddy. Izuku turned bright red, wanting to hide his face from the smirking ensign. But at the same time, his heart beat in response to the little girl's declaration and he couldn't help but feel like he was making the right choice in taking her in. Yeorazu continued with her reasoning. Then if Izuku is your dad, I'd be your mother. Realization filled Iri's eyes and she shouted out, Yeah. As she leapt forwards, her small arms wrapping around Yeorazu's neck to hug her. It was enough to catch her by surprise, sudden tears forming in the teen's eyes, surprised by how much she already cared for this little girl, wrapping her own arms around her. Yeirazu stood, holding her against her chest as she wiped away the small tears. So, are you ready to go see your new home? Yeah, and sign Matsuo grew nervous as he noticed the motorcycle behind them. Um, sir, I hope you don't plan on taking her home on that, if it's necessary. We have other vehicles that you could borrow. Izuku waved away his concerns. Don't worry, that was just for getting me and Yeirazu here. Igris, the Shadow Knight emerged. One of the three shadows that was not currently out looking for Bakugo. Could you take that back to the penthouse garage and meet us there? Igris held a hand over his chest and climbed onto the motorcycle, its exterior becoming larger and smoky as Igris adapted it to his own size and appearance. Huh, I had no idea he could do that. Oh, I'll ride with him. Essel volunteered suddenly. Running over to board the bike behind Igris, wrapping her arms around his waist. Huh? Izuku asked, don't you want to come home with us? It'll be quicker. Um, well if someone pulls Igris over, he can't talk, so I should be there to make sure nothing goes wrong. Izuku held a hand up to his chin. I didn't even think about that. Thanks Essel, we'll see you at home. So then, is your home close to here or? Matsuo trailed off, entirely confused by the unfolding events. Izuku shook his head with a smile. Stop stressing, we've got our own way of moving around. He wrapped Yeorazu in a hug. Iri sandwiched between them, thank you for your help. He said, saying goodbye to the man, exchange. Hold on. What Matsuo was cut off as shadows obscured the three's view and when it faded, they were standing just in front of a penthouse building complex. It stretched pretty high up, to the point where it looked similar to an office building in terms of size. Izuku had stationed one of his shadows outside the entrance just so he could instantly take Iri home. This is your home, Iri asked with disbelief, an expression that was mirrored by Yeorazu who had yet to see the penthouse apartment Izuku had picked out for them. Our home now, Izuku corrected, we've got the top two floors all to ourselves, so why don't we take a ride up there? Izuku, this is, insane. Yeirazu was at a loss for words. Even as someone who had spent her early years in luxury, the past few years had been less the same rich life she could have had, so something like this. It was insane. The apartment stretches out for the entirety of both floors. We've got five guest rooms, one I've already decked out for Eerie, a master bedroom for us, like half a dozen bathrooms, a gym, a huge kitchen, our own personal theater and game rooms, and an indoor pool and jacuzzi. Are you sure this is something we can afford? Yeirazu asked, stunned as she walked over to the clear glass that stretched around the entirety of the floor, giving them a view of the city. Izuku chuckled. Baru's magic core sold for a hefty amount, but believe it or not, some of the drops I got from the Heavenly Palace sold for far more. This place could be considered far below our price range to be honest. Just one of the perks of being an S-rank. He walked up behind her and wrapped his arms around her waist as Iri clambered over the sofas and went running through the hallways. Feels pretty surreal doesn't it? What? You mean the fact that two 16-year-olds are living like kings with an adoptive daughter at their age? Huh? Yeah. Yeorazu turned around and planted a light kiss on his lips. It does feel pretty surreal. But I hope this dream never ends, because it seems pretty close to paradise. Now, we've got a daughter to take care of and it looks like she's got way too much energy, so why don't we teach her to swim? Ooh. Izuku froze for a moment, like a computer buffering. We. Oui. Well yeah. Why? She smirked. Do you not want to see me in a bikini? Izuku blushed. And no. It's not that. 
I um, I don't know how to swim either. Yeyarazu chuckled. All right, then I guess I'll just have to teach you both. I'll go help Uri get a swimsuit on, so you do the same and I'll meet you by the pool. If I can find it in this huge place. Izuku acquiesced with an embarrassed nod, watching Yeyarazu strut away to scoop up their new child. He was about to run to his own room, which was also Yeyarazu's now that he thought about it. But before he could, a ringing interrupted him. It was his phone, ringing with a special alert from the association. He answered it, Hello, young Midoriya. I'm sorry to say this call has nothing to do with Bekugo, but in a rank gate open just by your phone's location, all might explain, it's, well it's halted traffic to a standstill. Do you think there's any way you could take care of it by yourself? Izuku sighed, looking back to the hallways, where he heard the giggles of his adopted daughter and girlfriend. This was his first day with her. He couldn't just abandon her, could he? Somehow, All Might seemed to sense his apprehension. Young Midoriya, I understand your concern, but as her mother once explained so brilliantly, heroes don't get to choose when they are needed. Izuku shook his head. It's just a traffic jam, right? It's not like the gate's gonna break open any moment. The nearest raid team that can handle it is at least two hours away from being able to reach it. By that time, the city's traffic will come to a standstill. It'll be a far bigger problem than just a traffic jam. Besides, with your strength, it should only take you an hour or so. Izuku sighed once more and gave in. All right, but you owe me for this. I'm gonna have to go tell the girls why I have to disappoint them. All Might sounded a little guilty by then, I understand. I apologize. Izuku ended the call, getting the distinct feeling like this wasn't going to be the last time he'd have to apologize to Uri or Yeyarazu for leaving on short notice. Izuku told the girls he'd be an hour at most, and Yeyarazu's expression had instantly brightened. To her, that meant opportunity. In her head, she had this perfect vision of teaching Uri to swim and then having her help her daddy learn the same thing when he got back. And so, as quickly as he could, Izuku sprinted through the apartment, leaping off the balcony and onto the head of Karkinos, who had halted his search of the city to assist his liege in a speedy gate job. Essel and Igris had gotten home moments earlier, but Essel was the designated bodyguard of Eri, so for now, Izuku had only his trusty dragon and knight. They were only two out of his 500 strong army, but they were also two of the strongest, so he'd finish it quickly, right? This feels like a red gate. Izuku muttered forlornly to himself and his two shadows as they stood, floated on the rocky terrain of what appeared to be a volcano. He sighed bitterly. I thought I was making the correct decision. I thought if it was only an hour or so that I had to spend clearing in a ranked dungeon, then Uri and Yeyurazu could handle it. Well, it looks like the universe is slapping me in the face for choosing hero work over family, but I suppose there's nothing left for me to do now. I just have to throw my all into this and clear the dungeon as quickly as possible. As he finished his thought, the ground erupted, spewing forth dozens of lava golems, their glowing red eyes locking onto Izuku. The rest of my army is stuck outside the gate looking for Bakugo, but I did upgrade my intelligence to the point where I can save 672 shadows and extract 851, which means, Izuku smiled, reaching out and crushing one of the golems with Dominator's touch, which means, I'll just have to start a new army with you guys. You have leveled up. You have leveled up. Time wore on too quickly. With each passing, arise, Izuku was increasing his forces and speeding up the completion of the dungeon, but he also drew ever closer to the two-hour mark, in turn, only making him more frantic. 68 lava golems, elite grade, 40 obsidian beetles, elite grade, 34 greater fire spirits, night grade, and 20 lava titans, elite night grade had joined Izuku's fight against their own kin and they slaughtered them with brutal efficiency. All things considered, it was a pretty easy dungeon though it was in a rank that had been boosted by the effects of a red gate and was likely at a low S ranking. Izuku's only trouble with it was time. After slaying the 21st Lava Titan he received a message. Another crafting item. Am I going to receive a new recipe soon? Item, Lava Heart. Item class, S. Item type, Ingredient. A living beating heart extracted from one of the alien volcano's titans. It contains unbearable heat and unfathomable strength within itself. It's way too powerful to be part of something as simple as a consumable potion or something. Is it going to be part of a weapon, armor, or will it serve me no purpose other than selling it off for a huge chunk of change? He shrugged, wondering what he should do for the girls to make it up to them as he shoved the item back into his inventory. You have entered the boss room. Izuku was struck with an intense wave of hot steam as the lava spewed up from inside the volcano. He was lucky that the Olympian armor seemed to resist the heat well, otherwise he would have been burnt to a crisp by now. Like the lava golems and titans, Ifrit appeared to be a being made out of molten rock and obsidian, but unlike them, it had not taken on a humanoid appearance. Instead, it emerged from the lava as nothing more than a blob, eight limbs and mandibles taking form as it began exerting its shape-shifting powers. Ugh, I hate spiders. K-R-A-A-A-A. 
skill, infinite strength has activated. Ifrit didn't even have the time to recognize that Izuku was in its face before he blew it off with one punch. Unfortunately, while this stumbled the fiery arachnid, it didn't seem to do anything more than superficial damage and its face was reformed within a few seconds. Hmm, so I guess this is what it feels like to fight my shadows. Of course, Ifrit wasn't the same perfect soldier that Izuku's were. It had a weakness, like all monsters. Karkinos, aim for the abdomen. Skill, divine retribution has activated. Karkinos's beam of pure energy tore through the spider's backside and slammed into the mountain under it, decimating everything in his path and melting it more than it was already melted. The real target had been the villain's magic core, which controlled its entire being. If it was destroyed, there was no way it could survive. You have leveled up. You have obtained enhancement item, Ifrit's blood. You have obtained ingredient item, Malleable Obsidian. Another ingredient and even a new type of item. Secret crafting recipe discovered. Item, Evolution Core. Item class, SSS. Item type, Magic Item. Triples the strength of all magic abilities. If this item is held while the Shadow Monarch uses Shadow Extraction there is a 100% chance that the target will evolve into its next species rank. Ingredients. 1x portion of Seraph's Blessed Ashes. 1x portion of Ifrit's Blood. Malleable Obsidian. Lava Heart, World Trees Fragment, Orb of Avarice, Shadow Steel Fragments, SSS, a guaranteed evolution. Like what happened with Essel evolving from an Angel Noble to a Seraph and Baru to a High End Namu. There's no way I can miss out on this. Izuku quickly scanned over the ingredient list before realizing he was only wasting more time in here. Shit, I've gotta get going. He ran over to Ifrit's body, Arise. Would you like to use Seraph's Blessed Ashes to enhance the extraction? Would you like to use Ifrit's Blood to enhance the extraction? Um, two different enhancements at the same time. How strong would this guy become? It says I only need one portion of each to make the evolution core. And I've still got two portions of the Seraph Ashes and three of Ifrit's blood. Izuku hesitated for just a moment before answering yes to both. Just one grade below Baru. My liege, the fiery red shadow took on the appearance of a human and knelt before Izuku. It is my honor to join your ranks. Please, give me a name. He speaks too. I was right. Commander grade and up allow shadows to speak. Hum, I don't see anything wrong with Ifrit, do you? If it is your will, my liege, then I will gladly accept any name you assign. His voice was surprisingly heavenly. I don't want a yes man for this part. I want to know if you like the name or not. Izuku sighed inwardly, Ifrit it is. Ifrit LV, 10 commander grade. I look forward to serving you. Izuku nodded, and I'm excited to see what you can do, but for now, I'm afraid we've got no time for experiment. He called Ifrit and the other 163 new shadows back as himself and Igris boarded Karkinos, who shot forwards, heading straight for the exit. If there was one thing Izuku was grateful for in this situation aside from the items, shadows, and such that he had obtained from the gate, it was that the villains from that gate didn't have blood. Or rather, they didn't have blood that stained clothes. Their blood was closer to lava, so thankfully, Izuku only had a few burn holes in his clothes instead of a hoodie stained red or green or purple from blood. It wouldn't do good to apologize to his new family with blood-stained clothes. As he got closer to his penthouse door, he began hearing a lot of commotion from the inside and for a moment, he panicked, but the loud voices were not distraught or angry. If anything it sounded like a bevy of laughs. But it sounds like there's more than Izuku chuckled lightly as his sense stat picked up the other presences, telling him exactly who was inside. He opened the door, hearing his mother's high-pitched voice of excitement coming from the kitchen. Looks like he's back, Maruko said, her ears picking up the door. Right on cue, Izuku strutted into the dining room, Sakura, his mother, Maruko, Iri, Momo, and Nejire sitting at the table, a wonderful smell emanating from the plates. Uh, sorry I'm late everyone. Daddy, Iri hopped out of her seat and into Izuku's arms, allowing him a sigh of relief, she didn't hate him for what he had done. Mommy taught me how to swim today. Did she? That's awesome. You'll have to show me tomorrow. Izuku looked back to the table, absolutely shocked to see his upperclassman and agency partner there. His mother and sister weren't that much of a surprise. After all, Yeirazu did say she wanted to invite them over for dinner one night. Maruko, Simp Nejire waved him off before he could finish the honorific. Yue is shut down, so for now, I'm just Nejire, not your senior. Uh, okay, so, what brought you guys here today? Izuku fumbled his words for a minute, worried that the question would come off as offensive, but neither seemed to mind. Your girlfriend did, Maruko answered, she invited us and your family. She, did, Yeirazu nodded. Maruko's going to be our partner for the foreseeable future and Hado called the agency number earlier asking if she could apply, so I invited them both and said we could talk about it over dinner. 
Izuku's eyes widened. So the agency is ready then? Maruko nodded. Everything's worked out. Until you're 18, I'm the agency president, you're the vice president, and Yeurazu is our necessary third member. I've also gone to the trouble of hiring a secretary to handle the business side of things. Although, even I didn't expect anyone to try and join the agency so soon. Aside from Bubbly here, we've got about 30 other applicants, most of them from UA, but we've also got some pros looking to join. T30. Pros. The names of Maruko and Izuku Midoriya attract a lot of attention, especially when that involves an agency, Yeyurazu answered. I invited Hato because she was the first to seek out an application. It's just Nejire, Yamomo. Nejire exclaimed cheerfully, already choosing her own friendly nickname for Yeyurazu. Izuku sat down, Iri taking her place on his lap. It seems like a lot happened while I was gone. A lot can happen in two hours, sweetie, and Ko said with a smile. Sakura finally burst out, having held it in long enough for the adults to get through their business, Izu. This place is humongous. You can get me a place like this right. Uh, and Ko saved him. Nope. You're staying with your mother until you graduate. Aoua. Yeyurazu handed Izuku a plate piled high with food. Here, I figured you must be hungry. Thank you. Izuku couldn't find a trace of disappointment in her eyes at his failure to return in time. But he still felt a pang of guilt and vowed to talk to her later about it. You're welcome. Maruko barked out as he began digging in, slightly confusing him. As he swallowed his mouthful, he asked, You made all of this? She nodded proudly and Yeyurazu backed it up. As much as I hate to admit it, she's a much better cook than I expected her to be. What do you mean you hate to admit it? Yeyurazu only offered a small smile in return. So I heard that All Might is finally going to officially announce you as an S rank. Inko excitedly clapped her hands together. Izuku nodded. People have been basically just assuming up until this point since I was able to beat something the other S ranks couldn't. But it was never official. Making it so will definitely help with the reputation of our agency. Speaking of which, Maruko raised two fingers. There are two issues still regarding said agency. And since we've got the first applicant right here, it'll be best to establish a standard for the first issue right now. What are our terms for accepting a hero into our agency? We could base it off of their amount of gates cleared. Or maybe what school they came from. Maruko shook her head. Gates cleared is stupid, since people get carried through gates all the time just to fill the necessary 10-man requirement and with UA closed. The only other hero schools are for rank BS and below. We need something practical to test them. Why doesn't daddy just fight them? Then he knows for sure if they're strong. Maruko once again turned down the idea. Sorry kid, but your dad is way too strong to test anyone other than the top heroes of this world. Actually, Yeyurazu said, beaming at Uri, it's perfect. Did you not just hear me? He can't fight them because they'll be like flies next to him, it wouldn't be an accurate assessment of their power. He can't fight them, but he's got an army of summons all at different rankings. If we can estimate their strength compared to the person applying, then we can give them a fair enemy. Hmm, since they regenerate we'd have to say that any strike that would be fatal would count as a win. Makes sense. The only real trouble would be making sure the summon and the applicant are fairly matched. Izuku added, after dinner, we should all head down to our agency's gym and test out what would be a good opponent for someone of her caliber. We have a gym. Maruko smirked. I had the feeling you'd need a lot of space to test out your new summons, so I made sure to request it. It did take up quite a pretty penny though, so I hope you don't mind. Izuku shook his head. Not at all, in fact, I'm glad that you made that decision. Well then, Inko began, I suppose we should get started on the dishes so you can all get to work. But before she could stand, a shadow snatched the plate from in front of her. In this house, I refuse to let you do any labor, Izuku declared jokingly. Besides, it's not that late. We can stay and chat for a while longer before leaving. Is that okay with you, Nejire? And so, as Namu that once attempted to kill as many humans as possible did the dishes, Izuku caught up with his mother and sister while Nejire and Uri laughed back and forth with each other. It took another two hours before Inko genuinely excused herself and her daughter as it was getting late and the latter had school the next day. All right, little one, Izuku said, picking up Iri from his lap. It's long past your bedtime. What? No, I want to see Nejire Chan fight. She's already taken up that Nejire Chan nickname. Ha, huh. Iri, it's La. Maruko interrupted Yeyurazu. You should probably let her come along. After all, if you put her to bed, she's just gonna lay there, thinking about the exciting thing we're about to go do. Yeah, Auntie Maruko is right. Maruko's bunny ears folded down happily as she heard the title of endearment. Izuku sighed, but decided that Maruko was right. Besides, once they left, what was going to keep her in bed? Well, I could always just have Essel watching her to make sure she didn't try to go and play, but still, I suppose it's better this way. He changed direction from Mary's bedroom to the balcony. You're lucky that you both are hard to resist, he said to the rabbit girl and his daughter. Hmm, Carquinos works pretty well for transport, but I do have someone new amongst my ranks that might have some potential. 
come forth. Ifrit rose from the shadows, his red accent standing out in the darkness of the night. My liege, another one that talks. Ye Arazu said with surprise. I guess taking that gate was worth it. Izuku shook his head. I shouldn't have left you two for it though. I am sorry about that. I understand why you did it and as long as it's not hurting Yuri, then never I'll hate you for something like that. It is our job after all. He nodded, tears nearly rushing up alongside his emotions. I really did get so lucky didn't I? Turning his attention back to Ifrit, he asked, You shapeshifted back inside the gate, do you think you could do that again? But as something that flew and could carry all of us, it would be my honor. His nondescript humanoid shape disappeared as he stood and backed away from the five on the massive balcony. His arms stretched wider and wider, a thin membrane beginning to emerge from the top of it and spread down. He got down to all fours, his head and neck extending out to form a more draconic and defined head as a tail sprouted from his backside. Within no time, they had their very own wyvern. One with far more room for passengers than even Carquinos. All right, pile on everyone. Asshole, your honorary duty. The seraph emerged from the darkness and scooped up the girl, wrapping her in two of her wings. Any one of the people here could survive a fall from terminal velocity. But only Nejire could fly. So even if Yuri fell off Ifrit and they dove after her it would be a rough landing for the girl. Asshole on the other hand was perfectly suited for safely carrying the VIP on board the wyvern. Wait, your species name was the God of Fire. Aren't you going to burn us if we sit on you? Ifrit's dragon head shook and a voice escaped his throat. As the god of fire, I can exhibit perfect control over my own body heat. You do not need to fear for yourself or anyone else, my liege. Well in that case, let's get going. Their agency's gym was much like the one at the association. Weapons locker and all, though it was currently empty. Oh I nearly forgot. Izuku said, turning to Maruko, you said there were two issues to still take care of. One was the entrance exam. What was the other? It appeared Maruko was in the same boat, as it took her a moment to recall the issue. Ah, uh, the second issue is what we're going to name the agency. People are already applying despite it not having a name, but a name is definitely important. Ryukyu's name for hers is the Dragon Agency, which is pretty simple, but it's effective. We could always do something similar, like the Shadow Agency. Could be, but I think people might enjoy something a bit more complex. My liege, Baru spoke out, suddenly appearing from Izuku's shadow. What? Did you find Bakugo? We have a few leads, but I actually arrived to give an idea for a name. Izuku tilted his head, kind of weirded out by the situation. But also curious, what might that be? The Thanatos Agency. The Greek god of death. Yeyarazu raised an eyebrow. Isn't that a bit too on the nose? Izuku smiled. I kinda like it. Aru bowed. I am honored that you enjoy the name. I will depart once more to continue the search if you allow it. Actually, would you mind sticking around for a minute? As the highest-ranking shadow in the army, you are acquainted with the strength of all of my soldiers, right? Oh yes my liege. Then do you think you could assign an equal opponent for her, he said, pointing at Nejire. Baru stroked his chin with one of his hands as he examined her aura. She is on the lower end of what humans consider S rank. That would mean a high-level knight shadow or low-level elite knight would match up to her quite well. Wow, I think I've been greatly underestimating just how strong my elite knight and up shadows are. If the six heroes you took were any lower of a level I would recommend them, but they hold a substantial edge at their strength. Smoky, Tank, Hyo, and Tusk, as well as your three High Orc bodyguards, are also too high of a level to be considered an equal opponent for her. In fact, Tusk and Hyo are on the verge of Captain Grade. All of the Shadow Namu from my nest are Knight Grades, but are too low level to handle her one-on-one, -on -one, which leaves your options at one of the normal High Orcs, a Lava Titan, an Angel Knight, or one of your magicians. Nejire is a magic type, so High Orcs, Lava Titans, and Angel Knights are out. In Izuku's mind, the High Orcs and Lava Titans would become easy targets for Nejire's airborne energy attacks and the Angel Knights were too good at getting up close and personal. With their wings they would shred her too easily. My magicians finally reached Elite Knight grade, so I suppose this would be the opportune time to test them out. Come forth. A robed figure emerged, floating just above the ground, fire magic dancing around in its palm. Its robe seemed longer than when it had been night grade and as Izuku knew personally, it had acquired some new skills. Najire was thankfully dressed in some pretty casual clothes, so they wouldn't impede her movement too much. As she stepped onto the wide reinforced platform, the magician followed suit on the opposite side. Najire, if you can knock my summon out of bounds, or destroy a part of his body that would be considered a fatal blow, then you will be accepted into the Thanatos Agency. Oh, so it's decided already. Maruko asked, somewhat peeved he hadn't checked with her on the outside. But on the inside, she had to admit that she liked the name. If my summon appears to be about to land a fatal blow on you, I will interrupt it and it will be declared your loss. Just like your rules for him, if he knocks you out of bounds, you lose. Flight is allowed, just so long as you don't fly over the boundaries of the platform. 
The others retreated to a railing on the second floor that overlooked the battle area as Izuku asked one final question. Are the rules clear to both parties? Yep, Nanjire exclaimed, clearly excited to get this started. The magician nodded to his leech. Then on my marks, begin. Simultaneously, the two parties conjured their most basic attack. Nanjire calling up her spiral yellow energy and the magician creating a condensed ball of fire in both hands. Their magics discharged simultaneously. The magicians traveling significantly faster as the two projectiles collided on Nejire's side of the field. The winds from the explosion lightly brushed Izuku's hair as the first exchange concluded. Whoa, Iri exclaimed, so cool. Maruko chuckled, you ain't seen nothing kid. I might lose out in firepower, but just floating around like that makes you an easy target. Nejire's body charged through the smoke and dust kicked up by the explosion. As the spiral energy of her quirk propelled her forwards, originating from her feet, she charged up another attack with both her hands. The magician threw another fireball, which she easily dodged by lurching to the right. He continued to lob his attacks, but within no time, she was too close for him to hit without hurting himself. All done, Nagire's building energy blasted outwards, slamming into the wall behind the magician as he disappeared. What? Shadow Magician is using skill, shift. The skill shift allowed the user to teleport a short distance instantaneously. It couldn't take people with it, but it was a great tool to prevent the magician from being struck while conjuring up a spell. Ranking up to Elite Knight had granted him this unique skill. Izuku had originally thought the detection skill was for nothing more than detecting enemies cloaked with camouflage or stealth, but as it turned out, it served a much deadlier purpose. In targeting someone with the skill, the magician became perfectly locked onto their three-dimensional position in space and had no trouble predicting their movements or throwing attacks. Hmm. Baru said one of these magicians was an even match, but... I'm starting to think this thing is way too strong for something I got as one of my first summons. Of course, Nejire was no pushover and had quickly ascertained that her opponent teleported away. Using her propulsion, she shot straight up into the air, just barely avoiding a fireball. As she spun around to locate the magician, she was greeted by the sight of him creating some sort of fire lance. Coil, Nejire shouted, the spiral energy emerging from her hands turning into a spring of sorts that wrapped around the javelin as it rocketed towards her. The magician tilted its head, seemingly impressed by the use of her powers to rob the kinetic energy from his attack. Those weren't the only tricks up his sleeve, however. He had used both of his skills already, but his proficiency in fire magic allowed him to conjure up plenty of varied attacks and thanks to Tusk who had trained all of the magic-type shadows personally, this magician had a whole host of attacks prepared. Half a dozen yellow circles appeared behind the magician and they began rapidly spitting out low-intensity fireballs. Nejire was just barely able to keep up with dodging and countering them by spreading her attacks wider than before. Stick to the attacks you've used so far. You're getting too varied for her to keep up. Izuku directed to the shadow telepathically. He knew that restricting his shadow meant that if Nejire won, then technically, she could still be weaker than the shadow itself. Unfortunately, his shadows were simply on another level with their variety and ability to adapt. Aru, who had been sticking around so far, felt a pang of pride as he watched one of his lead shadows fend off the woman, who this world considered strong, with relative ease. Fine, I'll go all out too. Izuku cringed inwardly at that statement, you're going to be the only one going all out. Up on the second floor overlook, a cheery voice interrupted the group's focus on the fight, Hiya boss, I didn't expect you guys this late. A woman, maybe 20 years in age with a business suit and shoulder-length fawn-colored hair walked up to them. I didn't expect you this late, Kami, Maruko said, addressing the Thanatos agency's secretary and business manager. Well, I've been busy sorting through all the applicants and putting them into piles according to their ranks and potential. She giggled, you know me, I can't rest until everything's perfectly organized. Well, that is why I hired you. I, oh, my, gosh, Kami rushed over to Essel, who was holding up Uri to see the fight, aren't you just the cutest thing ever? Both Essel and Uri were slightly taken back by the woman's excitable and hyper personality. This is Kami Atsushimi. She's a C rank, but she's got no interest in the fighting part of a hero life, so she got a business degree. She seems kinda ditzy, but she's surprisingly capable. Hey, that's not that nice boss. Calling me ditzy, Kami pouted, but no one could tell if it was a teasing pout or not. Changing the topic like a flip of the switch, Kami directed her attention to the fight, so is that like, the other boss's strongest summon or something? I didn't watch much of the Jeju Island broadcast. Yeyarazu shook her head. Compared to some of his other summons, that shadow is weak. Seriously. But it's like, fighting the Nejire Hado like it's no big deal. Kami leaned on the railing. She's considered one of the most promising up-and-coming heroes in the entirety of Japan. She was expected to become a top 10 hero almost immediately out of high school. Yeah, well, Izuku's summons aren't exactly normal. 
One of the sunspot shots grazed Nejire's side, scorching straight through her clothing and burning her flesh. Her midair balance faltered and seeing the opening, the magician conjured another sun javelin, throwing it with all of his force. Unfortunately for him, that was exactly what she had been waiting for. The last time the magician threw his javelin, Nejire noticed a small break between his next attack. She assumed correctly that condensing that much fire magic into one spear forced even this illogically strong summon to take a breath. Instead of stopping the javelin with her own power, Nejire used the power built up in her hands, the power that the magician had assumed was for an attack, and propelled herself forwards. Her intense velocity just barely scraped by the javelin, its yellow flaming body cutting a small nick on her cheek. Landing just behind the magician she spun around, full output, she had landed too quickly for the magician to even consider his shift skill. And before he knew it, the yellow energy was slamming him into a wall on the opposite side of the gym. Knowing that she had won, Nejire collapsed to her knees, sweat pouring down her face like a river. She would have fallen onto her face, but Izuku was there to catch her, pouring a stamina recovery potion into her mouth. Drink this, you'll feel better. Nejire gratefully downed the liquid, expecting it to be some sort of energy drink. But instead of taking a moment to pick her up, she felt like all the exertion of her previous fight was gone. It was magical to say the least. Nejire smiled as she collapsed back onto her butt. She was no longer fatigued in any way, but it just felt good to sit. Well, she was sitting until Baru walked up to heal her burn mark and scratch on her cheek. E.E.K. Baru responded to the shriek the only way he knew how. K.I.E.E.K. Izuku just facepalmed as he pulled a potion from the store and sent Baru to search for Bakugo once more. Then, in a more dignified manner, he offered her the potion and said, You did good. Welcome to the Thanatos Agency. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready. You will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.